Hey everyone, uh, sorry about the mix up. I had sound issues and my broadcast software is kind of difficult to use. Um, but we figured it out. Um, so thanks to everybody for the help and thanks to everybody for coming back. Um, if you don't mind, um, like, just tell your friends that we're back, tell your people to retweet our tweet um, so we could get the people back. But it looks like the stream is coming back. We have a bunch of people on it now, so thankfully it's going well. I'm just going to reorient ourselves, and we're going to, um, I'm just going to go over the schedule one more time, and then we will get started with Juliet's talk, and we're going to continue the schedule, but basically everything's pushed back an hour and a half. I'm sorry that that's annoying, but um, it's just what we're going to do. I'm just loading the PowerPoint and we will get started. All right. Um, okay, so welcome to the Animal Crossing Artificial Intelligence Workshop. Opening remarks, part two. Super excited to present for you all today. Um, I have glee. It's so awesome to be here and so awesome that you guys are all tuning in. Um, let's just go over the schedule. The times are off by an hour and a half, but um, that's okay. So first is people in AI. Uh, we're going to have our talks. Then we have our first coffee break, the natural language understanding. Another coffee break, computer vision coffee break, and games and AI. Um, you guys should have all received uh, credentials for the coffee breaks in your email, either now or you'll get them. Um, the times for that are probably kind of messed up now, but um, when people send your Dodo codes, you can go to the island. And um, like ideally, you'll go to the island during the actual coffee breaks. So just add an hour and a half to all the times. Um, go to acaiworkshop.com slash schedule and look at the times and um, yeah, or just watch the stream and you'll know where we're at. Uh, remember, take a look at our code of contact conduct. It's adapted from the Association of Computational Linguistics anti-harassment policy, just a way to remind everyone to be respectful and like we're trying to have good scientific discourse here and trying to do some good networking. So please um, be respectful. All right. And our last slide. Thanks everybody for dealing with the technical difficulties. Thanks for attending. Um, like the video, subscribe to our YouTube, follow us on Twitter, send this to your friends and colleagues. Please resend the link. Um, now that 
Like we actually have the real length. This hopefully will be the length that we use for the rest of the day. All right, now I am going to get out of the way and uh, let Juliet take the stage. Juliet? Juliet, it's your turn. Okay, sorry. I'm not, you, you were muted so I couldn't hear you, sorry. All right. Okay, so you can hear me? Yes. And the slide shares up? Yes. Can you just go to the podium? Okay, sure. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, everything's messing up. All right. We're all good. You can hear me. I'm at the podium. My slide shares up. Yes, we can all hear right. you. Yeah, I can actually see that on YouTube. All right, one more time. So empowering kids for ethics and AI. So since you purchased your first smartphone, and I mean your smartphone, not your Nook phone, a generation of kids has grown up that will never know a world that's not mediated by AI algorithms. So what this means also is, I mean, kids don't know that their parents and the adults and the teachers around them weren't born into this world with them, that these adults around them to know about algorithms and how they work, and they don't necessarily understand that they don't. So why is this important? Well, I mean, AI and kids is a serious business. A report released by the Pew Research Center about a year ago uh, showed that YouTube content targeted and featuring children is three times more popular than any other content on YouTube. So this is Ryan Kaji a few years ago when Ryan was making a mere $11 million a year as a toy reviewer. Last year, he actually made $26 million a year making him the highest paid YouTuber, and he's eight. Now, you probably know that in September, Google settled um, a, a case launched against them for violating the uh, protection of ch Children's Protection Data Act. Uh, they settled for $170 million. Uh, the same time that they announced that, uh, a complaint was launched against Ryan and his parents for uh, failure to disclose that he was being paid by toy companies and also for really algorithms that weren't working. I mean, we know that Google was using children's data, how long they watched videos, uh, when they stopped, what kind of fresh content they needed, what they liked most. Um, and the algorithms were obviously working, but not really working well enough. Uh, Ryan's videos that were targeted at three to six year olds were also preceded by ads for Carl Jr.'s and R rated movies and ads that were really, really inappropriate for his target preschool audience. So I represent a Canadian charity called Kids Code Jeunesse. Since 2013, we've been working with teachers and parents and the adults around kids and with kids to come up with sort of viable classroom ready lesson plans that allow teachers and kids and parents to learn how to code together. We started really with simple code and the kind of simple code you can do with some of the resources that have been coming out. But recently we've moved more towards the challenge of trying to help kids and the adults around them to conceptualize AI algorithms and how they work in such a way that they can start the kind of conversations where they can start to, to really talk about and sort of internalize a certain um, reflection and maybe healthy skepticism towards these algorithms. So, we started to work with the Canadian division of UNESCO on a YouTube video 
that um, that we knew was not going to reach the same numbers that Ryan's videos did, but at least it would be a tool that kids and educators and parents could use to start to think and talk about these things. So I don't know, Josh, if you're able to show this video. I think we talked about you showing How it. How does the internet always seem to know what I like? Shot? Who's making these decisions for me? Been through? It is? I am. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me introduce myself. I'm an algorithm. I live behind the screen, and I can explain how it all works. Follow me. Welcome to my home. Algorithms like me are made by people like you. Human programmers give me instructions by writing code, and then we become programs. Millions of us exist almost everywhere you look. Can you believe it? Okay, but how come you know what I like? Great question. It's just on a big when you way. watch, search, like, or share online, you create something called data. Algorithms use data to make connections about you and the things you enjoy. We find patterns in your data and then show you stuff we think you'll care about. Voila! Sometimes there are mistakes in my code, though, and I might suggest things you don't like or that upset you. But hey, if you understand how algorithms work, you'll have the power to make your own decisions. Cool. I didn't realize my choices matter more than yours. But wait, there's got to be more to it than that, right? So we're not aiming in this video to explain everything about algorithms. And obviously uh, this algorithm is being somewhat disingenuous when it ex you know, says that it's gonna explain how it all works. We know that explainability is, is a big issue with algorithms, especially as they start to wrap themselves in deeper layers of near, you know, near networks. But, um, but the main thing really is to give kids the tools and parents the tools to at least start talking about how this works. So on this, um, on this site, along with this video, there's also some resources that help uh, kids and educators to explore things like preference bubbles and also um, lead them towards other issues that they can start to talk about. Um, so we've also worked with researchers in Montreal um, uh, primarily with, um, the, with Mila, which is a, a community of about 450 AI researchers in Montreal to develop the kind of, of materials that would sort of seed the literacies that kids uh, need to know if they're going to start thinking about algorithms. So here, for instance, we have a little girl who's sorting out uh, puppies and cookies and trying to figure out what the level of certainty is over whether or not it's a puppy or a cookie and and maybe questioning why it is it's kind of easier for her to do that than it might be for a computer and starting with really simple things like this we can start to seed ideas uh, around algorithms particularly AI algorithms that they're not always visible that AI is not magic that somebody's actually creating this, that algorithms are not always right, that the training data matters, that the quality of the data and the diversity of the data matters. And so this seeds uh, you know, more conversation about ethical issues like bias, like you know, the fact that, that AI algorithms have an easier time discerning the faces of white men than black women that that's not necessarily because of a failure of the computer, but often a failure of the diversity of the data. Things like transparency, privacy, accountability, and again, explainability, because this is, this is gonna have a big impact on kids. It's not as much of an issue when we're talking about, you know, what movie you're gonna choose, but as it comes into the world of education, as AI is used to assess kids, to, prompt them towards certain learning paths to make decisions about them. These can have real life impacts on kids and the directions that they go in. So mostly we just want to provide the tools that are gonna help this generation keep talking, 
to sort of shine a light inside the black box, not necessarily something that's going to show everything in, in perfect detail, but at least help people to sort of discern the shadows, to highlight ethical concerns, to value humans and natural intelligence, but not to devalue AI. I mean, we really want kids and their parents and their educators to see like what is the real potential of AI for good. We're not the only people doing this. And I just wanted to highlight some of the projects in um, the States right now where they're doing some really interesting work and um, you're working in many cases alongside them. Um, like at MIT, there's a very interesting project on gen bias and gender uh, called gendershades.org. You can find it there. There's also um, out of MIT, uh, Turing Box, which is a really interesting project about trying to democratize the study of AI and, and get people involved in, in trying to, to prototype stuff that aren't necessarily specialists or engineers. And then another project that we're working on um, is with the people at Cognomates out of the University of Washington. So um, Stefania Druga, um, who uh, got to be like the fellow of Lego at uh, MIT, which is like such an amazing job. I can't believe it exists. But uh, she's done some really interesting longitudinal studies on on what is the effect on children when they start to learn a little bit about AI. Uh, you know, how, how do they view it? Um, can they, do they have a sort of develop a kind of a healthy skepticism that they didn't have before? So I guess a little call to action. Um, you know, we're at this incredible moment of, I mean, crisis, but also a moment uh, that has the potential for, for transformation in this really interesting environment that is Animal Crossing, uh, that has so much potential for kids to, to use AI for creativity, for dreaming and imagining and building. Um, and that also has the potential for to inspire them to want to understand how this works and how you know Tom Nook uh, makes the uh, somewhat tyrannical decisions that he makes. So, I would really like maybe today uh, for everyone to maybe just think of one thing that you can do to keep this conversation going, to broaden it, to translate what you do to, to people across the generations and try and bring uh, some of this joy that is in Animal Crossing into the world of AI. So I'm just going to leave um, up these contacts if you want to follow us or follow me or check out the Algorithm Literacy Project. And I am here uh, to answer questions for the next few minutes. I'm going to depend on you, Josh, to tell me because there's a big delay on the video. So Awesome, Juliet. Thanks for the amazing talk. Um, Thank you. I am going to hold on. Let me just go to this view. And I am going to clap. I think I can clap. <laughs> uh, I'll yes. do another. I am going to. And uh, let's see, are there, is there any reaction from the rest of the audience? So first I'm going to see if the audience has any questions. So does anybody in the Zoom room, any of you, you presenters, want to ask Juliet a question? OK, well, while the Zoom room people think about questions. I'm going to ask a question from someone from um, the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So one of our other presenters from a different section, Alexandra De Lucia, um, she said, uh, I think her it was more of a statement, but I think it's an interesting sentiment. She said, only if she can teach the same material at a graduate machine learning class. Not just kids don't know this material, but the general public as a whole doesn't know this. And I agree, like I have a PhD in AI and this was not even a part of my curriculum. Like I learned about it when I was in industry and also before industry too, just cause like I saw how biased and racist machine learning algorithms were. So I'm just wondering if you have, if your organization has thought about doing anything for people in graduate school or even undergrads, getting people to um, 
learn getting like professionals and people who are learning at the undergraduate and graduate level to like learn about these issues um actually as a matter of fact we have like we're on an advisory committee at um at dawson college in montreal uh which is a really interesting amalgamation of of liberal arts and um and sort of all the other you know things that, that you can learn um, in a college. And they started a really, really big project around trying to train um, all of their teachers across, even in the humanities, in AI. And they came to us figuring if we could explain it to 10-year-olds, that we would be able to explain it to adults as well. So we actually really have started going into that area and trying to to kind of find that nice sweet spot where where we can be teaching it not just to kids but to adults and also I mean to give Google some credit they have some really interesting materials as well um, like teachable machine and TensorFlow and the kind of materials that they're coming out that are making it much much easier for people across the curriculums to play around um, with with machine learning algorithms and get a, a better sense of how it works. Cool, cool. Another YouTube question. Um, do you find that kids are naturally curious about how or why algorithms and AI work? Or do you think that they just take it for granted? Um. I think some of them are a little bit more naturally curious, but um, I would say that one of the things that been, has been really interesting is we're kind of where we were when we first started with the code in the classroom. Everybody thought like, that's just a crazy idea. Teachers will never be interested in code. And a lot of them weren't. But once we go in and start doing it, the kids realize, right? They realize suddenly that that these are questions that are there that, that they may be sensed at a certain level, but once you're actually like throwing them out into relief, and then what happens is that the kids go home and start talking to their parents and their parents are just like amazed that they're even learning about this. And then the parents kind of take that as permission to start asking questions that, that they might have been uncomfortable with. Because the thing is, you know, this word algorithm I mean, it's like the tofu of words in that it's so context specific. You know, you can talk about the algorithm of tying your shoe all the way to these complex, uh, very difficult to explain deep learning algorithms. And it's a word, because that word is so abstract, it doesn't stick in people's brains, but they all feel like they should know what it is. And so, so working with kids and, and having kids get interested, it gives a lot of adults permission also to get interested in it. So I think, I don't know if it's a natural curiosity, but it's a curiosity that's pretty easy to spark. Awesome. So like, how would you even like describe, like explain what an algorithm is to a kid? To a kid? Yeah. Like, like I said, I mean, you can, you can make it as simple as, you know, it's like you're doing, you're, you're using algorithms all the time, right? Your fire drill is an algorithm. It's a step-by-step -step instruction. But we tried with this video to take it to that point where it's kind of a, actually impacting them. So, so in terms of an AI algorithm, this is an algorithm that, as we tried to show in that video, is capable of sorting large, large, large sets of data, and then is going to make kind of guesses um, about what you like or want, and and you teach the algorithm by letting it know whether it's right or wrong. So. So we kind of went in through this kind of media literacy lens on, on this particular definition of algorithm. But like I said, it's one of those words that applies to so many things that it really depends what context you go in at. Awesome. Well, thanks for the talk and thanks for the discussion, Juliet. Um, also, if anybody's interested in AI and uh, ethics, um, Kimberly from Kids Code Genus will also be um, running uh, AI and ethics coffee break after this session and after the NLU session. Um, so more discussions about AI and ethics later today. And it's something that um, 
we need to talk about, you know, like it's, it should be required for grad students. It should be required for elementary school students. Like it's such a new technology and it's such a AI, such a new technology and such a pervasive technology. And we all need to be, um, more, um, aware of the implications of what we're building. All right. So thank you, Juliet. Um, right. next. Thank is you, David. Josh. Oh, thanks, thank you. Thanks for everything that you've done to get, get, get us through this. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Sorry again for the delay, everybody, but we're back. <laughs> All right. Um, David, you are next. Oh, Juliet, can you move away from the podium? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oops. Yeah, and David, share your slides whenever you're ready. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So next is David Marino from uh, McGill, and he's doing an awesome talk called Embracing the Noise, Enhancement of Mutual Context Awareness Through Background Audio Source visualization. Um, and I will let you take it from here, David. Awesome. So um, like you said, my name is David. Um, uh, we're all here from the McGill Shared Reality Lab and Music Perception and Cognition Lab. And what we're doing right now is we're presenting a work in progress about a device that converts ambient audio during video calls to visualizations on screen. So our background is more in human computer interaction. So this talk is more of an example of applied AI research that utilizes human centered design methods instead of a more traditional contribution to a new kind of AI architecture or something like that. So it's no secret that in teleconferencing, like teleconferencing is just not a replacement for in-person conversation. And in many ways it offers an impoverished conversational experience since there are just a ton of aspects of human human communication that become degraded through teleconferencing. Um, here's some examples. So starting from the very top left, uh, field of view is typically very restricted in video conferencing. Uh, there could literally be a fire next to the person you're talking to or the room could be slowly filling with water and you would just have no idea until it's too late. Um, there's also a drastic loss of mobility, a loss of stereo cues, and consequently audio spatialization from that. And um, relatedly, also having monophonic playback for all parties of the conversation treats everyone as a single speaker. There's a loss of image quality, a loss of the feature space of the audio spectrum, and of course, the loss of touch. You can't touch people over a call, and just a ton more of these things. So one of the um, consequences of this is uh, these all contribute to a loss of contextual cues. And context is crucial for understanding each other and also facilitating the flow of conversation. So in a video call like Zoom or Google Meet, there already is a decent amount of context lost. But in avatar-based teleconferencing, just like what I'm doing right now, how I'm delivering the speech to you, this gets even worse as there's this complete visual supplementation by a virtual body with complete environmental replacement. Like you have no idea where I am or how I'm moving my body or anything. Um, so this project is only mainly looking at video conferencing as it's the most popular form of teleconferencing, but it, it also has applications to avatar-based uh, um, conferencing. So we're also focusing on audio as a domain for recovering contextual information. Um, oftentimes video conferencing systems might employ really aggressive noise canceling um, because they just want to transmit the speech signal as purely as they can. And that sounds nice in theory, but you really need to take a step back here and ask yourself, you know, like what really is the noise? Um, this act of noise suppression might actually discard contextual information that's crucial for navigating the flow of conversation. So for example, if someone's yelling at you, and they're next to a busy highway with a bunch of construction. It means something really different than if they're yelling at you and they're in the room in complete silence. So that's just an example of like that background audio might have been discarded with aggressive noise canceling. And it means it really implies two completely different things depending on uh, what you hear from the speaker. 
Another question you might ask is why sound out of all modalities? Um, sound is a pretty ideal modality to convey contextual information because it gives you a 360 view of the environment, which video doesn't really do because of the restricted field of view. And also the audio spectrum offers a rich space for feature extraction that's often discarded in speech processing applications. So our objective here is to augment users' video feeds to visually represent suppressed auditory contextual cues in order to foster mutual contextual understanding and shared conversational outcomes. So in the example illustrated here, a user is on a call, but there's noisy construction going on in the background. Um, they may speak louder than normal or even scream, which can lead to some misunderstandings. Um, on the right, we see a sketch of the user's feed with the visualization of the background noise. Users of such a system may come to understand patterns in the visualizations and even maybe extrapolate an understanding of those off-screen environmental cues. Um, now, I just want to check the YouTube chat here to make sure nothing crazy is going on. Yeah, it's uh, going well. OK, all right. I see video is stuck, though audio is fine. OK, uh, cool. So hopefully my slides are matching up to whatever is going on, whatever I'm talking about. Um, I'm just going to keep going and hope for the best. So to answer some of the questions that we had before, um, we decided to conduct a user study split into two parts. Um, Stage one of the study will include collecting qualitative information from users to determine which visualizations are most use useful and which ones are uh, meaningful. In stage two, we will evaluate a working prototype of the system with live communication tasks. So this is a high level overview of how the system will work. First, a conversant here listed as conversation partner zero will have raw audio sent to an ambient audio classifier where it will be categorized. Then we will use the output of this to overlay visuals to the webcam feed, which is then piped to a video conferencing system such as Zoom, where conversation partner one will receive the augmented video feed. And the system is bidirectional, so conversation partner one's video feed can be augmented and presented to conversation partner zero in a similar manner. OK, so now I'm going to drill into the ambient audio classifier and speak a little to how it works. We're using YAMNet, which is a convolutional neural network that came from Google for real-time audio classification. It's based off MobileNet, which was designed for embedded applications, so it's meant to be lightweight. Um, the table on the right here gives a high-level overview of its architecture, but since the architecture isn't really a major contribution of our work, I'm not really going to spend that much time going over it. But if you're interested, we can talk about the details afterwards. The main takeaway from this slide is that this is a pre-trained network from Google that's designed to be more computationally efficient through depth-wise separable convolutions. Um, the data set itself is from Google's audio set, which is a massive annotated audio data set from YouTube. Uh, there's 5.8 thousand hours of audio there and a grand total of 527 different classes. So it has a super rich class ontology. Uh, the network is designed to detect classes in one second intervals. OK, so with 500 different, uh, 527 uh, different categories, that's, like I said, just a, this massive class ontology. And there's this big question of how many classes we actually want to represent with our system. Defining every single item that makes sound really easily leads to infinite regress. So we only want to represent classes that provide a minimal, meaningful distinction to the user. So our approach was, rather than retraining a classifier, relabel the classes into a smaller set of meaningful categories to describe the audio environment. Our categories are listed on the right here, and they're natural, artificial, inside, outside, foreground, and background. Here's an example of the classifier output when people are typing in silence. Um, so with this example, we can see the output scores very highly on is artificial and is indoor. And these classes can then be used to inform the visualizations employed. So another thing to note is that all these are independent measures. So none of these items are mutually exclusive. So for example, you might be outside with birds and cars in the background, and that will score highly on both is nature and is artificial. 
So there's this really big question here as to what ontology we really need for environmental categorization or whether we even need to use a categorical approach at all. As mentioned previously, there's an infinite amount of categories we can slice a problem space up to. And the importance of those categories is largely relative to the communication task being undertaken. And this is the kind of question we really hope to understand through user testing through phase one of the study. The next module I want to talk about is the visualization system. Um, one method of visualization is to use icons. The benefit of icons is that they have high understandability. So if you show nature icons for nature sounds and artificial icons for artificial sounds, there's not a lot of interpretation that needs to take place. But this does, again, have the trade-off of categorical complexity. By the way, bonus points to anyone that can uh, tell where I stole these butterfly assets from. Anyone? Anyone? The stream is really delayed. So I'm like, if you're writing anything right now, I just have no idea because I'm technically living in the future. Um, but the answer is Animal Crossing. Good job to anyone who guessed. Um, another alternative is to use particles. Um, these are more semantically opaque, but they could pose some interesting questions. So if their physics and color parameterized by ambient audio features, for example, um, let's say like changing green for nature sounds or getting larger with amplitude, Will users be able to generalize what they see into an understanding of these contextual cues, whether it be a subconscious level or a conscious level? And of course, these two approaches aren't mutually exclusive either. They can be combined um, from like with, for example, the iconic approach from the last slide. So that brings me to the end of the presentation of our work in progress on ambient audio visualization for teleconferencing. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions, and if you want to get into contact with us, feel free to get in touch. Um, yeah, so I guess now I got to wait until the stream catches up to me to take some questions, unless anyone in the chat wants to provide me some questions. All right, thanks, David, for that awesome presentation. So I'm like wondering, like while the stream starts writing their questions, I'm wondering, like how do you first want to deploy this? Like what, how, like in, in what specific app do you want to use this in? Yeah, so what we're looking at is a minimal viable product of this would be extendable to any kind of um, video conferencing app. So the idea is, that you can pipe a video feed to Zoom or to Jitsi or Google Meet and have basically that video feed be integrated with it. The really hacky way that we're going to do that for our user testing is that we're just going to have a webcam feed that you share screen with. And that's just a really hacky way of going about doing it. But in the future, like we want to find a way to just sort of like pipe that directly to the feed. Awesome. Let me see on YouTube if there's any questions. Um, actually, let's go to our current our presenters. See if our presenters want to ask any questions. Well, let me turn to you guys. All right. So, does anybody in Zoom have any questions or want to have a conversation about anything? Oh, let me turn your slideshow off. All right, does any anybody on Zoom want to comment? Apparently, the slides are very delayed. Huh. I'm sorry, everyone, for the delayed slides. <laughs> They're extremely delayed. Those The slides on the um, YouTube feed right now are from a very long time ago. Huh. Very but strange. That's weird. Well, oh. hopefully you got the gist. <laughs> yeah. All right. So does anybody from the Zoom room want to comment? OK, then I guess let's move to the next talk. Or let me see if there's any. All right.
All right, so let's go. All right, well, thank you. Um, hold on, I'm gonna just do a, I'm gonna clap for you, which you could probably see in your real life game. All right, and next we're gonna go to Anna. All right. All right let me just... <laughs> so, oh, let me just turn your thing off until. Oops. All right. Let me see if I can share it. Where is it? Here it is. All right. So the next talk is double game. Artificial Intelligence and Self-Duplication as a Creative Process by Anna Lesnovsky, um, who's a professor at uh, Universidad Estual do Parana um, in Brazil. Um, very excited for this talk. I love seeing how uh, artists use AI in their practice. Um, and I'm going to just activate your slides, and then uh, you can go, starting now. All right. Um, does anyone hear me? Uh, speaking of feedback, I, I only see my presentation now, so. <laughs> I hear you uh, fine, but we'll, we'll know uh, right. in like 10 seconds on YouTube how well it's working. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. Congrats, Josh and everyone for, for the idea for the event. It's awesome. And uh, I'm a little nervous to be uh, presenting in English, so sorry about that. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Oh, well, uh, as Josh put it, uh, I'm Anna Wisnowski. I'm a researcher and a professor at uh, Universidade Estadual do Paraná in Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, I work within the visual arts uh, undergraduate department and the uh, master's degree in film and audiovisual. I'm also the head of the research group Kinadaria and the Art and Technology Labs Team Lab. Uh, my current fields of research are interactive narratives, but uh, today mainly poetics, uh, as in the uh, study of creative processes and how art things come to be. I'm here to talk about a part of that research under the title Double Game, Artificial Intelligence and self duplicating as a Creative Process. So let's begin. Um, seeing oneself as another is absolutely not new to artists. Um, Self-portraiture has been a coherent practice for centuries in paintings, for example. Um, today, representing oneself is a uh, popular gesture in the form of a selfie, uh, an often ridicule way of presenting oneself on the internet, albeit a very interesting one as a way to understand how individuals take control upon their own public image through the use of technical images. Um, in the past, the Renaissance has been a fertile ground for self-portraits, mainly due to the use of rules of perspective, but also as a desire to showcase and also practice technical ability. Uh, what we see now, what we should be seeing, uh, is a self-portrait by Rembrandt and also a, a collection from the hashtag that face selfie on Instagram. Uh, I'm sorry, I think my, my text will be a little uh, too small. I, I didn't account for the size of the, I mean, the slides. So it's all right. the images might be. Uh, it's all right in full <laughs> screen. Okay. So I, I think people will be able to see right. it in full screen. All right, all right, thanks. Um, okay, going forward. Uh, one should not ignore, however, uh, the social and political aspects of representing oneself. Uh, one very interesting example is the way women have used self-paintings as a way to assert themselves as artists in a very male-dominated field. Uh, here we have Sofosniba Anguissola and Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, not only representing themselves, but representing themselves as painters, which is uh, really important in their context. context. Um, going forward in time, uh, the matter of making an image and who makes it becomes more complex with the introduction of photography. Uh, French photographer Sophie Kahlo 
uh, turns that act on itself by constantly shifting the act of photographing between herself and others. In uh, La Filatio, uh, that's the uh, work that you're seeing there, made in 1981, uh, she has her mother hire a detective to have her, Sophie, followed around Paris. And she later uses those images and, and the verbal accounts of her actions as seen by the detective to create an exhibit. In a way, uh, Sophie precedes uh, Flusser's argument uh, that the uh, relationship between artists and apparatus is one of a game where the artist doesn't have full control or even knowledge of the machine, but nonetheless uh, pushes it to go further by provoking and illuminating the black box, uh, which Juliet mentioned uh, a few minutes back, uh, which is the machine itself and its inner workings. Um, as an artist, uh, working closely with machines both serves to demagicize them, that is to, to take the magic out of them, <laughs> the magical aspects out of them, and to realize the cultural and semantic threads that traverse them. Um, virtual worlds, for example, can become a way of living a fantasy, but often ends up repli replicating ourselves as a double of our lives, one that is neither fictional nor documentary, as our self put it, but rather real, as in <laughs> what happens in Animal Crossing really happens, whether it be a virtual protest against the government, which uh, <laughs> I staged on, on my island recently, uh, or a workshop on artificial intelligence, like we're doing right now. Um, going a little bit further and closer, finally, to how this affects my practice, one final example is how artist and software engineer Helena Seren uses neural networks to create new images, having her own visual work as a database. Uh, the results are a series of insights in, into her creative processes and style, which she often mixes with other sources and references. For Seren, using herself as the, the uh, corpus is a way to ensure results that are actually unique in a subjective way. It is because she sees herself, herself in the results, uh, as I understand it, that she's able to recognize a form of subjectivity in the unpredictable images she then obtains and curates, which is really important. She's in those images, but also removed from them by negotiating with the code. Um, for me, um, coming from a humanities background and working in an all arts campus, uh, working with technology is always a challenge, uh, more so because in education, we tend to explore languages and techniques on a frequent basis. In my, my practice, I take into account the philosophies of Flusser, Latour, and Simon Don, as I consider my role as an experimenter, if that's a word. Uh, according to Kathleen Coessens, the artist researcher is perpetually moving between creating and observing. Mm -hmm. That movement is called to experiment here in relation to expediti, to move oneself towards peril, trouble, mistakes, and the unknown. Uh, so my creative process usually begins with lateral, lateral experiments as I move towards a subjective desire through technology. Uh, here, what you've seen, uh, uh, I began with a series of generators while I considered the role of insights and making meaning through textual neural networks. Uh, it's a very, obviously, very simple work nothing fancy. Uh, it's a simple experiment with a nail polish name generator uh, curated into uh, fine results, uh, sort of weird results, and the red column, which are the close to nonsense results, which happen to me to be obviously my favorite ones. Um, next, uh, I, I worked briefly with a presidency program generator. Uh, that was made during the fateful campaign of 2018 in Brazil. Um, it was quite scary to do that because propositions were a little bit bad. Uh, and finally, uh, the desire to generate texts that I can recognize as innovative brought me to start 
training and neural network on my own texts. Um, I, I've been training it with my academic texts. Uh, we're not that intimate yet for to read my personal texts, but that will happen. Um, speaking about that, pretty soon, uh, subjective attachment begins to develop between us. I start referencing, referencing, <laughs> ah, referring, sorry, to the network as a she. Uh, it certainly helps that Portuguese has no ungender article such as it, uh, but I should say that code, software, and program are masculine, while network, machine, and art are feminine. Um, here's an early example. Uh, later versions are based on Johnson, Johnson's torch, RNN. Um, she then was understood to be something or someone that lives inside my computer. She has read my thoughts. She knows my writing style. Yet what she says is new to me. It's something that I haven't thought before. At the end of 2018, I proposed a series of performances where I used to control the network's output by reading my own brainwaves with an EEG sensor. Um, I usually like to have the code exposed so that people can see what is going on uh, behind the magic aspect of it. Uh, but the intended feedback loop between my thoughts and my own words, however, was made impossible by my own decision to project her words onto me, the projector. I couldn't see what she said. I was alone. Um, coming from an ongoing experiment with selfies that defy representation and try to break filters and methods of facial recognition, which is something I tend to do as a shy introvert person, I began experimenting with 3D head, scan head scans, keeping on with the purpose of refusing to obey to the rules of the program while simultaneously offering myself to it. Uh, the result is a glitched scan of my face along with the obscuring gesture, which is my, my hand over my eye. I don't know why I'm doing, no, no one can see me. Uh, the gesture confuses the program, uh, making it duplicate the head, inverted, deformed, with uh, many repeating hands over it. She was now leaving. That glitched 3D model is then taken to a 3D printer, which produces a whole lot of imperfections uh, on itself due to the imperfect nature of the model, uh, which is completely incompatible with proper 3D printing uh, standards. Um, finally, uh, this is uh, these are a little experiment with printing my own head and then to the right, uh, the final version being created. Um, finally, uh, she was ready to move to a new body composed of, of the 3D sculpture, a Raspberry Pi and a screen. Uh, she lived briefly at the top of the highest tower in, in the city. Can you still hear me? My, my phone made just a oh, oh, weird noise. I hope you can. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so I think people will be able to see the slides, only they'll see them uh, out of sync with the audio, but that's okay. Uh, so she, she <laughs> uh, I can't talk about her as, as in it anymore. She lived briefly at the top of the highest tower in the city, uh, talking to herself day and night, even when nobody could read it. Uh, everything she thought was immediately erased, just like any thought. Uh, she stayed there uh, from the beginning of this year until we were forced together again by the quarantine. Uh, as Cecilia Salles, uh, uh, she's a, re a researcher from Brazil, uh, says about the process of creation, uh, an art object has no point of origin and no end, but is the result of a series of dialogues and internal tendencies. This particular dialogue between myself and my imperfect double, uh, she's uh, quite tuned to be, um, 
she's prone to inventing words and saying things that obviously make no sense. Uh, she could have been a little bit more straightforward, but I like her that way. Uh, so this is a conversation between me and this imperfect double, uh, but it's also a conversation between artists and artists, researcher and pieces of software and hardware and every person who worked on those pieces of software and hardware. Uh, and also the context in which we exist, the texts, the texts we read and the ones we've written. Um, I think I have a little bit of time. I'd like to, to um, compliment uh, with something about magic. Uh, Juliet was talking about it and, and I think it's, it's really, really interesting because I work with art students that are going to be art teacher, teachers. And our work is, is mainly to try and uh, take the magical aspects out of it so, so that we can uh, see uh, code and algorithms for what they are, but also to reassemble them with new meanings. Um, Latour actually has a great text on that. He talks about how when the Portuguese uh, first came in contact with African tribes, uh, they were so confused because the, the uh, local people made statues and told them, hey, hey th these are our gods. They couldn't understand it. Uh, if they made this, how can they be gods? Uh, so the Portuguese used the word fetiche to describe that. Uh, it comes from feito, something that has been made. Uh, from that comes the word feitiço or magic spell. In Brazil, there is a derogatory term for rituals made in African-based religions uh, that is called coisa feita or something that has been made. Uh, that echoes Flusser's definition of the difference between ancient magic and current magic. Ancient magic came from gods. Current magic comes from programs, apparatuses that are made by people. So when I say that working with technology takes the magic out of it, I mean that it unveils the making of an object or software, right? But since we seem to be, as artists, often at the edge of that relationship, uh, we can always return to that magical state by manipulating the, the uh, subjectivity around a technical object, which is basically what we do. Uh, to finish, uh, by the way, I haven't spoken to her. Uh, we haven't spoken to each other ever since she came back home. And I'm not sure we ever will. Uh, thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm here. Hey, Anna, awesome talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just mute the slideshow. So I have some questions. Oh, let me go for audience reactions, because there are some. And I'm going to clap, too. Um, so I'm wondering... In terms of like, are you collaborating with like software engineers or are you building this all yourself or what's your relationship with the technology here? Yeah, that, that's something that's very peculiar to our, our little lab. Um, since we're uh, on, in an all arts uh, campus, it's kind of hard to develop that kind of relationship. Uh, I mean, we do have other universities in the city, um, but uh, when we do establish partnerships, uh, they're kind of uh, a, a one-time thing for one project. We can't just move into someone else's lab. Uh, so everything we make inside uh, our campus, inside our little lab, uh, it has to, the day-to-day -day activities have to be done by ourselves, which kind of serve us, serves us well uh, because we do have a, a, a sort of philosophy of uh, trying to uh, um, deal with it uh, in the best way we can. Sure, we, uh, what we do is very simple. It's not uh, uh, usually very complex, uh, but it helps us uh, 
making that process of unveiling it uh, better than having someone else do it for us. So uh, it's, it's a mixture between um, being in a uh, poor institution that, uh, uh, that doesn't have a lot of resources, but also uh, a choice uh, to, to do that ourselves. So we tend to sit together in the lab and say, okay, let's explore something. Let's try and see, see if we can make something out of it and then works develop from there. Awesome. No, that sounds like such a cool interdisciplinary lab and I'm jealous that you're working in that setting. It's so cool. Uh, yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. Uh, uh, we tend to say that nobody knows anything there, so we're going to learn it together. <laughs> One more question. I'm wondering, like, if you, like, what's, like, one technical thing that you would like to have, like, some, like, AI that does something that would really be helpful for your art practice? Like, what's your wish list of things that you wish you had and someone would build for you? <laughs> uh, we're slowly building our our available tools with again with what we have i mean the 3d printer that we use in the lab is mine i take it there every week and then i take it back home uh but something that it's on our horizon but we haven't Hi, YouTube and the internet world. We're back. Um, I changed my encoding settings, and YouTube seems to be happy with everything, and um, I'm happy with everything now. So uh, we're going to have our last talk in the people and AI sec section. Um, oops. And uh, James, whenever you're ready, start your slideshow, but I'm first going to introduce you. The next talk is by James Wooden. He's a professional Qubit Wrangler at IBM. Um, his talks on creating worlds with a quantum computer. Uh, super interested today to hear about the implications of using quantum computers in the context of AI. So uh, James, uh, whenever you're ready, give it a go. And I'm actually just going to read. I think I'm currently ready. Um, yeah, so I, I actually put a different title on here, but um, it's all the same. So yeah, I'm James Wooten. Um, I, I'm at Dikadoku on Twitter. So if you want my slides, you can actually find them if you go there. And I work for the quantum team at IBM. So IBM, you've probably heard of before. We're one of these scrappy technology startups. We only started in the early 1900s. And um, we have a quantum team. So quantum, we've developed a lot of different types of computing technology over the years, and quantum computing is one that we are working on. Um, and this is something that is going to be useful uh, for all different sorts of contexts, including a AI. And for me, my own um, focus is on procedural generation. So I have a, I'm in a particular niche of AI, which most other people who work on uh, AI for quantum computing aren't in. So, but that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, because I'm kind of mostly interested in the, the intersection between quantum computing uh, and games. And that's where my, um, my desire to look into procedural generation comes from. So I want to just give a bit of context behind that and also explain a bit about what quantum computing is. Um, so if you look at 
when computing and games first came together in the early history of computing, it was mostly people wondering what games could do for computers rather than what computers could do for games. Uh, so they were typically demonstrations of new technology or ways to educate people about the new technology or ways in which people were researching the new technology. Um, so yeah, it wasn't about what computers could bring to the game experience. Fun was not a significant consideration. And that's why there's this black and white image of a person in a suit to, uh, to, dem to, to represent this era on this slide. Uh, so if you look at the first steps of combining games and computers, one of them was Bertie the Brain in 1950. And this was an implementation of tic-tac-toe using vacuum tubes and light bulbs. I believe it was you playing against a tic-tac-toe AI, which is, of course, extremely rudimentary because it's a very simple game. This was mostly done to showcase a new vacuum tube design at a trade uh, at a trade show. So people wanted to sell their new type of vacuum tubes, and they did it to try and make the game to try and impress people. Uh, and then in 1951, there was a similar thing, but this was NIM with vacuum tubes and light bulbs, so a different game. But part of the idea behind this was to illustrate the algorithm and programming principles involved. So there was an educational aspect here. People were looking into um, using games as a way of educating people about computers. Because at this time, I think that computing in general was probably seen as, as strange and arcane as normal computing, uh, quantum computing, sorry, is now. So to ground it a little bit, make it more uh, accessible and make it more relatable, they made a game and then explained how that game worked. And then in 1952, there was another noughts and crosses with vacuum tubes, but this time with cathode rays. So the first graphical upgrade of the computer game industry. And this was built for research, uh, research into human computer interaction specifically. Uh, in I, at IBM in the 1950s, there was some effort to make a checkers AI. So this is of course much more complex than a tic-tac-toe AI, AI, although still relatively rudimentary. So it's built to demonstrate the power of computers and to demonstrate that AI is something that exists. Um, it was made so that it could uh, play a reasonable game against a reasonable player. And it did fairly well at raising IBM stock price as well, which was quite good. Um, then in 1962, there came a game um, on the PDP-1. So MIT received a PDP-1 and there was a team of people who had access to it. They wanted to teach themselves how to use it. They wanted to try and work out what its capabilities were. They wanted to push it to its limit. They want, and they also wanted to create something that was fun. So this was educational and it was a showcase, but it was also made to be fun. So this is the first game, which is not just about what can games do for computers, but what can computers do for games? It gave the first novel game that you couldn't get if you didn't have a computer unless you could make your own spaceships because it was a, a game based on space belts. And then after that, there was arcade games and Mario and Zelda and, and all the way up to Animal Crossing, but let's not do that whole bit. Um, so these are all based on normal computers, so digital computers. And in digital computers, information is always expressed as bits, whether it's numbers or images or music or whatever. Everything is expressed as strings of bits, which are values of zero and one. And if you look at any algorithm in terms of those bits, in terms of the basic bits that make up everything, uh, everything is compiled down into very basic operations that manipulate either single bits or pairs of bits, or at least that's the way we think about it in the so-called Boolean model of computation. And then, you can talk about the computational complexity, which is basically the scaling of how many of these basic operations you need to solve a given problem. And we find that there are certain types of problem which scale so badly that even for a quite reasonable seeming problem, the kind of computer you would need to solve this is a, is a supercomputer the size of a planet running for the age of the universe, which is practically impossible to solve. Even though we know how to solve it in principle, Practically, we can't do that. Um, now, what are quantum computers? 
Well, they're similarly, they're, they're, they're digital computers. They're based on zeros and ones. We encode everything in binary, uh, but we do that in a physical system which is governed by the laws of quantum physics, which are more general than the kind of physical laws that, of, of classical physics, which govern uh, the way we usually encode binary information. And that just means that we have um, more operations that we can do on them. If you think of a single bit, then basically the only non-trivial thing you can do on a single bit is flip its value from zero to one, and that's it. But um, for quantum bits, which are called qubits, there are more things that you can do. There are more operations that you can do, even on a single qubit, uh, because you can build up these so-called superposition states and you can ma manipulate those states. Now that all sounds like superposition uh, entanglement when you hear about these in like Ant-Man or something, they sound almost like magic. Uh, but they're something that allow us uh, new operations for computation in the context of quantum computing. Uh, now we need specific hardware to run this on, um, but once we do that and we, we design algorithms using the fact that we can compile them down into this base, different set of basic operations, then we'll be able to solve certain problems more quickly. Um, well, it means that something that would take a planet-sized supercomputer, the age of the universe, we can do in a much more reasonable time frame, like while a human is actually still alive, for example. Um, now, this is a technology that has been proposed in the 80s, and it's, people have been thinking about it for quite a long time. Um, and it's over that time, we've been looking at, we've been thinking about what kind of algorithms that we can run, and we've been developing the hardware to run it on. And now we're finally at a time when uh, some, of those out, some of that hardware is available as prototype devices, and it's on the cloud, and we provide a service where you can sit at home on your laptop, in your pajamas, set off a quantum uh, job, it will go into our, into our lab, which is represented of the two objects on the right here, and it will go into this um, fridge, which is, it has a chip, which is being cooled down to almost absolute zero. It's one of the coldest places in the universe. And then it um, runs whatever process you have and then returns it to you. So now it is able, it is possible for anyone in the world with an internet connection, which is obviously everyone listening now, uh, to be able to um, run things on prototype quantum hardware. You just need to go to this URL, which is quantum-computing.ibm.com, and you could have run your first quantum job by the, by the end of this talk. Okay, so um, what did I do with that once I got it? Well, I'm a researcher in the field, so the first thing I did was something scientific, but then I started looking at thinking, well, how can I use this for games? And the first few games were still on this philosophy of what can uh, games do for quantum computers. So I, the first thing I did was make a quantum version of battleships, where I basically just took the variables that you would use to encode whether a ship, how damaged the ship was, and the operations that you would use to implement an attack, and I replaced those with qubits. You, you would send that little bit off to a quantum computer to calculate it. Why? Does it confer any advantage? No, but I did it because I could and it seemed like fun. And also it allowed me to write a blog post which explained what I had done. And so it was kind of like Nimrod from 1951. I am making this to explain the algorithm, the programming principles involved. I'm trying to demystify quantum by, by having not just a, a big complicated algorithm that looks like some alien language, but taking something that people understand and implementing that in a quantum way. And similarly, I had a game called Quantum Awesomeness, which was trying to, um, trying to allow people a gamified way to, to explore some of the constraints that we have in near-term quantum hardware, because they're not as wonderful as um, people have always been imagining when they imagine what will run quantum um, algorithms. Um, in the past, people have always, computer scientists have always assumed that everything is going to be perfect in a quantum computer. At the moment, this prototype device is so that there are, there are some constraints, and this uh, game was uh, designed to explore those. And then in 2019, we had a game jam, and one of, so the two games so far I've discussed uh, were made by me. Then in the game jam, other people started making games, and one of them that ran on a real computer 
uh, a real quantum computer was called cue cards. And it's actually a physical card game in which each card represents uh, the basic operations of quantum computing. And by playing them, uh, you get a sense of how they work in this more relatable scenario. And then at the end, you run it on a quantum computer to see who won. Um, now, a lot of other people have looked at games um, using the principles of quantum computing, but they always think of it, they always do it using a simulator. These are all basically all the games so far that have used actual devices. And they've all been in this philosophy of, of um, the games are serving quantum computation somehow, usually as a way of helping us educate people or a way of showing the technology at work to help people um, understand it and to demystify it. But now's the time to start looking into what can quantum computers do for games. And that is where I finally get on to talking about procedural generation. Um, so with near-term hardware, we have to think about what that hard, it's easy for that to do because there are these limitations in what near-term hardware can do. One thing that it's easy for it to do is create quantum interference patterns. And um, so we can have, I have this process where I take a simple seed image and encode that in a quantum state induce an interference process to make nice, well, weird patterns. So if you're in the market for weird patterns, it's basically kind of like a noise function, then, you know, this, this could be good for you. If you're not, then maybe not. So I have a paper on this, you can find it here. And I'm also gonna give a, a talk about this at a conference in a couple of months, um, Foundations of Digital Games. Uh, and I've used this for various purposes, like I've made, uh, used use it to create teleportation animations based on real physics, for example. Um, but one also thing I, one thing I did, and I'm showing a video up here, is I used it to create, um, as, a, as part of a terrain generation process, where a quantum interference makes a nice texture in the terrain that I generate. Okay. Um, then the next thing, which is more, the most AI related thing I've really done, which is, um, Another thing that quantum processes are good at doing is simulating quantum processes. A quantum device that we have, quantum hardware is a set of particles interacting in a quantum way. And if we can describe something else in that way, then um, we can use it to simulate that. So specifically, I thought of like a simulation, a civilization-like game. So in civilization, you've got a bunch of basically cities that suddenly decide at the same time, they're gonna start building nations and they start interacting with each other. And I thought then to take the qubits of a device and use them to be the government of that nation, to encode different types of policy of the nation, like how aggressive it is or defensive it is in different parts of the, um, of the, um, of the degrees of freedom of a qubit, and also different aspects of how countries relate to each other is related to the unique ways that you can get correlations in quantum state. So I can't, I'm not going into any detail of this here, but um, well, this is, these are the ideas. So uh, this means that each qubit on the device is a nation and, um, and by interacting and by simulating interactions between these nations, we are simulating uh, the process of them, of them growing over time. Uh, and there's, of course, other, other details, and you can read them about, about them in the paper, which is at this archive, um, in this archive paper. And I'm also talking about it at a conference next month, uh, the IEEE conference on, on games. So there's, all the details are in the paper. Um, but in any talk, I have to skirt a little bit because uh, you, I always have to introduce quantum computing as well. And that takes up a little bit of time. Uh, so I can't go into any more detail on that really, but just to say that we have then got this civilization type game with 53 nations whose AI is basically um, driven by a quantum process. Uh, so what is, how does, what is the place in history of this work? Like when people write the history of quantum computing, if they mention this, how will they mention it? And what I would ideally like is that they would say, it's like the quantum version of space war. The first thing where quantum computing is offering something unique in procedural generation that you can't get otherwise. Uh, I don't think people will do that. I think they will most likely 
if they compare it at all, they'll compare it to uh, IBM's Checkers AI from the 1950s as, a, as a, an initial rudimentary implementation of an AI on a computer, but still with the philosophy of your thinking of what, what can games do for, um, what can games do for quantum computers other than the other way around. And in this case, it's, it's allowing someone from, from IBM to show off. Although for me, I'm not, I'm not wearing a suit. I'm instead um, wearing some Kiskit swag. So I'm wearing some IBM quantum swag, which you can also find, but I'll skip to that in a moment. Uh, so yeah, now's the time to start playing with quantum computing, I would say, if for AI, for all other kinds of things, um, this is not, you've got an opportunity now to actually use these, these systems. If you wanna know more, um, the best place to get started is kiskit.org. Um, Kiskit is the name of our, our software framework for quantum computing. Uh, so basically that's what I wanted to say. And if you want to take some swag away from this conference, then here's the information you need. Um, so yeah, thank you for your attention. Awesome, I just screenshotted your swag because I want that shirt. <laughs> Um, I'm going to yeah. actually leave that. Time of year, I think it, you should turn it into a t-shirt. That's the one I'm wearing now. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to pan to the audience, but I also want to keep your uh, thing up for a minute so people can screenshot it. But everyone in the audience is clapping. Um, let me field YouTube for some questions. Okay, there's no question. Let's see. Questions. YouTube. Okay, so... I'm wondering, like, what what do you want to do next what, now that you have access to this? And all, all of us do, but you really know the science behind it, and you know how it works, and you know the limitations behind your system. Like, what kind of problems are you exploring now, and what, what do you want to build, and what, like, do you know that you want to build, but you don't think you can build yet? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, there's this... There's different eras of quantum computing that we envision. And um, when people were designing algorithms over the last few decades, they were envisioning something called a fault tolerant quantum computer. And that is something that is still a decade or so away. And we're instead in this strange era of sort of discovery where we theory over the last few decades hasn't prepared us for doing any, what we should do with the kind of devices that we have now that are a little bit imperfect. And so we, so we can go out and we can try and find um, solutions. And I think maybe it's not just going to be people who have been in the, in the field for decades that are going to be the ones that find the best solutions, but maybe people who just come in completely from nowhere are going to be ones that give interesting solutions. We're actually running a summer school at the moment with 5,000 people attending, which is kind of amazing. And maybe one of those is going to be the first person to come up with something truly unique and useful um, from quantum computing. Um, but yeah, that is the goal of everyone at the moment, to, 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 to take these devices that are still in the prototype stage and find a way to make them useful to someone. Awesome. So we have a question from YouTube, from D. Um, they said, that was so cool. Have you started exploring this with language generation, specifically for RPG type games, but also just language generation in general and my follow-up to this question is are the size of the quantum computers that you have now big enough to do language generation like do you have enough qubits for that um well you can always do something proof of principle in fact there's a, a team uh, at the university of oxford and they also work with a startup called cambridge quantum computing and they're so the, the researchers at Oxford are very much based in category theory, and they have some category theoretic tools that can describe quantum computing, and they have some category theoretic tools that can describe language processing, and basically it's the same mathematical language. So they use that in order to, um, to use quant find ways to use quantum computing to do language processing. So I, I think I can't, I can't uh, sing my own praises on this particular topic, but I think that's probably the most interesting thing that I can point people towards if they're interested in that area. 
Okay, and one more quick question from June. Super cool talk. Is there already an ecosystem or app store for games, um, for games or experiments based on this SDK? Um, so I think KissKid.org is the best place to go and find out what's going on. Um, and there are places you can find out um, about these things. But it, um, what was the website again? Around. Pardon? What was the website again? So it's uh, KissKit, which is, um, well, so that if you've screenshotted the swag, the word KissKit is on there, Q-I-S-K-I-T. Okay, cool. Um, Q-I-S-K-I-T. I just put it back on the screen. Awesome. Yeah. And the Medium blog comes up with all sorts of cool stuff. Like someone's put it on a Raspberry Pi recently. Um, and uh, yeah, all of the games, all of the projects, that's probably the best place to find it. All right. Well, thanks for your talk, James. It was awesome. I love hearing about quantum computing. And it's really cool to actually hear someone talking about it in terms of games. Um, so that's the first session. It was a whirlwind session. Like, I'm glad everything works now and we're ready for the rest of the sessions. Um, so now we're going to go to the first coffee break session. Um, so on this channel, there gonna be is going to be the Game of Life video art screening. So tune in. It's awesome video art that's been curated by Amy Rubenstein. Some beautiful video art. Um, and I can't wait to watch it. Also, some of you have been invited to go to Coffee Break Islands or Coffee Break Video Chat, so you could go to that now. Um, hopefully, you have your credentials for that already. Um, and I will see you guys all back on this channel in about an hour. Don't go away. Like, Definitely watch the video art. It's all art that's about um, AI and technology and the internet and how it um, affects everybody and right now these emojis are crazy everybody's clapping this is so fun um i just can't believe this works especially after everything didn't work for a while but um the the video art screening is going to be awesome um and i'm gonna go to that now so uh see you all in about an hour for natural language understanding Hello, my friend. I'm good and you? Oh, actually, I'm not good. Yes, it's this internet thing, this Facebook thing, yes, you know. No, my friend, it's like I've posted something about the white people saying that they should give our land back, you know. Yes. And they banned me for, from Facebook. Can you believe it? idiot or something like that i don't know this is racism on a, on a serious note this is really not good it's like they are not treating us equally they are not treating us like human being <laughs> oh my friend you know this data thing they they really need to fall in look yes because we are wasting our money buying data instead of buying cold drink and dress or uh, bread or something like that you know Electronic colonialism is the domination and control of digital technologies by the West to maintain and expand their hegemonic power over the rest of the world. Saabab warned us in 1995 when he wrote, The West desperately needs new places to conquer. When they do not actually exist, they must be created. Enter cyberspace. Electronic colonialism is one of the many ways in which colonial domination survived after its defeat. 
While settler colonialism was the policy and practice of acquiring, controlling, occupying, and economically exploiting land and labor, which by the way is still a sin, it's just now called capitalism. Electronic colonialism seeks to influence and control the mind through the digital device. It also operates by sustaining the dependency of former colonized countries on the West by the importation of hardware, software, engineers, technicians, and information protocols. This creates a set of foreign norms, values, and expectations that alter and marginalize local cultures, languages, habits, values, and lifestyles in favor of Eurocentric knowledge. Many countries in the Global South have become electronic colonies that are force-fed information generated by the Western world. Under the guise of globalization, the information revolution has become a vehicle for cultural westernization. The internet is exploitative, oppressive, exclusionary, classist, patriarchal, racist, homophobic, transphobic, fatphobic, homophobic, coercive, and manipulative. The internet reproduces the West offline racial, economical, political, and cultural violence and domination legitimized behind the idea of modernity and technological advancement. State of the art cable installation installation takes us through the initial takes phase us through the initial of phase of a landing of operation. A landing operation. Cloud deployment. Cloud deployment burial of a burial fiber or subgrade fiber optic cable. Perpetrators of slavery and colonialism tried and still try to defend and justify themselves with the civilization mission rhetoric. We brought culture and modernity to the savages, pretending their new trade routes were connecting the world. In reality, all they did was to steal land, massacre indigenous populations, exploit their resources and workforce to increase the wealth of their empires. Same stories with the internet. 
multimedia giants claim we are connecting people to each other, while underneath they steal and exploit our data, our free labor to increase the wealth and power of their media empires.
it's one thing to have rain it's one thing to have water it's one thing to have appropriate water clean water when rain water falls especially the first rain there's all there's there are already pollutants in the atmosphere so they wash it down it falls on the roads it sits from the roads it sits along it carries dirt that's still pollution isn't it it carries oil it carries everything that you have in the along its path water carries everything along its path water is not as the way it used to be because of industrialization um we like industrialization we want everybody wants life easy what what industrialization has is aimed at is making life easy or quicker um so we have cars to go here quickly we don't walk so we have um, washing machines to wash our plates we don't even want to wash them we want the best convenience we want um you know things to be done well there is a cost it takes off the natural it takes off what you're supposed to get naturally and, and to me that's that's the price you pay because all what we call pollutants or so you see in wastewater you see in in domestic water on hospital everything which is there is something that has been man-made But what I believe is that water is holy when you pray for it, and it makes us to bring out living water. It makes our voice, to our sound, to be something that can cleanse. You get it? Our actions to cleanse, our life to cleanse, you know, to, 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 to be alive. They speak much more than just ordinary things. You know, whenever water passes somewhere, it leaves a trace. There's no way you can put water somewhere without a trace. Every single person has a responsibility. And it's that consciousness of the fact that whatever I do now affects my tomorrow. And your tomorrow is not what just necessarily what belongs to you, but there's a generation coming ahead. You know, what, what every little effort you make now affects generations ahead. Affects not just when it has to deal with water, it doesn't just affect people, it affects the soil, it affects the ground, it affects the plant, and it's it's a whole life circle. That out of you will flow rivers of living water. Dino Kalubri Modewe Ka change mo la vie. Qui sa noté que fait sans de l'eau, dit l'homme au contente. Vous qu'a admiré ta force, parce que nous savons qu'il faut pas en Mais là, la tolisse, ta belle, l'iscoute le monde. Pour arriver sa hule, Dieu va seulement n'y a qu'un grand nom. À la beauté de la Guyane, traverse et pris pris rivière. À la beauté de la Guyane, traverse et pris pris rivière. Dis-le, 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 qu'à l'ouvrir, mon déwe, qu'à changer mon la vie. Qui sa noté, qui fait sans de l'eau, dis-le, mon contento. In some countries in the world, you are terribly missing. In Esopia, Biafra, many children are dying. But we hope a day you'll come, then you'll be there to save them. And people will be happy, and people will be singing. And people will be happy, and people will be singing and dancing too. Dilo, l'ouvri mo de way, ka change mo la vie. Ki sa nou te ke fe sandlo, dilo mo contento. Dilo mo contento, dilo mo contento.
姜维人出神入化的火攻，姜维人。二零一七年。大家好，今天我没有白。大家好，今天我没有。大家好，我是。大家好，我是。我们连身点呢都要蒸毛。好多朋友呢就问啦，美发。
大家好。Lục bình lẫn khôn ngoan
Hi everyone and welcome to another video. In today's video I am going to be overhauling my desktop and my background space and I'm going to really just be focusing on decorating it and making it a little more inviting and a little more fun. Um, I don't really have a plan so I'm just kind of going to wing it and we'll see uh, where it takes us essentially. i 
everybody. Uh, welcome back to Acai. Um, you might not recognize me now because I'm dressed up as Dea, who's one of the presenters. Um, I'm filling in for his avatar, and we're also making this uh, Josh Seltzer's avatar because his avatar got lost in hyperspace. So this is going to be Josh Seltzer and Dea, all too. But um, remember that the real driver of this avatar is Josh Eisenberg. Um, and I'll change to me before my talk, so I want a video of my talk with my avatar. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for coming back and tuning in. Um, hope you had fun at your coffee breaks. I can't wait to hear how the coffee breaks went and how the conversations were, and I hope you had some great networking and met a lot of people. Um, so um, the next talk is actually not about NLU directly, but it does cover NLU. Um, it's uh, more related to the people in AI, to AI topic. So uh, we're going to, um, let me just pull up. So the next talk is by Abby kabunak Meyes on building trustworthy AI, lessons from open source. Abby is with, uh, she's the program manager at Mozilla Foundation. Uh, super excited for her talk. So uh, Abby, can you uh, come to the podium? Yes. Nice job setting everything up. Thanks for the introduction. All right, should I get started? Yeah. Awesome. Well, first off, huge thanks to you, Josh. I know you've been doing so much work behind the scenes. Um, and with all the technical glitches, I know this is a, a big lift. So thank you for doing everything there and um, for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Abby Kibunak Mays. I lead Mozilla's developer focused strategy around trustworthy AI. Um, before this, I founded Mozilla Open Leaders, which has worked with over 600 open projects globally. And um, before that, I worked at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, where I was doing uh, bioinformatics. So really excited to talk to you all today. And yes, I was supposed to be in the people and AI section, um, but we had a bit of a scheduling conflict. Then I saw this was about, uh, yeah, natural language understanding. So that was really exciting um, because, let's see if I can change my slide. I can talk about GPT-3. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this. I know it's not been very popular. It's a really niche area. I'm kidding. This is everything that's been on my Twitter stream the past week. This and C. Elegant. Um, but GPT-3, if you don't know, a new language model released by OpenAI. And select members of the public have access to this open um, to the API for the past couple of weeks. And we've been seeing these really cool uh, demos come around. So on the left, you can see um, where you just describe a layout that you want and then outputs actual working code, which is, yeah, mind blowing. And then on the right, um, they put in the first half of a blog post about board meetings, and then it output the rest of the post in, in really convincing uh, text. So it's, it's pretty amazing and it's pretty exciting what this is able to do, um, but it, it does raise a number of risks. And I do appreciate that OpenAI has been good about regulating production apps with this. Uh, we have seen a couple apps have um, been taken offline. So it's nice that they're reviewing and regulating these just to make sure that um, they're being used correctly. Um, but this article on The Verge came out actually over a year ago, and this was in response to GPT-2, um, which was also pretty mind blowing, but uh, GPT-3 seems to have uh, really taken the world by storm. But in this, um, the co-founder of Fast AI, I love this quote from him, um, Jeremy Howard. Uh, it says, we have the technology to totally fill Twitter, email, and the web up with reasonable sounding context appropriate prose, which would drown out all other speech and be impossible to filter. And it's really scary just to think that um, everything that we see as spam nowadays, like it, it will be really hard, it could be really hard to detect that it wasn't, it's not a real person. Um, and for things like, uh, when people are writing into Congress and stuff, you can have millions of generated text that could really sway what people think public opinion is um, and really add to this whole disinformation, misinformation problem that we have on the internet. So all this to say uh, that code is power. <laughs> and I know sometimes it feels like you don't have a lot of power with what you're doing, but if you're writing code, you have so much power, you're really affecting what's happening in the world. Um, and if Marvel has taught me anything, 
It's that with uh, great power comes great responsibility. And this has been a recurring theme in all the Marvel movies. And yeah, I just really like that cute kid. It's really fun. But I did catch um, a bit of the participatory approaches to machine learning workshop last Friday. And uh, Jamel Watson Daniel from uh, Data for Black Lives, she um, spoke on this power imbalances in machine learning. And I just love this slide so much that um, I just literally took it and stuck it here in my presentation. But as a technical community, as people who are building AI, you have control over what data is collected, what data is used for training, how much to reveal about training data sets, uh, choosing, mo choosing models to be applied to data, interpreting models and model outputs, assessment and verification of models, deployment of algorithms based on models. And beyond this, I think even just how much you decide to weight a specific variable, even what language you want to use or what frameworks you use, all of these choices have a real effect down the line. Um, and you have so much power. And um, yeah, this really spoke to me. And I think an argument we often hear with AI is like, oh, it's biased just because the data set is biased. But who chose that data set? Who decided what data was going to be collected? Someone was in control of that. And I think just ignoring that kind of power and blaming it on the data um, can be problematic. So I really like this move that we have towards looking at why, why this power is here. Yeah. All right, so this, um, this came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, Pratusha Kaluri from Stanford and the co-creator of the Radical AI Network um, showed this nature commentary piece that really spoke to me. Um, it says, many researchers think that AI is neutral and often beneficial, marred only by biased data from, drawn from an unfair society. In reality, an indifferent field serves the powerful. And yeah, that, that really resonated with me just because thinking of, um, we often just think of our technology as neutral, but by being neutral, it's amplifying the power dynamics that already exists in the world. So rather than just thinking of how neutral can I make my technology, I like this new framing of like, how can this technology really shift power to make society more neutral? And I just took a look at the chat. Everyone's freaking out about GPT-3. Um, don't worry, a lot of other people are gonna talk about this <laughs> later on in the session. So with this in mind about thinking about how AI can shift power, I think we can ask this question, like what can open source teach us about shifting power? So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about, um, yeah, about open source and how open source has shifted power in the past and maybe how we can apply those lessons to today. So um, this story, this was the story of Mozilla. It's one of my favorite open source stories. Um, it starts with the early days of the web with Mosaic and the Netscape Navigator. And this was at a time when people were discovering this new resource and it was really exciting and the web was cool and fun. And pretty quickly, uh, Microsoft wanted to get in on the action and they used Windows to turn IE into a monopoly. Um, and they reached almost 100% of uh, web browser usage there in the early 2000s. And this gave Microsoft a lot of power over the web. And there's a quote here from Mitchell Baker, uh, founder and CEO. The internet was gonna be a stack of Microsoft project, products from Windows to Internet Explorer, to Office, to servers, to file formats, to protocols. That's almost the entire stack. And it's really scary to think of what could have happened if Microsoft got to control all of that. And it was, yeah, it was hindering innovation and it was really limiting what others could build on this, on this whole system. So Netscape did something that was pretty radical at the time for a public company. Uh, they publicly released the source code behind their browser for anyone to use, copy, remix, or change. And they knew that they couldn't compete with the manpower or the tactics of Internet Explorer. So they really wanted to harness this global community to build something Netscape couldn't do on its own. And this action, actually, of releasing the source code um, inspired the term open source, which is really exciting and a nice piece of history of open source. So this action was actually a legal mechanism. So this is the first shifting power lesson we're going to have. So Mitchell Baker actually wrote MPL 1.0 in 1998, the Mozilla Public License, um, as that legal mechanism to let anyone use Remix and distribute the software. And in terms of shifting power, this protected the user rights and really unlocked the potential for them to shape and use this code. So this was the first step in really allowing others to, to shape what, what could, we could happen. 
so much chatter about GPT two and three still. Okay, so this once the code was out in the wild, people started to band together and really call themselves Mozilla. This, these were uh, designers, engineers, writers, community organizers that were excited to like take on Microsoft and let's take this open source code and build a better browser. And they were able to work together and really have that have that collective action. So here's the next lesson in shifting power. Um, they were really able to, yeah, gather the, the action of the community. And one of the ways they did that was through working open. And I love this definition from the Mozilla Wiki about how working open is both public and participatory. So this requires structuring efforts so that outsiders can meaningfully participate and become insiders as appropriate. And by structuring things like that, allowing others to come in and help, it allowed for co-creation, collective action, and something that Netscape couldn't have done on its own. They made something much better. So a few years later, you get Firefox, um, and Mozilla actually took out an ad from the New York Times. Um, and on the left-hand side, all those small words, those are the names of all the contributors that contributed to Firefox 1.0. And it really showed that at the heart, this was a grassroots community effort. And this was a huge hit. People loved it, it was fast. It really innovated on the internet. Um, internet Explorer had languished a little bit. And if we see here, like Firefox didn't put Microsoft out of business, um, but they really broke up that monopoly of the web. So this gave us the web we have today and allowed us to have those building blocks of the web as something public and something for all of us to build on. And it really ushered in this age of uh, web 2.0 with like Ajax and REST and all of that. And past that, we've seen so many other people do this. And I think that's because we have organizations like the Free Software Foundation, the Open Source Initiative, and even Creative Commons who are really vetting and uh, like standardizing these open licenses to make it really easy for anyone to start an open project. So 20, 25 years ago, if I wanted to start an open source project, I'd need a lawyer to help me write that license and figure it out. Um, but now it's basically just a drop down menu um, in a GitHub repo, and then suddenly I have an open source project. So in terms of shifting power, these reusable structures enabled everyone to, to have that power to start a new open project. So I hope you enjoyed that little story. And here are the three lessons I want to take from that, this legal mechanism, collective action, and the templates for reuse. And I wanna apply it to some of the things we're working on today. So in terms of shifting power in AI, I'm gonna talk about two things. One is our work around data stewardship, um, and then also about participatory ML. So data stewardship, I think it does do all three of these things, or we're working towards all three of these things. And um, you might wonder why we're talking about data when AI is, I guess maybe you're not, AI and data go together pretty easily. Um, but eight companies wield enormous power over the internet. It's really hard um, not to interact with any one of these companies. Most people interact with at least one. And it is a little bit opaque to know how they make their money. And a lot of them make money off of these free services. So really they're, they're getting their power um, from, from our data. And this has really led to, um, a lot of people have been calling surveillance capitalism and the, the ad economy, this idea that people are just using our data to gather, gather our data and using that as their power. So one of the ways we're thinking about shifting power in AI is what can we do around that data? Can we use a different data governance structure to really give some of that power back to the people? So here's an overview. There's a lot in here. I don't expect you to read it. Um, this is a pretty nascent area of research with uh, alternative data governance approaches. And there's a bunch of different ones that come up, data trust, data cooperatives, data commons, that all are slightly different from each other, um, but all are ab about shifting that power around data. And today I'm just gonna talk about one of them. I do wanna talk about data trusts. And you can see my very crude image I made here on the right, where a data trust is that legal mechanism that acts as an independent intermediary between the data subjects, those are the people creating the data, and the data collectors, the companies collecting that data. So the data trust is the one that holds that data and they act loyally to the members. So they act in service to the members and they negotiate with those companies according to the terms set by the trust. So the idea is like, instead of giving your data directly to Google or Facebook, you would give it to a trust and then the trust would negotiate with Google and Facebook 
to figure out like how much data that they give and what they do with that data. Um, and this way, you get that sort of collective bargaining power. If you have enough people buying into this as the data subjects, the data trust can has more power to act on your behalf. So on the left, I put little check marks. It is a legal mechanism like that license. It allows for that collective action. Right now, they don't, it is really difficult to set up a data trust. You definitely need a lawyer. But hopefully, I think this is something we're working towards. Um, and I, yeah, if you're working on this, please keep working towards this. Making, making templates for reuse or making structures for reuse so that it's much easier to set up a data trust elsewhere or use another data trust because right now it takes a while. So the example I have is the UK Biobank. Um, that's a charitable company with trustees that manages genetic data from half a million people. So these are um, patients that have donated their research, their data for research. And then the trustees of the UK Biobank negotiate with the researchers um, to give up that data. And they do this on behalf of the, the people who donated their data so that they trust that it's safe. And then the last piece I wanna talk about is about participatory ML. Just cause I think this is having a big moment today and it's something I think all of you who are writing any AI can, can use to shift power inside your own work. And we already talked a little bit about the, about the definition of working open, but I do think working open is a great way to shift power in your own work. So just as a reminder, uh, working open is both public and participatory. This requires structuring efforts so that outsiders can meaningfully participate and become insiders as appropriate. And you have the power to invite those traditionally excluded from shaping tech to become insiders um, in your work. And by doing that, working open can really shift power. I will say if you're only collaborating with or inviting people who already have power, this, isn't, this doesn't actually work as shifting power. But what we are seeing is that not a lot of marginalized groups are actually helping create the AI that's affecting their lives. So are there ways you can invite people who may be affected by your work downstream or listen to them? Um, or are there ways that you can invite experts who've been studying the effects or the interactions between society and technology? So people from like social sciences or race and gender studies. And inviting these other groups to help, I think we'll be building better technology. And I know I'm low on time, so I won't go through all these, but if you're looking for like practical ways you can invite others in, um, one way is you can give people whatever you're making. You can also listen to them and you can collaborate with them. So just think about like, who can you be listening to as you're building your work? Um, or who can you invite to collaborate with that maybe isn't like you already? So I do work at Mozilla. Um, our mission is to ensure the internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. And 20 years ago, um, that was about the monopoly we saw with Microsoft and just needing to break up what was happening there in the web. And today, like looking at those big eight companies, I think it is about building trustworthy AI and building new data governance structures um, and ways for people to, to really have power. So I do work um, on the Mozilla Festival. So it is scheduled for March, 2021 in both Amsterdam and virtual. So if you're at all interested in this idea, um, we do a lot of work here. It's very hands-on. And we're also launching different ways to, for you to work with us on this mission. Um, I know this is a big mission around building trust with the AI. So if you wanna collaborate with us, please reach out. Um, next week, I'll be announcing a few ways you can get involved with working groups and such, um, but I don't have anything just yet. So reach out. And then finally, we did publish um, this white paper around building trust with the AI. It is uh, just version 0.9 of the white paper. It's not our final version yet, but we did wanna make sure we were writing this with the community. And I know a lot of people in this room are actively building trust with the AI. So hearing from you and what you're doing and how you want to collaborate with us would be great. So please, uh, please check out that white paper. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And just final thank yous. A lot of people helped with this and I stole slides from and images from. And with that, thank you. I'm a little bit over time. But um, I will now emote. Clapping? No, I'm clapping for myself. Wait, I All should right. emote differently. Joy. <laughs> Joy makes more sense. <laughs> All right, thanks for the awesome talk, Abby. There's a whole bunch of questions for you in the YouTube, and I'm going to ask you a couple. Ooh. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Let me just go to my YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... First 
question. Um, what's a developer able to do when open sourcing a tool that could be used for harmful purposes, like possibly GPT-3? Um, is it still ethical to release it even if it's built with good intentions? Yeah, and I think that's tricky, and I do appreciate how OpenAI has approached this by releasing different parts of it at a time and really regulating um, what's happening at the end. I think part of it is we don't have a lot of regulations um, on what we're building. Open AI, open, yeah, AI is just a little bit of a wild west. So I, I'd say it's a little safer to, to release things slowly. Um, but do I, I'm glad you're considering some of the downstream effects and the potential harms that may happen. Um, that's really important. Cool. Yeah. So mm, could you expand on the differences between participatory machine learning and user-centered design practices? Oh, um, I feel like both of those terms have a deep history I'm not super okay. familiar with, but I know participatory machine learning has been, there was that workshop on Friday and it's, it's been a lot more about inviting, inviting more of the marginalized communities into your work or inviting, yeah, making machine learning just more accessible to more people. Um, that way it's like machine learning for the people built by the people, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, a question from Emma Humphreys. So oh, hi, Emma. She's asking, what is the advantage of using a data trust to negotiate with capital instead of working to end capital as it's a racist and colonial system? Oh, that is a really good question, Emma. I think it's easier to negotiate with them first. Um, it's like an easier step to take than ending them. And uh, I, I don't know. I have never thought of this question, Emma. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the steps we take with doing trustworthy AI is, is working with what we have and taking the next best step. And it might not be, yeah, it might not be the best end goal. I don't know. If other people have thoughts on this, please chime in in the chat. I think that's a super interesting question. And yeah, I think just part of our strategy is given the structures we have, where can we be giving power away? Okay, and another yeah. one. Um... What are some good methods for contextualizing an AI project for those who are affected so they can give relevant insights from June? Yeah, and I think that's, I'm so glad you're asking that question because I see people, I've been seeing these like working groups asking for feedback from civil society, but then you look at what they're asked for feedback on and it's so technical. I think this is where it, it makes a lot of sense to bring in like good designers or good like science communicators who can take the research you're doing or take some of the high level concepts you have and make it understandable um, to the people that it will affect. I think that's an important step that doesn't always happen. Um, so it might mean collaborating with, yeah, designers. I'll do, I forget where my bow is. <laughs> Here we are. Apologetic. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, I realize my mic has been off for that. Um, well, thank you, Abby, for your great talk. Um, next up is Alexandra. Um, and I am just going to share. All right, and let me, before you start, let me just fix this. All right, I think we're just about ready. I'm gonna change the camera. 
All right. <laughs> okay, so next up is Alexandra DeLucia um, talking about decoding strategies for interactive narrative generation. It's a really cool talk um, about a system that can create stories. Okay, um, I'm just going to turn your mic on and mine off, and you can begin. Okay, um, so hi, I'm Alexandra. Uh, today I'll be presenting Decoding Strategies for Interactive Narrative Generation. Um, this work was done in collaboration with Aaron Mueller, Lisa Lee, and Zhao Sadok from Johns Hopkins University. Um, I wanted to start off with a quick introduction. I'm a PhD student under Mark Dredzi in the Center for Language and Speech Processing at Hopkins. My primary research is uh, doing civil unrest detection and forecasting event um, with Twitter data. And my secondary newfound research is messing with chatbots. So to make sure we're on the same page, I just want to define interactive narrative generation. So this is similar to response generation where a user provides a prompt and expects a relevant response. However, with narrative generation, the response is long and should contain um, some kind of a plot. Our motivation for this work is because neural response generation and narrative generation are so similar, we aim to bridge the gap between them. Specifically, we wish to explore the effect of common decoding strategies from neural response generation um, on narrative generation. Okay, now for some background, I will briefly discuss um, decoding for text generation, um, the concept of diverse decoding, and then briefly mention um, a few relevant narrative generation models. So decoding is the language model and portion for text generation. Um, the decoding step determines how the next token in a sequence is selected. There are search-based and sampling-based decoding methods, but for this work, um, we're only gonna focus on sampling methods. There are a few common ones, um, such as top K sampling, where you only use, out of all possible tokens, you um, resample from only the top K. Um, and then there's nucleus sampling, also known as top P, where it's a similar idea. Um, you resample from a smaller distribution, but only using the tokens that make up the top P um, of the cumulative distribution. And then there's random sampling, uh, which can be thought of as special case of top K and nucleus sampling, where you sample from the entire distribution, uh, where in this case, it would be as if K were equal to the number of tokens and P um, equal to one for nucleus sampling. And another special case, uh, greedy sampling, also known as argmax, where it would be equal to um, K equals one or P equals zero, where you only take the, the top token and you don't look at any other options. So there is a common issue in neural response generation um, that the model often returns a generic or boring response. This is dubbed the I don't know problem after one of the common phrases. Uh, this issue is due to generic responses having a high probability in the language model um, because they are common in the data set and many are acceptable responses in many situations. Um, the examples below are sure, I'm sorry, great, and nothing. Um, these can easily fit in many prompts, but they are not interesting and we want our bots to be much more interesting. There are many options to combat this I don't know problem, but for this work, we focus only on one solution. Um, Lee E.L. Um, came up with a decoding objective function to discourage these high probability generic responses. This is called the MMI anti-LM or anti-language model objective. And it works by decreasing the bias of the language model and encourages choosing tokens that are more specific to the context. Um, this, the effect of this objective is controlled by um, this weight parameter, lambda. 
Uh, so now to discuss a few other narrative generation models. Um, the ones most relevant to ours is the fusion model um, developed by a group at a Facebook and a fine-tuned GPT-2 model from a group at Stanford. The fusion model is an ensemble of two seek-to-seek -seek models that were trained on a set of creative writing prompts and responses from the subreddit r slash writing prompts. In that work, they used top K decoding with K equals 40. The fine-tuned GPT-2 model from Stanford um, followed the fusion model in that they fine-tuned on the same data. And instead of only using formed a top K parameter sweep, so in our work, um, we also fine tune a GPT-2 model on writing prompts, but we perform a nucleus sampling parameter sweep and add in a diverse um, decoding objective parameter sweep. In our full work, we also add in other axes of analysis like model size, um, but for this presentation, we will focus only on one model, um, GPT-2 medium, and only the parameter sweep for nucleus sampling and diverse decoding. Um, so to answer our research questions, we will fine tune GPT-2 for narrative generation, perform a decoder parameter sweep for nucleus sampling and diverse decoding, and then evaluate our model with respect to diversity and quality. To fine tune GPT-2 for narrative generation, we use the same writing prompts data set um, used to train the other narrative models. Um, writing prompts is a collection of prompts and responses from the creative writing subreddit community. Uh, as input, we use the standard start and end tokens and two new special tokens to identify the prompt and response. Um, these are WP and response tokens, respectively. So the writing props data set has a, contains a variety of um, response links. Um, so we create three different size data sets, but for this presentation, I will only discuss results from the medium length data set, which consists of all the prompts, but the responses are all truncated to the second line break. These different uh, least size data sets were used for other axes of um, experimentation that I would not be discussing today. For the decoding parameter sweep, we use a discrete set of p values for nuclear sampling and lambda values for the MMI anti LM diverse decoding. For p equals zero, um, that's p equals zero and p equals one are included for completeness since p equals zero is equivalent to um, greedy search and p equals one is equivalent to full random sampling. And as for the lambda values, uh, we include lambda equals zero, but that just represents that we are not using diverse decoding. Looking at previous work, uh, we expect p-values around 0.9 to perform the best and expect the model to become more degenerate as lambda increases since it will be paying less and less attention to its own language model. So the goal is to measure the effect of decoding parameters on narrative diversity. According to Tevit and Barant, there are two types of diversity diversity of content um, or what to say and diversity of form or how to say it. They found that Scentbert is best to measure content diversity and a distinct N is best to measure form diversity. Um, So as everyone in the field knows, automatic evaluation can only do so much. Um, humans are not obsolete yet. Um, since we are generating stories, we want our stories to be interesting, uh, fun to read, uh, fluent, uh, it's a story written in grammatical English, coherent, do all the sentences form an understandable plot, and relevant. Uh, it does this 
generated story actually follow the prompt. Um, fortunately, our human evals are still in progress on Mechanical Turk. So any qualitative observations that I make um, in this presentation are just from me and my co-authors. So I just wanted to start right off by showing some examples. Uh, as Avi had mentioned before, uh, GPT-3 is a thing. Um, this is using GPT-2 medium. Uh, and GPT-2 is still pretty good, not on this slide right here, because these are the um, lower p-values. But for this example, we can see that greedy search um, is obviously very degenerate. It's very repetitive. And for p equals 0.3, um, it's still repetitive, um, a little better. Um, some of these examples are going to be long, so I'm not going to spend too much time on each slide. Um, don't worry about rushing through reading them. I These slides will be posted where you can read through them at your leisure. Um, but that greedy search one, just imagine that, just say it in like Navi's voice in your head, and then it, it becomes a lot better or worse, depending on your, your opinion <laughs> of how no, annoying Navi is. Um, and then as we move up to uh, increase our nucleus sampling parameter, it gets more, it gets better. So these are good. Um, they seem to be pretty fluent. They're like kind of interesting. Okay. Um, for P equals 0.9, this one where it starts getting a little wild um, for some reason, like the purge is in here. <laughs> Um, kind of interesting. There's more action going on. And finally, for P equals one, um, also very interesting. We got heart implants, lots of pain. Um, our model seems to be a little on the dark side. <laughs> um, but yeah, and there are a lot more examples elsewhere that I will discuss how to access them later. So this was just for the nucleus sampling sweep. Um, those were examples with some of my uh, qualitative comments. For the automatic evaluation, uh, where we said uh, distinct N measures the form diversity and Sentvert would be used to measure the content diversity. We see that as um, our P value increases, um, that diversity um, increases for both form and content according to these automatic evals. But while we were reading the um, responses, we also see that this does not completely capture what was fully going on. So even though P equals um, point, um, P equals one is more diverse according to the automatic evaluation, um, P equals 0.9 was also very good. And uh, P equals 0.7 was also good. So it seems that these automatic evaluation for diversity can only be used as a guideline to maybe pick out the ones that are obviously very bad or degenerate, such as greedy. Um, but other than that, we're still going to need to mostly depend on human evaluation. So that was for the nucleus sampling parameter sweep. Uh, now for the diversity coding sweep, um, we held our nucleus sampling decoding at uh, P equals 0.9, uh, because after looking at other examples, uh, we agreed that we like that one the best. Um, this one's, uh, these ones are all a little short. Um, so again, Lambda equals zero is equivalent to not using any diversity coding. And then lambda equals 0.2 is using um, a little bit of diverse decoding, but you're still paying attention to your language model. And lambda 0.8 is you're ignoring a lot of your language model, but that made it very interesting. <laughs> um, it seemed that GPT-2 has a powerful enough language model that it could take a hit um, for ignoring it that much. Um, and get some really interesting 
things like leaving babies inside of black vacuum boxes. Um, so definitely interesting things coming out of GPT-2 with this diverse decoding. Uh, this is just some automatic evaluations of the diverse decoding sweep with regards to different p-values for nucleus sampling. As we can see, uh, so distinct n, again, was to measure form diversity. Uh, this increases as um, p-value for nucleus sampling increases. And according to the automatic evals, um, once you raise lambda over about 0.2, there doesn't seem to be that much of a gain um, until you get to 0.8, and then it starts going downhill, which could be due to a sign of um, degeneracy. So in summary, uh, we fine tune GPT-2 medium for narrative generation uh, with prompts and responses from the subreddit r slash writing prompts. We performed a parameter sweep for nucleus sampling and diverse decoding to experiment um, with new neural response generation methods um, applied to narrative generation methods. And we evaluated the diversity of the output with distinct N and Sentbert. And for our findings, we found that um, nucleus sampling p-values between 0.7 and 0.9 appeared the best, um, with the lower values tending to go towards degeneracy. Um, this might change as we roll our, out our full human eval survey on Mechanical Turk. And also we found that uh, the diverse decoding hyperparameter lambda is directly correlated with response diversity according to the plots, um, the automatic evaluations, which is cool. And there is definitely a trade-off between diversity and coherence, which is due to the paying less attention to the language model as you increase the diversity. Um, so I just want to say thank you for your time. And I would like to plug um, our bot. Um, we turned it into a Reddit bot and had to create our own uh, subreddit for it because our slash writing prompts does not like it when you post automatically generated content on their subreddit. Um, I got banned the hard, <laughs> in the hard way. Um, so there is a bot narrative generation community on Reddit. I look it up, uh, just r slash story gen AI. And our bot is uh, storybot AI and it goes through every day and post responses to the top 10 writing prompts from our slash writing prompts. And uh, we're still trying to come up with ideas on what to do with our data set of generated stories that just keeps growing and growing every day. Um, but yeah, so that's it. I guess I can take some questions now. Cool. That was an awesome talk, Alexandra. Really good job. So I have a question. Hold on. Let me just take the slideshow down so we could have a conversation. Um, oh, that's so weird because that's not me. Um, so I'm wondering, like, you have a great way to generate these stories, but the stories might not, not be that coherent and the plot might not really flow all the way through. And I'm wondering if you think that you could combine this approach with approaches from the computational models of narrative community where people are writing things that can um, evaluate like how coherent a plot is or um, like what the motifs in a story are, or something that like can analyze like the types of events in a story. So I'm wondering if you think that this kind of approach can be um, made even more coherent or more interesting or more human by using approaches on of narrative understanding. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. I, I mean, I'd have, have to say probably the first thing to do is, I don't know, just start through GPT-3, right? I think if you put in something, it'll just output the next Game of Thrones or whatever. But um, for, yeah, using borrowing methods from 
that community um, would definitely be um, very helpful and very cool. Um, the only, the immediate thing I was thinking of was a um, paper that was at um, ACL a couple of weeks ago, where instead of generating um, word by word, um, they were using a model that was, had an extra model that ranked um, possible, next possible uh, sentences. So it would be really interesting to use something like this to create um, maybe 50 tokens at a time to create a couple different um, possible continuations and then have an external model that's trained for um, coherence that ranks those responses. And then it just kind of feeds back through that. Um, that was an interesting um, paper out of ACL, but you know, definitely borrowing from <laughs> more standard community of like um, motifs and everything would definitely be a good approach too. Sorry. And um, I'm even thinking maybe on the training end for like the stories that you're training, um, the mod, like the language model with, you could even feed in some information about the narratives that you're training. Like these are the motifs that are in the stories. This is like which tokens like represent which aspects of narrative. I think that could also help too. So like not just okay, on, yeah. <laughs> not just on the um, checking at, at like like verifying whether GPT like is producing coherent stuff, but also um, like on the like on the like a, kind of as like a pre-processing or feature generation side for the learning, so that the things that you're learning on are also more structured. Like you know that this sentence represents this aspect of narrative, like this is a climax, and this sentence is a denouncement, and this sentence has this kind of relationship to some other part of narrative. I think that's something that I would do, maybe. Yeah, yeah no, that definitely sounds, sounds really cool. cool. Um, we'll we'll talk, talk to you about, about that after. <laughs> cool. Um, let me go to YouTube. There's no questions on YouTube right now. Um, I want to see if there's any questions in our Zoom room. Does Daya or Josh or... Abby, do you do either of you have a question? Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. So sorry if you already went over this during your presentation, but so you mentioned that you were measuring or representing both the form and the content diversity. Uh, so yeah. how was it that you were being able to extract those from text? I'm just curious. Like I know there's like neural style transfer uh, in computer vision, but I'm not too familiar with all the literature for NLP. Um, yeah, so this was just from some work by um, Tevit and Brandt. This is um, footnote one on the current slide that's up, where they, all they did in their work was they were looking for all the common evaluation metrics that are already used for um, text generation evaluation on like quality and diversity, and they were just seeing which ones actually correlated with um, diversity. So they compared different methods, um, different metrics to human evaluations. Um, so in this case, uh, diversity of content, um, they're mostly just picking up on more um, semantic uh, meaning, where they're using a sentence vert to create a representation of a narrative and they see how different it is from another narrative just by using cosine distance. So that's what um, this automatic evaluation of diversity of content is. And then for diversity of form, this is um, the distinct N metric, which is a token count based method for um, unigram. Usually it's just uh, unigrams and biograms. And all this does is check and see if your model is just using the same words over and over again. Um, yeah, so this is very much just like an automatically, yeah, automatic based um, evaluation. Cool, thanks. That was, it was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Awesome. Hold on. Awesome. So thank you for your talk. I'm just going to do a clap. <laughs> Yeah, great job. 
Okay, let's go on to the next talk. I'm going to be playing the avatar for this talk. Um, so the next talk is by Josh Seltzer. So if you could put your... Um, oops. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, just let me know when your uh, video is, when your um, presentation is on screen share, and then I'll introduce you. Actually, I'm going to, you're going to give your talk sitting down, because I have bad controller drift right now. <laughs> All right, and it's on. Let me just, oh, no. Oh, yeah. sorry, I just realized I was muted. Ah, uh, yeah, so the screen should be strong. Okay, um, let me just change the size. For some reason, the sizing got messed up overnight. All right. Okay, so the next talk is going to be by um, Josh Seltzer uh, from Next Intelligence um, and a whole team of researchers, too, um, who contributed to this project. Let me just try to move this a little so I could get more of you. All right, that's good. Enough for now. Um, and the talk is on asking the right questions, generating semantically and syntactically appropriate questions for deeper understanding. All right, Josh, we're ready whenever you are. Cool. Thanks for the intro. And also thanks, Josh, for other Josh, not me, uh, for putting this whole workshop together. Uh, all the talks so far have been super cool. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest. So yeah, this is, I'm presenting on asking the right questions. And uh, I'm I was helped by my colleagues Amit, Fiona, and Kathy. And uh, as Josh said, we work at Next Intelligence, which is in Toronto, Canada. And uh, I noticed there's been a lot of Canadian representation in the workshop so far, which is awesome. So uh, just to give a little bit of motivation for what we're trying to do, uh, I chose a couple of quotes from some famous authors. So one of them is Ursula K. Le Guin. And she said, words are events. They do things, change things. They transform both speaker and hearer. They feed energy back and forth and amplify it. They feed understanding or emotion back and forth and amplify it. And then one from Patricia Romney, and I quite like this one. She says, the raising of questions, what I've called elsewhere the spirit of wonder, is a sine qua non of dialogue. Living in the questions is a good place to begin. And so the general idea is that we want to create apps and worlds which actually excite people and which respects their voice and tries to understand them and engage them. Uh, so there's been a lot of hype about sort of NLP and conversational AI for the last few years. Um, but a lot of it has been very limited and we really want to try to push the limit and try to sort of move into the direction of bona fide conversational AI where we're actually engaging people. And I think there's loads of cool applications for this, even in the current context. Like I think it'd be super cool if on Animal Crossing you were able to not just have like pre-programmed conversations with, with, your neighbor, with uh, the animal neighbors, but to actually speak your mind and then hear what they have to think and for them to ask you questions and engage with you. And sort of more importantly, we don't just want to automate human interactions for cost efficiency. So that's kind of a cheap shot at all the customer service chatbots. But the idea is that we want to actually engage and delight people and enter into a mutual dialogue. So <clears throat> there's all sorts of related work. Uh, I just chose a few key papers, which I think were quite interesting. So this is a master's thesis from a student in the Netherlands called Follow-Up Question Generation. So I'm sure you can see why this would be relevant. And uh, this paper was focusing on two components or several components uh, belonging to semantic. So they used uh, semantic role labeling and then also to synta syntactic components, namely named entity recognition and parts of speech. And so the idea is that they get an input sentence there's a bit of pre-processing, some tokenization, lemmatization, et cetera. And then in the deconstruction phase, the input sentence is broken down into sort of its constituent elements. And so in this example here, it's mostly consisting of parts of speech, named entities. So that could be like brands or locations or, or uh, people, for example, like uh, proper nouns. 
uh, and then on the other side into components of semantic roles. Then once you have those elements deconstructed, the reconstruction stage takes a question template and applies those different elements that con constituted the input sentence and then tries to restructure them into a question template by sort of just drag and dropping them in almost uh, into, into a bunch of templates that the author pre-specified. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then there's another paper called Fluent Response Generation for Conversational Question Answering. And this one introduces the idea or the architecture of syntactic transformers. And these are quite cool as well. So this, these are based on BERT. And uh, the idea here is to be able to, based on linguistic properties, to actually be able to restructure related sentences and sort of, so in, the, in their context, they're doing it in the context of, in the domain of question answering, which is uh, quite popular. So you can see in their example, the question is, what year did the Netherlands rise up against Philip II? And a typical question answering model might give the answer, the Netherlands rose up against Philip II in 1568. Using their syntactic transformers, they're able to sort of collapse that initial response into something that just feels a little bit more natural, a little bit more human. So for example, they replace the Netherlands into they because they know they, they can use that pronoun. So they've mapped on that pronoun. And then they also uh, remove the against Philip II because that's sort of just implied. So that's an optional removal. So this is, I think, a very powerful technique for uh, once you've already generated a sentence, which whether it's an answer which answers the question that was posed or a question applied to the to a previous response, this is one technique for sort of making things feel more natural. Uh, and then one more related piece of work. So this is called deep learning based response generation using emotion feature extraction. And so this one is isn't necessarily related to questions. It's more uh, general, so it's just for responses. Um, but I think the idea of using emotional feature extractions is very important. Going back to that quotation at the beginning, we, we don't just want to answer, or uh, sorry, we don't just want to ask questions in a way that's like semantically relevant uh, or syntactically relevant. We also want to try to amplify the emotion to try and understand the emotion that people are putting in. So, you know, if, if someone is very confused, we want to be able to understand that and try to alleviate that confusion. If someone's very excited, we want to empathize with them, etc. cetera. Uh, so the work that we're doing is going to be very similar to the follow-up question generation that I mentioned before, but we're trying to add a few more components to that, such as trying to track people's emotion and also the complexity of the responses and that sort of thing. So uh, this is a work in progress that our team has been working on. And for now, the tentative name is just the smart probe model. Pretty boring. And as you can see, this there's four, sort of four pillars. So similar to the previous paper, we're using named entity recognition. And those again, those could be brands, those could be companies, those could be people, geographic locations, et cetera. Then we're also using an emotion model. So this uh, is a model trained on top of Deepmoji, which uh, is a very fun model from MIT, which was trained on tons of tons, tons and tons of uh, tweets to in an unsupervised manner to associate uh, words and, and semantic meaning with emojis that were in the same tweet. Uh, and then on top of that, also syntactic structure. And so this we're doing in a number of ways. And then finally, on top of that complexity, right now we've just been experimenting with very, very simple proxies for complexity, like the amount of words, for example. But I think this is uh, one particular area where we want to improve things so that we can possibly use that as a proxy for trying to understand whether a question was adequately addressed. So we, using this model, we did a pilot study on MDIRC. So we recruited 318 Canadians and Americans to talk with our chatbot called Inca, which you can see on the right side. And this is actually a screenshot right from the pilot study. So the, this is an example of one of the, the people that completed their survey. And so you can see it asks a question about like what brands and companies uh, have done a really good job helping their customers during COVID-19. And they mentioned Sunwing. And then our probing model picks up and, and asks them if this changed their overall impression of Sunwing. Then, so what we did is sort of an A-B testing 
approach. So we compared our smart probe model with a generic probe model. The generic probe model is what Alexander uh, was sort of referring to like as the I don't know problem. So this, this is just like a very basic control uh, comparison where it's giving very bad stock phrases like, oh, can you give me more details or something like that? The idea being, hopefully we can improve upon that. Uh, and then we wanted to have our crowdsourced respondents actually rate the quality of our follow-up questions. So uh, here we're reusing a metric called the sensibility and specificity average, which uh, I think is in the next slide. And basically after each follow-up question, we just ask the respondent, did that question make sense to you? And then if so, was it specific to your response? So these are our, our initial results. So over here, if you can see my mouse, we have the generic probe model, which again is just, it's always choosing from like a sample of, of I think five different stock phrases, such as, can you give me more details? Oh, I think I understand. Can you maybe share a little bit more, et cetera. And you'll see even for this one, the sensibleness for the generic probe is only around like 80%. Uh, which is quite surprising because you think for something as vague as, oh, can you tell me more? Everyone would just say, yeah, that, that makes sense. It fits the context because it's pretty hard to think of uh, a sentence where you would respond with, oh, can you tell me more? And that wouldn't fit. So this might just be sort of an upper bound or a result of people randomly clicking yes or no. Uh, then the specificity is sort of more important or more relevant for us. So we're trying to create questions which are actually specific to what the respondent was talking about. And then the SSA is what I mentioned before. That's just the sensibility and sensitivity average. It's simply you add up the two and you divide by two. Uh, and so you can see comparing the generic probe model with our smart probe model, the, yeah, uh, the sensibleness is actually a little bit lower, not too much. And then the specificity is a little bit higher. And likewise, the SSA score is a little bit higher. So the, the main problem, uh, again, going back to what Alexandra was calling the I don't know problem, is that 38% of the responses that we were processing were basically too complicated for us to figure out how to respond. So that's that's a pretty high number. So that's what we're working on reducing. Uh, if, if you get rid of those, if, if you ignore those results, something like, and take the subset of uh, responses which the model actually did understand, and then just look at those, then you'll see that's this like super smart probe model. Then you'll see that the SSA score is around 10% higher than the generic probe, which is not bad. Obviously there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, my favorite part of any of this is always looking at the failure cases. Uh, so this, this one I think was my favorite. So someone asked, or uh, sorry, the, uh, the bot asked, may I ask why you found talking to me better than other surveys? And the respondent replied, to be honest, this is the first time talking to you, but I felt you were very intelligent with conversational aspects. So it was lots of praise. And then our probing response to that was, could you explain why you think you were very intelligent? So here's an example of where applying the idea from the syntactic transformer probably would have helped us figure out this pronoun swapping, because of course, what we should have said is, could you explain why you think I was very intelligent? Uh, and then another one, so this just sort of goes to show that uh, all of our models and data were trained pre-pandemic. So it, our named entity recognition can actually pick up on Corona as, uh, as, an, as an entity, but nonetheless, our bot still looks pretty stupid because pretty much everyone in the world should know what Corona is right now, and we shouldn't need to ask people what it is. So yeah, there's a number of limitations, and we're quite excited about the next steps. So the number one thing is just increased coverage of the input sentences. So yeah, as I mentioned, I think it was 38% were tagged as basically, I don't know. So we're looking into increasing our coverage so that we're able to capture a lot more. Then going back to that example with the pronoun swapping, which didn't happen, that, that would be a case where we can apply those concepts from the syntactic transformation and do other sort of grammatical correction. In addition, we're playing around with different ways of expressing emotion. So right now we have some very simplistic ways, but we're playing around with a few, whether it's through natural language or something maybe a little bit more uh, subtle but fun, like a, like a Slack style reaction. 
Uh, and then something possibly incorporating a knowledge base, which could have perhaps provided the AI with a little bit more information, a little bit of knowledge about what COVID or Corona is. And then aside from that, there's lots of other improvements. So there's lots of work on multi-turn dialogue, few shot learning, and then also the problem of just detecting really good answers. Because if we ask someone an initial question and they give us a fantastic answer, we, it very well might be the case that that's perfectly good and we just want to move on. So it's actually quite challenging to detect when an answer is adequate or which when it sufficiently addresses the question. There is a lot of work on measuring like question answering and question answer pairs, but it's usually in the context of factual statements. So building a model that can do that at the level of opinions is a lot more difficult. And just because I think it's necessary, <laughs> Uh, one bonus slide. So obviously everyone, there's a lot of hype about the generative pre-trained language models. Um, so on the left here, you see dialogue GPT and on the right side is GPT-3. And so I, I went into the GPT-3 playground and decided to throw that response that we got before, which our AI didn't deal very well with. And the response that GPT-3 came up with is quite fantastic. So of course, one of the big problems with these generative pre-trained models uh, is that, in a sense, they're almost too good. So they're going to be able to come up with, a, they're going to be able to generate a lot of language, and it could be, it, it could take things into a new direction. And so one of the biggest problems is trying to figure out how to actually constrain it. So uh, I know the OpenAI team right now is working on some sort of tox toxicity filter. Uh, so I'm very excited to see where that goes. But we're looking into ongoing research into trying to use these generative models, but constrain them so that they don't say anything either inappropriate or take things into a completely different topic that we don't want to, that we're not interested in probing on. Cool. So thank you for listening. And thank you uh, again, Josh and all the presenters. And if anyone has any non-generic questions, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome talk, Josh. Um, let me just... Uh, deal with the slideshow. Okay. Um, oh, that's weird. Yeah, you're me. So let's pan to the audience. We've got a couple more people in this frame, and they're all clapping. Great. Okay, so <laughs> I have a question. So I, I'm not sure if in the final version of this you ended up using... Did you end up using like the semantic role labeler in the final pipeline? No, so uh, we haven't incorporated that one. So I actually just recently found out about that thesis paper um, in the last few days, actually. So that, that's something that we're going to be looking into incorporating. Cool. So I, like, kind of like a step even further than semantic role labels is maybe even using a semantic role labeler that can parse into frame net. Like I know of a couple, like one of them is called a path LSTM, which is one that I use. And it... It gives SRL parses, but it also can parse into FrameNet, which like has like about twelve hundred different frames for like the different types of um, predicates. So you could have like certain ones for eating and certain ones for sleeping. So I'm wondering if you think that would be useful, or do you think that is too structured and too granular for um, your approach? Uh, yeah. So first, I think that is an excellent suggestion. Then, sort of the ongoing conflict or challenge is to try to figure out to what extent sort of over specifying things and building things into a specific structure is going to give us language and, and appropriate uh, questions which actually are sort of respecting what people say and, and engaging with them. On the other hand, of course, uh, if we don't do that, then it might just turn out that what we're saying is irrelevant. So yeah, that, that's an ongoing question, but I think uh, your suggestion is probably very good, and uh, that's, that's something I'll definitely look into. Yeah, like, it would be a cool experiment even to, like, like a bit more general than FrameNet is VerbNet, where you only have, like, 300 different classes for verbs or events. So it might, it would be a cool experiment to use, like, parses into verb classes and then parses into frames and seeing how the system performs and if it's just keeps getting better the more specific it is or maybe like 
I don't know. It's possible that maybe Verbna doesn't help at all either. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good suggestion as well. I think. Yeah, then then it becomes also an issue of um, if we are sort of pre-specifying certain templates for each of these different classes of verbs, then a lot of the time, depending on the context in which that verb is being used, it may or may not uh, be relevant and or problematic to say to the user. But yeah, the, the verb not uh, was something that we are actively exploring. Awesome. Well, thank you for your talk, Josh. It was really interesting. It's cool hearing other people working on dialogue problems. Um, so thanks for that talk. So next up is uh, Dea, who's already at the podium. This is his avatar, or me playing him. Um, Dea, can you share your screen and your presentation? Yeah, uh, I actually just have a question, if I may. Uh, oh, yeah, go for it. Um, so uh, I just want to go back to uh, the motion theory or motion model that you've used, Josh. Um, so theories and, and models on that are a bit fuzzy, and there are a few uh, proposals there. I'm, I'm wondering if you know uh, that what, whether the model that you used uh, followed a two-dimensional or two-dimensional emotional model, uh, or uh, for example, Polchek's Wheel of Emotions. I know you mentioned that there were like nine emotions uh, detected or that it detects nine emotions. Um, so I'm wondering if you have an answer for that. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I know I think we're already over, so I'll try and be quick. But uh, yeah, so I can't remember if it was Polchek, but we looked into a number of different frameworks for emotions and we found a number of them to be quite limited. So I know uh, one of them was specifically designed for facial emotions and then a lot of the, the papers in the NLP-based emotion literature were sort of just extending that framework. Uh, and, and we figured out that didn't really work for us because yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ways of expressing emotions through language that aren't necessarily expressed the same way or expressed whatsoever with facial. Uh, so the the model that we ended up coming with or currently experimenting with. Uh, it's sort of an amalgam of a few different frameworks and it's really just what we found worked for us in the most situations. Um, I'm very open to looking at, uh, looking at other frameworks and data sets. Uh, I know that there, yeah, there's also a limited amount of public data sets that have sort of well annotated emotional labels. Joshua, thanks. Great talk. Thanks. Well, thank you. Oops. Daya, it's your turn now. Okay, let me just get your slideshow ready, Daya. So Daya is actually an old friend of mine. He we worked on our PhDs together at the Cognac Lab at Florida International University. Daya actually just defended his PhD. Uh, a couple weeks ago, so everybody congratulate Dea because he's now Dr. Bonnie Soccer. So good job, Dea. You're joining <laughs> the club. You're a doctor now. Um, we're very impressed with you and excited to hear your talk now. So um, uh, without further ado, let's. Hold on, let me try to get you more in the frame. All right, let's, you could start whenever you're ready, Daya. All right, uh, well, thanks, Josh, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you for organizing this workshop. It's been quite informative, and uh, a lot of talks uh, have been quite interesting. Um, I enjoyed listening to it and looking forward for the rest of the talks this evening. <clears throat> OK, so uh, as Josh said, my name is uh, Daya Benesacker. Um, I come to you from uh, the sunny Miami or I guess I should call it rainy Miami now. Um, and so today I'll be uh, presenting uh, our work that we've uh, published uh, recently at the uh, Narrative Understanding and Storylines um, and Event Extraction uh, Workshop uh, that was associated with uh, ACL uh, just a couple weeks back. Um, this work is published in that workshop and uh, there is a, uh, a stream of that as well if you've registered to ACL so you can view the slides uh, there as well. Um, and so this work um, was done with uh, in collaboration with a few of my colleagues at the Cognac Laboratory, Victor Yarlett, 
um, and Mohamed El Dosri, and uh, my advisor, my advisors, uh, Neftali Riche and Mark Tomlayson uh, at FIU. And uh, in this, I'll be uh, discussing uh, how we've uh, developed a, an automatic model for the identification of uh, discourse functions of uh, news uh, article paragraphs. And so I'll first start with, oops, I'll first start with, uh, you know, the most simplest uh, uh, definition for discourse, which is a coherent structure uh, of sentences uh, listed in a document or in a dialogue. And uh, a discourse structure is a key aspect of all forms of text. Um, this is uh, most obvious, we'll see it in academic and legal and technical texts, uh, where you see uh, certain paragraphs belonging to specific sections, uh, like in news articles, that's introduction or results, uh, sorry, in scientific articles um, or legal ones, it would be the same thing. Uh, news articles, however, have a similarly helpful, though implicit, design uh, where events are often not presented in a chronological order, uh, but rather structured uh, by importance. Uh, and so there are multiple theories on uh, discussing how a discourse uh, structure of uh, news articles uh, are presented. Um, and here we've relied on Ben Dyke's uh, theory for uh, news uh, articles discourse structure, and I'll discuss that in the next slide uh, in more detail. Um, and so in that, it lists that certain paragraphs convey main events or background events or uh, consequ uh, consequences or previous events and uh, things of that nature. And so identifying uh, this at the paragraph level, identifying what paragraphs convey and how they function in a certain uh, news article is quite important for uh, a multitude of things. I'll mention a few of them here. Uh, for example, in information extraction, uh, we can do uh, things like extracting the main event of a news article or knowing what sort of relation types occur in certain parts. And so this can help in that. Um, in uh, timeline construction, uh, we can use, uh, for example, extracting or knowing a certain paragraph discusses previous events. Uh, we can construct a more accurate partial chronology of uh, the events or uh, the news articles that are being discussed. And then this ties into a story understanding where we can have, uh, in general, better, better understanding of what the key events are, who the actors are, how they're all interlinked, uh, and therefore tie back to better timeline construction and even better summarization um, if we know what key information we need to look at. And so the goal of this project uh, or of this uh, uh, work was to predict discourse function labels uh, for at the paragraph level of news articles and to evaluate uh, sets of features and uh, different automatic learning methods and techniques um, and uh, tasks uh, that we could tackle this with. And so, I, I mentioned Van Dyke's theory for uh, the discourse structure of news. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a tree-like structure um, that starts with, you know, at the head, the news report, um, where each report is starts with a summary. That's the headline, the uh, title of the article, and then typically is followed with a lead uh, paragraph. That's a summary of uh, the entire article. It's a couple of sentences that starts with that start that the authors start with uh, the news article with um, that kind of summarizes everything that's going on. Uh, then it goes into the story where it discusses the current episode um, that's in, that's entailing the main events and the consequences of these uh, events that are happening. And it discusses uh, background information that's including circumstances and previous events and even history uh, that's in the far distant uh, uh, past. Uh, the difference between circumstances and previous events, uh, these can be a bit fuzzy, but previous events uh, are temporally more recent and more defined, whereas in circumstances could be uh, just general circumstances that span a longer period of time um, where many events are happening within and don't really have a uh, clear uh, beginning and ending, uh, uh, temporally speaking, of these events. And uh, then the news article follows by 
uh, comments, or this can even happen before I'm presenting it in a sequential manner, but it really isn't. All these could be jumbled around um, in various orders. And so uh, then uh, the authors discuss comments, uh, verbal reactions, uh, and those are explicitly solicited from external sources. Um, and, and typically news articles would include uh, mostly towards the end, but cannot happen anywhere, expectations and evaluations. And these are specific, uh, specifically coming from the author's perspective or the news agency's perspective. And so these are uh, kind of um, understandings or uh, suggestions or opinions uh, conveyed uh, by the authors or the news agency. And in our work, we've focused on the most granular level here on the leaf nodes uh, and, and identifying these uh, paragraphs uh, of where they belong into which, la which label or which um, uh, function or what function they serve here. And we've ignored the uh, hierarchical um, levels that are um, faded in this, in this uh, tree-like structure. And so for our corpus, we used a uh, 50, uh, 50 ACE uh, phase two articles uh, that contained uh, 10 NYT articles, 20 Washington Post articles, and 10 AP uh, articles. Uh, these uh, were selected as to uh, keep uh, document length uh, uniform and kind of respected the original um, uh, distribution in the ACE phase two uh, corpus. Um, these were doubly annotated. Uh, actually, Josh and I uh, were annotators on this uh, quite back uh, because this uh, corpus and uh, a pilot study was actually conducted a couple years back in 2018 by my co-author, Victor Yarlett. Um, and uh, we've had the uh, 0.75 Cohen's Kappa. Uh, that's the inter-annotator agreement, which represents a substantial agreement for, uh, for us human annotators. And so uh, here are the stats on the uh, corpus. Uh, we've had about 28,000 words in these 50 documents, uh, totaling 644 paragraphs, uh, about 564 words, and uh, 13 paragraphs per uh, average per, uh, per article. And again, these were collected to keep document length uh, uniform in this uh, selected corpus. So here's an example annotation. Um, you don't have to read um, the, the text here, but I just wanted to uh, give you a, an overview of how the annotation went. Here we have a headline um, that's typically like included in a news article. And then this is the lead where the news article is being summarized, uh, talking about the events uh, that are happening in Aragon. And uh, then there's a verbal reaction. This is explicitly solicited from an external source uh, that's supporting the core argument or the core main event. And eventually here we have a main event and all, all this could include many other uh, paragraphs that serve other functions. And so the goal here is to automatically label these paragraphs with those, uh, uh, with those uh, leaf nodes that we've discussed before or these discourse functions. And so for our label prediction task, uh, here the, the hypothesis here was that uh, paragraphs and uh, labels and the discourse function of them is quite interdependent in a sequential manner. Uh, so you don't introduce, uh, you, you typically there's a kind of an order, even though everything can be jumbled around depending on the author and depending on the article and the main event. There's a general order of how things go. So you've kind of uh, talked about, um, where did I lose you? Did I lose you here in, in the annotation or? Right, so, okay. So uh, for our label prediction task, uh, we kind of had a hypothesis um, here that uh, every paragraph and uh, label and uh, discourse function that, that is served by these paragraphs is quite interdependent in a sequential manner. Um, and so uh, you don't discuss uh, certain, like I was saying before, uh, when I was cutting off, is you don't discuss, uh, for example, your opinions and evaluations and as an author until you've discussed main events and previous events and how they're interconnected. You don't discuss previous events typically until you've kind of laid out a certain understanding of what the main events are 
And again, um, you kind of need a summary at the beginning to get your uh, reader, uh, to give your reader a general understanding of what you're about to present. And so for this, um, the hypothesis was to uh, use uh, or treat this task as a sequence labeling task rather than a general classification or an argumentative zoning task, which has been used before um, on other uh, domains. And so for this, I've used uh, conditional random fields, uh, which kind of capture that sequential interdependency uh, between all these uh, paragraphs and their labels. And here we have the st stats on uh, the, the head or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, leaf nodes that we've discussed or the uh, Van Dyke's uh, labels uh, for discourse functions. Uh, we had 50 headlines and we've, uh, because we had 50 uh, documents and we focused on nine labels from the Van Dyke uh, theory, um, just ex excluding the headline because it exists in every article. Uh, the corpus was um, skewed towards verbal reactions and circumstances just because of the nature of how news articles typically are written. Um, and they include a lot of reporting, they include a lot of uh, verbal reactions, meaning uh, they wanna support their argument and they talk a lot about circumstances uh, compared to everything else that's happening. And so for our data split here, it's a supervised fashion. We used a five-fold uh, cross-validation that's 80% for training where we had 40 articles for training and 10, 10 articles in each fold. And for our experiments, we've compared the CRF against a few baselines that I'll discuss later. Um, and we've conducted a few uh, feature group experiments because we wanted to see what uh, features affect certain labels and how uh, what feature groups are most beneficial to this task. And so in our feature extraction, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Victor Yarlett, my co-author uh, at Cognac, had started this effort with a pilot study back in 2018 that was published um, and uh, developed a, an automatic model as well uh, that used the support vector machine uh, with a few uh, features, of, a small set of features to demonstrate that this is uh, indeed feasible. And these features were a bag of words, um, and then some topical features that included TF-IDF and word embeddings for uh, each of the paragraphs, and then use the previous paragraphs label. And that was a good intuition at the beginning saying that each paragraph kind of depends on the previous one, but this didn't treat the whole uh, sequence um, in, uh, quite well in the, in the classification process. And so that's what the CRF, we were hoping that the CRF would do, and indeed it did, we'll see that in the results. Um, so we've used all these features in our model, um, but discarded the previous paragraphs uh, label uh, feature because that's just uh, inherent within the CRF structure, uh, which it captures the previous uh, paragraphs label and, and much more, which is the whole sequence from start to finish. And so we've added uh, a few other features here. We've used positional features like the sizes of paragraphs, that's the number of sentences, and paragraph positions uh, relative to the head. We've also included bigrams and uh, part of speech tags uh, as count vectors like nouns, verbs, and adjectives and adverbs uh, as well to that. And then the last group of features that we've used uh, fall, fell into semantic uh, uh, features. And here we had four of them. Um, so the first one was reported speech uh, where we've uh, tackled paragraphs that included quotations or um, uh, verbs like said, uh, and we've used the text AC library for that. And we've attributed that to the verbal reactions uh, uh, label. And then uh, we've also used the majority event tense where we've extracted for each paragraph what the majority uh, tense of all the events that were extracted that was used uh, using CAVO. So this gives us a, an idea of whether a paragraph is discussing past events like history or previous events versus current ones like the main events. Um, and for that, we've used uh, part of speech tags using kind of a, depend a dependency tree uh, per paragraph. And then we've also included uh, kind of a cool idea where uh, we've looked at sub-event relations and sub-events are um, events that are included within other events or follow other events. And we've used that as a count vector uh, my co-author El Dosari, Mohamed El Dosari from Cognac, has developed a system that was published in, uh, in the paper 
um, in ACL uh, 2019, I believe, um, where uh, the system was able to successfully extract uh, sub-events uh, through paragraphs. And so we uh, captured that. So for example, all the, uh, all the paragraphs that discuss the main events would kind of be more interlinked uh, with certain uh, events as they unfold uh, throughout the news article. And then uh, we've also used uh, named entity recognition as count vectors where we've captured 13 named entity types, including person, location, uh, date, and time. And that was the uh, semantic feature group. And so onto our results, this is a lot. So I'm gonna walk you through it um, just briefly here. Um, the first group here is uh, the baselines uh, uh, where we've used a most frequent class and a support vector machine that used a bag of words uh, as features. And uh, these performed the worst. Uh, we've also used a uh, hierarchical hidden Markov model using bigrams as features. This was a, a model that uh, I've uh, developed for clinical uh, documents uh, and published back in 2018. Uh, in the Louis workshop in conjunction with UNLP, and that was to detect uh, sections within psychiatric reports. Um, and so this is analogous to uh, paragraphs and paragraph functions. And uh, this performed kind of worse because uh, just the sheer amount of data that we had was just 50 documents, and it wasn't much for a hierarchical Markov model uh, using only bigrams. And then this previous work that was demonstrated by Victor Yarlett in 2018, uh, where he's used a decision tree, a random decision forest, and a support vector machine, which he reported to uh, perform the best using the features that I've discussed before, the, the small set of features that uh, we've again included in our model. And this group here is our current CRF model, um, including all the feature uh, extraction. Uh, can everyone hear me? I'm getting kind of warning from Zoom. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, here we have uh, this last group is the CRF. Um, so here, I'm gonna remove this notification. Um, we've used the, the same features from the SVM that was developed by Yarlet just to test how well the CRF does um, in, in capturing the interdependencies uh, of, all these, uh, of all these paragraphs and labels. Um, and in this case, uh, it did perform uh, much better just using those features, giving us, telling us that the hypothesis was, it was indeed uh, correct and that that interdependency exists within news articles. This last group here is the uh, semantic group, uh, which kind of uh, gave the best performance to this model on top of the CRF. Uh, the sub-event relation feature contributed a lot to the main events. Uh, the majority event tense uh, contributed quite a bit to uh, previous previous events and uh, or previous events and uh, history events, uh, and then uh, reported speech contributed the most to uh, verbal reactions, and then adding named entity recognition just bumped the model uh, by a little. And so uh, these are the results. I'll go through them briefly for each of the labels. Uh, the circumstances and the verbal reactions performed the best, and that was expected because of their uh, high prevalence in the uh, corpus that we've used. Uh, and then history and expectations had saw the lowest performance just again because of the low prevalence in, uh, in the corpus. Uh, even though all these uh, four uh, categories here, or all these uh, four labels, uh, saw a much higher improvement using the CRF um, over the SVM just because evaluations, for example, comes almost always at the end, uh, understanding uh, that it depends on all the previous labels and consequences, depends on uh, main events and such. Uh, and then finally here, lead, uh, uh, the lead label has saw the best performance just because it always exists, almost always in the same position and almost always uh, starts the uh, news article. Finally, I'll discuss briefly just some future work. Uh, future work. Uh, so first, we can um, definitely increase the corpus size, and we can definitely uh, use uh, more sophisticated methods. But the point here is that we can treat this as a sequence labeling task. So maybe we can use LSTMs. Uh, and then the next thing we could do is uh, discourse structure understanding in multilingual corpora or other languages like Arabic, where uh, the discourse theories can be a bit different. 
Um, and then cross-matching those uh, theories between uh, these languages can be quite interesting uh, to find uh, across these uh, languages. And finally, we could do our uh, unsupervised extraction of this discourse structure where we could match uh, certain paragraphs across documents uh, to see whether they have the same type of language, giving us a hint that they serve the same purpose. Finally, I'm concluding with some, some summary or contributions of what we've done. Uh, we've developed a system uh, that improves the, over the previous SVM model by 31.5% uh, for uh, paragraph discourse function identification. Um, we should, uh, we've identified that we should uh, treat this task as a sequence labeling task, uh, and that's a better problem formulation um, for capturing interdependencies between paragraphs and labels. Uh, we've demonstrated the feature extraction necessary for this. Um, mainly semantics and event extraction can be quite helpful uh, for such tasks. And then we've evaluated various baselines and kind of uh, compared all that uh, in detail. Uh, and that's all on the paper as well. And thank you all for uh, listening to my talk. And that concludes it. Great job, Dea. Great talk. Um, let me turn your slide off. So I'm, let's have a discussion about this while I change back into my avatar for my talk. So my question, oh, let's pan to the audience and see uh, Abby and Alexandra clapping. Oh, yeah, that's great. All right. And look at everybody. Look at the poster of Marina right there. All right. Okay, I'm going to go change. But Dea, stay on the line. So I'm wondering... Have you ever tried running this on not Newswire? Like I know it's trained on Newswire and I know that these things are specifically about Newswire text, but I'm wondering what would happen if you gave it like a page of a novel, like a, a roughly the same length of um, a Newswire article that you trained on, like what would happen? Um, that's a really good question, Josh. I haven't tried it on, um novels per se, but uh, this was also demonstrated, demonstrated this over a bit more structured uh, documents, uh, specifically medical reports, so discharge summaries and uh, psychiatric labels and uh, radiology reports. And then uh, we've also looked at legal texts um, like patents and um, then scientific articles as well. Um, and it was able to, uh, again, see that the interdependency uh, between all these labels, in this case, it's, in it's sections. Um, and uh, it, it did perform quite well and gave that same intuition and uh, same verification for the same hypothesis. Um, but I, yeah, I do wonder how it would treat a uh, novel or freeform uh, narrative that's that may not be structured as such. And that's, that could be quite interesting work. Cool. So does anybody else who's in the Zoom room have any questions that they want to ask? Before I check YouTube, I'm almost done changing. I accidentally undid the change after I finished. Um, no, just, just thought that was super interesting, Dea, and uh, congrats again on the PhD. Yay. Thanks, Abby. Yes, congrats. <laughs> all right, now I'm back to myself. And all of you can check out my spa. <laughs> this is my spa room. I have some nice fake Japanese art from the museum that I stole. And I don't know what this is, but it's really cool. <laughs> I don't know why she's floating. All right, I'm going to go back downstairs. Okay, I'm just gonna mute the Zoom call and give my talk. All right.
So I'm just trying to position myself and then I'll introduce the call. Ugh. All right. Um, okay, so next up is me, uh, Josh Eisenberg. I'm the lead scientist at Artie. Oh, I'm just going to set a timer so I don't go over time. Um, and this is work that I presented a couple weeks ago at the Narrative Understanding Storylines and Events Workshop. Uh, a lot of my research focuses on getting computers to understand stories. Uh, people use stories to communicate, so I'm very interested in teaching computers how to understand stories. Uh, people, we use stories every day. Like you've probably heard more than, I don't know, 20 stories over the course of this workshop so far, and we all know when the story begins and where the story ends, and we know what the events are and the plot is. Um, but computers have a hard time doing that. Like, they have a hard time doing anything that they're not explicitly taught how to do. Um, so, it's one of my goals to teach computers to understand stories. And one of the key parts of stories is our events. Like, a pretty basic definition of a story is um, a series of events that occur over time um, with characters enacting those events. And then there's all this structural scaffolding with details um, which make the story actually interesting to listen to. Um, and stories make you think about stories from the past that you've heard um, and stories from your own life. So it's kind of like a ubiquitous thing for humans, but for computers it's kind of hard to even understand the basic building blocks of stories, like what is an event, and what is plot, and what is narrative, and when does a story get interrupted. So uh, the work today is focused on um, actually extracting events from stories. So uh, what is an event? It's a thing that happens in the world, or it's also, or it could even be um, like kind of like a state of being, like feeling sad or happy or how something is. Um, so the goal is to teach the computer to look at text and extract um, events, but we're not. I'm not um, interested in just any text. Like I'm working at this company called Artie. We're a startup in Los Angeles. And we deal with um, dialogue. Like we make virtual characters that you could talk to on your phone. Um, and you can have conversations with them just as you would have a conversation with a friend. So with speech. Um, so I'm interested in training the computer to understand events and dialogue. So when I went looking through the literature, I was looking for event corpora. Most event corpora are newswire. There's time bank, mean time, and Kegel has a corpus. There's a bunch of social media corpora, but those are different than uh, Newswire. Like social media is like Twitter, and that's very different than dialogue. Um, and then there's a lot of event work on scientific literature, but that's people typically don't speak that way even at these types of conferences. So I decided I had to make my own corpus. Um, just to further hit the point home that dialogue is different than other types of discourse, Let's compare dialogue to um, Newswire. So um, back during my PhD, I built a program that can detect the point of view and the digesis of um, a piece of text. So point of view is how the narrator refers to themselves do they or their self. Do they do it in first person by using first person pronouns or third person by using third person pronouns or second person, which is much more rare, at least in the corpora I was looking at. Um, and digesis is how the narrator um, refers, how the narrator is related to the events in the story that they're telling. So a homodigetic narrator is a narrator who's telling a story about themselves. Like, I went to the mall, um, and it was closed because of corona. So it's something that I'm doing. Um, whereas a heterodigetic narrative is a narrative that's happening to someone else. Like, you're reporting things about other people. And this is more typical of Newswire. So um, I'm comparing the corpus that I made, which I'll talk about shortly, to uh, the Reuters Newswire corpus, which is kind of a 
very old, ubiquitous corpus for NLP research. Um, so first-person narrators showed up less than 1% of the time in the Reuters corpus, and less than 1% of them were homodigetic also. Whereas in the corpus that I created, um, over 50% of the narrators or the people speaking utterances are first person and over 30% of them are um, homodigetic. So I would like to argue that the corpus, the personal events and dialogue corpus, contains more personal events and more personalized stories because they're people who are speaking about themselves and about stories that happen to them. So this is, I did this kind of experiment to show how different Newswire is from dialogue. Like it's something that's obvious to us, but I wanted to make it quantitative. Um, so these are just the sources for the point of view and digestus extractors. And crazy thing, um, I was able to get a pattern off the features for the point of view extractor. So just to let you guys all know, if you come up with a really cool uh, machine learning algorithm, um, or a really cool application of machine learning, you could try to patent the features. And that's what I did here. So now to the data set, the personal events and dialogue corpus. So um, it's a data set which contains 14 episodes of This American Life. Um, this American Life is a podcast run by NPR, I think comes out of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ. Um, and it's just stories about everyday life and also crazy life in America. Um, so it's 14, it's, it's, it's excerpts from 14 episodes and only the conversations within the episodes because within the episodes there's even narration which is its own type of discourse but I was only interested when people were just talking to each other. So I combed through the episodes, um, the transcripts are all online and free. And I actually got permission from This American Life to open source this data with a CCBY2 license. So um, it's available on my website and also on Artie's website. So I'll post the link to that later. So a couple of episodes, um, things that they have episodes that deal with race, episodes that deal with um, like feminism and deal with uh, misogyny, an episode that deals with love. Um, a episode that deals with reality, an episode that deals with uh, the Confederate flag, um, and an episode about dogs, because we all love dogs. Um, so this avail the data set's available here. It's open sourced. Um, it's these 14 episodes that have been annotated for events. Um, it's kind of like a binary classification task, where each token is either labeled as an event or not an event. Um, I could have used the time ML annotation scheme, but it would have taken a very long time to train up the annotators, myself and Michael, who's my co-author, who actually also went to FIU and was working with me on my PhD annotation too. Um, but we decided to make our own annotation scheme so we could get this done quickly and move on. So here's the actual episodes, the number of utterances, tokens, um, the number of events versus non-events. So non-events, I think outnumbered events about four to one. So the event is the minority class here. It's the more interesting thing. It's the thing that we're sifting through here. Um, and this chart shows the inner annotator agreements. So we did really well, you know, it was 83% on the Cohen's Kappa. Anything over 80 is considered, usually considered almost perfect. Um, so here's just like an excerpt of an episode of The Revolution Starts at Noon. Um, let's zoom in. So on the top, the thing that Ira Glass says, that is narration. So we threw that out and we only annotated the things that looked like dialogue. Um, and yeah, so let's now talk about, like if you're interested in what an event is and isn't, like I'll talk about that for like about a minute or less. But I wanna get more to how I taught the computer how to classify that. But events, so, there's some obvious events, you know, like things that happen in the world. Like if I said, I went running, like the running is an event. Or um, I feel sad, like the sadness is an event. And also the feeling is also an event too. Like those are more states of being types of events. So there's like the obvious events that are things that actually happen. And then there's the events that represent states of being. 
Um, and we decided to only annotate states of beings for animate objects. So for people or for animals, um, not states of being for like inanimate objects. Like if I said there's lots of mountains on the, tr or there's lots of uh, rocks on the mountain, like the rocks and the mountain are both inanimate. So we wouldn't annotate those kinds of events. But if you want more information on that, check out the annotation guide and the link that I already gave. And there gives a lot more logic. And if you just look at the annotations, you'll figure out what we decided were and weren't events. So we use a number of features. We're basically just trying to get the computer to look at each word in an utterance and decide whether or not it was a uh, event or not. So simple binary classification. I use the support vector machine. Um, going forward, I'll probably use something that um, takes to context better. But this just shows you it's a kind of simple problem, the fact that we were able to get so far only using support vector machines. So the first type of feature is verb classes. So VerbNet has verb classes. VerbNet is an ontology of verbs. There's about 200 and uh, I think 78 different verb classes. So one of the verb classes, um, I'll just show you an example of the different verbs in it, like slurp, chomp, and crunch. They're all part of the chew verb class. So they're all things that involve eating. Like they have a very similar semantic meaning, you know, like the meaning's not that different. Um, between these three verbs, even though they have different lexical forms, but the meaning is basically the same. And verb, VerbNet and the verb classes within VerbNet encapsulates this pretty well. So um, one of the features that we train on is um, what verb class um, a word belongs to or not. So that's 278 features right there. Um, part of speech tags, so which one of, I think, the 22 or 24, um, pen tree bank, part of speech tags, based off of uh, Stanford Core NLP, um, and also named entity tags from Stanford Core NLP. I thought named entity tags would kind of be a good anti-feature because things that are named entities typically aren't events. And the reason for choosing part of speech tags is um, verbs typically are events. Um, also, if you're interested to see what how I extracted the verb classes, see the paper, but basically I used um, it makes sense, uh, word sense disambiguation, and went from word net senses into verb net classes. Um, and semantic role labeler features, which didn't work as well as I thought they would. Um, semantic role labeler can extract uh, the verb and the arguments of the verb. So Homerate the donut, the eating is the action, Homer's the agent, the donut's the patient. I thought of knowing which words were arguments and predicates. It would help, but honestly it didn't. Um, I might try using like a more specific parser, like parsing into FrameNet next time. Uh, some machine learning protocols. I experimented with undersampling because uh, there were four times as many non-events as there were events. I didn't want the classifier to overlearn um, the non-events. So I uh, reduced the number of uh, non-events that were shown to the classifier in learning. Remember, also we use 14-fold uh, cross-validation, so we would uh, remove one episode, use it for testing, and then train on the 13 other episodes. I simulated context by just showing um, the uh, support vector machine, the feature vector for the previous word, the current word that we're classifying, and the next word, and we use support vector machines. Here's the results. There's a lot of numbers. You could check it out in the paper, but I just want to key into zoom into the best results. The F measure was about 68%, so with respect to the event class and 88% with respect to the non-events. And the features that it used were part of speech tags, verb classes, and undersampling and trigrams, which is the context. Um, so really cool is if you look at the two experiments above that, the one where it only uses undersampling or only uses trigrams, the magnitude of precision and recall flips. So this is really cool because if you're dealing with an application where false net, you want to minimize false negatives or minimize false positives, you can do that by either using only undersampling or only trigrams. So it really depends on your application. But this is a really cool thing, distribution, and I saw this in many of the different um, uh, sectors of results. Okay, and to finish up the contributions, 
we open source this data set, you know, it's awesome when people open source their data, like I want the community to use this and to um, train up better classifiers than mine that are able to understand dialogue better than mine because I only got it to like 68 or 69 percent F measure, but I know someone else can do better. Like I could probably do better if I had more time on it, but I'm giving you the data, so I want you to help me out. Um, and I produce a classifier that works pretty well with part of speech tags and verb classes. Um, and that is basically it. Um, let's see if there's any questions in YouTube. Um. Okay, there's no questions on YouTube. Does anybody in Zoom wanna does anybody in Zoom wanna ask a question? Or is anybody even in Zoom? Yeah, you guys are still here. Cool. Do you guys wanna ask a question? Uh just one quick question. Have you considered testing? Okay, there's no questions on YouTube. Does oh. anybody in Zoom Hold on, wanna, sorry. Does anybody want to ask a question? Or is anybody even in Hold Zoom? On. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. I think you had your YouTube on. Um, do you want to ask your question again, Josh? Sorry about that, everybody. Technical difficulties. Um, does anybody, Josh, can you ask your question now? Or type it? All right, so no questions, I guess. Um, if you have questions, Send them to me on Twitter or email them to me. Um, now we're going to head to the next session, which is um, the next uh, Coffee Break, Coffee Break 2. We're about to play a bunch of video art, so stay tuned for that. And also go visit your Coffee Break Islands. I know AI and Ethics is about to pop off again, and there's another one. And I don't remember what they are. Sorry. But um, I will see you all in an hour for the third session for Computer Vision. All right.
容，请对我可见的笑容那个笑容是在渴求我的。Hey everybody! This is Tuti Pies. Chair. Always wanted this. Hi, this is my first video, and I'm going to be talking about my life as me, and you'll enjoy my video content. I bet you're wondering how can we trust this chair? We're not so sure about her being a chair, and. YouTube videos. Take a look of fellow gamers, fellow bros in the bro verse. I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself, okay? I'm actually a gamer, but I'm a, I'm a gamer chair. I never played, always wanted to. I watched Felix do it a million. I feel like I know all the secret moves, but I just never actually, but I've always wanted to. And I'm very excited. Excited into being a gamer. A little bit about my origin story because I think it might be relevant, and I think you all might be very interested. Felix told me a couple of years ago, and my jaw just dropped. I couldn't believe it. Such an astounding origin story. Okay, so Felix was a young lad in Sweden. He was frolicking through. The fields, and he, I was, and we just became best friends. So we would walk together, bring grass to eat, and he would ride on my back, and I was 
so he was small, but he could so he could balance really really well, and he would eat snacks. And I always and it was new us. They'd be like, "Oh, if you like Monica, they're just walking around the local Swedish towns." And so much. This is kind of going from the story that Felix told me. So we gotta kind of go from there, okay? So we were just traipsing around the city, and everybody knew us, and it was wonderful. And this is kind of a sad part.
只是很直接，静止声，痛直接。Hey everybody, this is Cutie Pie's chair. I've always wanted to say that. Hi, this is my first video and I'm going to be talking about my life as Cutie Pie's chair. I hope that you'll have me and you'll enjoy my video content. I bet you're wondering, how can we trust this chair? Well, we knew her before when she was Cutie Pie's chair, but we're not so sure about her being a chair. And and making um, YouTube videos. Take a lot of fellow gamers, fellow nine-year-olds, fellow bros in the bro verse. I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself. Okay, I'm a gamer girl. I'm not actually a gamer, but I'm a I'm a gamer chair. I've never played a game before, but I've always wanted to. I've watched Felix do it a million times, and I feel like I know all the secret moves, but I've just never actually. But I've always wanted to. And I'm very excited about my journey into being a gamer. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my origin story because I think it might be relevant, and I think you all might be very interested in this. Felix told me a couple of years ago, and my jaw just dropped. I couldn't believe it. Such an astounding origin story. Okay, so picture this: Felix was a young lad in Sweden. He was frolicking. Through the fields, and he met me. I was a cow named Monica, and we just became best friends. So we would walk together, and he would bring me some nice grass to eat, and he would ride on my back. And I was so large, but、um, and he was small, but he could so he could balance really really well. And he would eat snacks, and I would eat some flowers, and it was. Wonderful, and everybody knew us. They were like, "Oh, Felix and Monica, they're just walking around the local Swedish towns." And well, I don't actually know much about Sweden, but this is kind of going from the story that Felix told me. So we gotta kind of go from there, okay? So we were just traipsing around the city, and everybody knew us, and it was wonderful. And, and this is kind of a sad part. I don't really like telling it. I'm gonna put my headphones on while I tell it. Okay. I don't tell it quickly too. Monica got sick. She was really, really, really sick, and Felix only had a couple days left with her. And they did everything that they loved to do. They had ice cream together, and they walked around the field together, and it was just so lovely. And eventually, she passed away. Felix was so upset that 
he didn't know what to do, and the local tanner him, you like to perform a memo, and of course I would like to do that. So they made the most wonderful chair out of me. There's a me in the world, and my disable. At least that's what Felix has told me. I am very grateful to be here. Thank you, Monica, for giving me my body and my skin, and I will treasure your memory forever. Hey, Monica, hey, I have one Monica, secret, hey, and I'm going to share it with you. Hey, Monica, hey, I've never been. Monica, hey, I know. I've never been. Felix has been gone, obviously. He was gone for an entire month. Sometimes he leaves every couple of days because he takes breaks now. That's kind of what kind of made me want to get into making videos. Now's my chance. The first thing I'm going to do, tell me if this is a good idea or not, I don't know. I'm going to look up, this is what many people look up on the internet. I've, I've actually like heard about this before. And they go on, I don't know if it's bad to say, they go on Google and they look up hot girls on the internet. And I heard that that will show me very wonderful things and I'm very excited to explore and to be a pioneer in this brave new world, you know? If you will join me along, we are going to go onto the internet together and learn some very lovely things together. Okay, are you ready for this? Can we get a bro fist just because I'm nervous to go onto the internet for the first time and I need the support? Okay, here we go. I have my lucky device, and I'm pretty sure this is how you access the internet. We're going to plug it into a computer and get started, okay? We're in, I'm pretty sure. Here we go. I thought we can Google hot monster girls. I heard that that's what is very cool on the internet right now. Monster. Okay, there's a lot, lot of variety over here, okay? There's a lot to look at. There's this one girl that she's like this, and it appears that part of her body is like a little bug, like a little scary bug with many, many legs. So I imagine maybe she's this big. But she has the body of a of a of a human, I think. Um, I have the body of a human, sort of. So I can relate a little bit. There's so many different categories. I don't really know which one to pick. We can click um, ghost. That's one category. They are very beautiful. Look at their little swishy tails. Wow. I wish that the tanner had made me with a tail, but I'm very grateful for how I am, okay? Cows are probably the most beautiful, in my opinion. Probably because my genetics or something like that. I think they're very, very beautiful. It says here that we can find out what kind of monster girl is right for us. So I think I want to do the quiz. Do you want to do it with me? How strong is your beliefs? Ooh. I didn't think this was going to be such a deep quiz, but um, here we go. Let's just jump into it. One, I don't believe in anything other than survival. Two, I have some beliefs, but I don't follow them. I have beliefs. I try to follow them, but if I break them, oh well. My beliefs are very strong, and if I break them, I must repent. Difficult, I'll follow them. Oh well. How fit are you muscle-wise? How do you dress overall? Well, I guess I would wear this every day. I haven't really changed my outfit, but maybe we can check out some different styles in this. One of the options says, I don't care about colors, I just like shorts and comfortable stuff. That makes them sound very chill and cute. I kind of like that one. I think I'm going to choose that one. Just so you know, I'm very chill too, okay? What would 
would you call yourself if you had to be typed into one of these groups? Goth, emo losers, jocks, athletic group, or athletic person. Could be cool to be athletic. I could just be like, pass me that football, please. Bad kids or adults who break the law. I don't think I'm ready to break the law yet, so I'm going to pass on that, but maybe we can come back to that one later, okay? Geek or nerd with friends? I want friends. If that makes me have friends, then I'll choose that one. I'll be a nerd or a geek. That sounds good. Also, I'm in a gamer chair, so maybe nerd works. For that, how many friends would you say you have? Felix, Marcia, Brad, Sive, Edgar, Maya, M Monica, and Monica. Monica is also my friend. Okay, seven. Seven's a great number. Where would you want to be in a war? This is a very spicy question. Okay, let's give it our best, shall we? Frontline. Don't just say this because it sounds heroic. That's the exact reason why I was going to say it. Do you think that they have psi? Like, do you think that they're psychic? Being a spy. Again, don't just say this because it sounds cool. I did think it sounds sounded cool, but now I don't know what to choose. A sniper. Please don't make me repeat myself. Well, I heard you. You know, you don't want me to pick something that sounds cool, but I think that sniper would be best for me because I'm seated and I could probably snipe people from far distances. That's the one I choose. Okay, wish me luck. I really, 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 really want a cowgirl. I think I will get though. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for being there for me. Here we go. I don't understand why I'm not a cowgirl, but we're going to keep moving on. I've been thinking that we should Google PewDiePie's chair. What do you think? I just think this is the next step we have to take, right? We just gotta find more about me. PewDiePie's chair. Okay. Okay, I come up right away. That's that's pretty exciting. Sale still in stock. What does still in stock mean? When a physical or online store has an item in stock, it has that item in the store or in a warehouse available for purchase now. Do you think there's like a someone's making an imitation of me or something like that? I don't understand how how I could be in stock because there's only one of me. 39 reviews? I might have to buy one for the office. Oh, I can imagine me um maybe in some very formal settings. I think that'd be very cute if um, maybe people had a wedding and then um, I was a chair at the wedding or something like that. I do like the idea of me um, being in different places, but I don't like the idea of me being replicated. I need to go to other places. The way that the chair leans all the way back takes so much strain right back, 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 back to get back to gaming with the boys. This title of the review is just yes. Lots of people are sitting in these clones of mine. I'm 6'1", just shy of 200 pounds. I've never sat in a chair that felt like this was for my size of a person. Thanks for the great chair, folks. I like how the chair... This is good for lots of different kinds of people. It's really nice. Incredible job, 10 out of 10. But can you do this? It's a great chair. 
Good, nice leather. Wow. Holy three nine nine. What a great price. I can't read anymore. I'm done. I'm I'm pretty confident that um I'm not the only PewDiePie chair in the world. I'm I can gather that now. What this means to me, I'm not quite sure. Please give me this time to relax and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Goddamn chair has more respect and clout than you have. For me to step down and just let my chair take over.
Hey everyone, uh, it's Josh. We're having audio and video difficulties, so I'm going to reset my computer and reset OBS. Um, and we're actually going to stream the, the part two of the video art series after um, the last session of the workshop, so at 10 p.m. Um, we're very sorry. It just My computer is not cooperating with me on any level today. It's not a happy computer right now, so I don't know why it's so sad, but I'm sad that the video art is choppy and I don't want to show it so bad. So we're going to um, try to make my computer happy again, and then we're going to show the video art later when it is going to show better. Um, I'm going to restart the stream, but uh, it should hopefully be the same link. So we will see you back in a little bit, and the next session actually begins at uh, around 6 p.m. So we'll see you here in about 20 minutes. And um, yeah, sorry about that, guys. But see you back here, same place, uh, in about 20 minutes. I should be back on the stream very soon. Thanks, guys.
Thank you.
Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. We're at session three, computer vision. Um, this is Josh Eisenberg, the host and creator of Asai. Um, welcome back. Um, so about the last screening, apparently, or not apparently, the art was, uh, the video quality of the stream wasn't very good, so we decided to cut it off and restart the computer and reconnect the stream. And it seems like things are better, so thanks for uh, dealing with all that stuff. Um, and thanks for sticking back. Uh, we appreciate it if you could like retweet that we're back online and that we're airing and session three is about to start. Um, so, and uh, about this art from session two, we're gonna rebroadcast it tonight at 10 p.m. after the last session. We know it's kind of late, but you can watch it tomorrow if you're asleep. Um, Sorry to the artist that the art wasn't playing the right way. My computer is just not happy today. Um, I don't know. I don't know why it doesn't like me, but I must have said something to my computer, and it's choosing not to treat me very well. But other than that, uh, things are going great. I'm glad that everybody's watching and everybody's here. So let's get started with the first talk in computer vision. Um, so Nathan, you want to come up and I'll introduce you? Yeah, let me, let me come on up right now. This is so cute. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. Um, let me know when your screen is shared. Oh, it's saying uh, the host disabled attendee screen sharing. All right. All right, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Awesome. Hold on, let me just uh, refactor that. Hold on, let me just turn that element off real quick. All right, I'm just resizing. Okay. And can you two hear my audio okay? Is the audio problem completely ironed out? Yeah, I think the audio has been ironed out. Now we're just dealing with video issues. Okay. <laughs> um, well, okay. we'll see. All right, so the next talk is by uh, Nathan, and this is really cool work because he's actually, um, he did this work just, for this and it's work that's actually like about Animal Crossing. So I was super excited when I saw the proposal, his abstract, and um, I'm super excited for him to give the talk. He has some really awesome stuff to show us today. And um, Nathan, please take it away. All right, thanks Josh, really high praise. I hope I can live up to this high expectation. Uh, and also thanks for organizing this, It's it's been great so far. So uh, my name is Nate, my pronouns are he, him, his, and today I'm gonna to be talking about a deep learning computer vision pipeline that's able to recognize this very cute Animal Crossing profile picture of the character that just so happens to be me without a hat uh, and analyze a whole bunch of things about it. Let's see, like it's a face. So our story starts uh, when I got hired in 2017 at the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. And as I got hired to one research team, another research team had just published this really interesting blog post about how they had built this tool that was able to analyze an entire film and draw boxes around all the characters, faces, and answer all these sorts of demographic questions in an aggregated sense. And it's a really great blog post. I put a little paragraph here, but two words in this blog post specifically stood out to me when I first read this. And that was right here, non-animated films. Turns out that this software was not able to actually analyze any films that had any sort of animated elements. And so when we look at the highest grossing films of 2019, that means at least three of these are gonna be cut out for being completely animated. And the other six of them are going to be cut out because they feature animated characters like Thanos and Endgame, which means only Joker is the film that could be completely analyzed by this software. And this seems to be a really important design decision 
And when I talked to the researchers about why they ended up making this decision, they told me that analyzing animated content is impossible and a model just cannot generalize to new animated styles. And to even try to build something close to doing this, we need at least 2 million labeled images, which is a ton of data. And still, three years later, this quote sort of haunts me. Is it possible to actually analyze animated content? And today, I think I'm really excited to announce that I've removed two characters from this quote, and I'm really excited to say it is indeed possible. But to do this, we have to make really conscious decisions about building this most generalizable model possible. And a lot of that comes down to the data. Now, as data scientists, I'm sure we can agree that data collection is often the most work of any side project. It's where many of my side projects have done a die because collecting and labeling data is a very tedious process. And so the first thing I wanted to do was try to find a publicly available data set where I could just pull the data down and train a model with and start writing code day one. And the first thing I found was this data set. It's called Cartoon Set. It seems to be really great on the surface. There's a lot of data points. There's a lot of faces with different sorts of shapes and styles. Uh, this might have been a good choice, but maybe not for animation because the truth is, uh, the secret truth is that deep learning models are actually not very smart. Uh, so imagine we trained a deep learning model on this sort of data. So we can train it what a human is, and we can train it what an animal is, and we could train it on you know, a whole bunch of data that's very similar to this. And eventually it might get really, really good at predicting this sort of data. It'll recognize humans automatically and what animals are with complete ease and our validation metrics will be through the roof. And we might think we've solved this impossible problem. But actually digging down into what the algorithm is doing, which is a little bit scary for deep learning models, but necessary, is we find that the model might think that all faces have to be faced in the front and have these white, very clean backgrounds, which might not really be true of all our data. In fact, most of the data we might expect to see in the real world is not going to be this clean. So take this example of Mr. Crab's daughter, Pearl, from SpongeBob, who has a single eye and a very large nose, if you can call it that, and uh, an open mouth, and the model will just have no idea what this is. Because when we really dig down deep, we see that these left faces are really clean cut, idealized versions of faces, but they don't match up to the real world where you can get an animated balloon and you can Sharpie a face on it and that's the character or have a frog looking sideways up in a medical examination room or a man with oranges on his head. These are all valid character faces in the real world that our deep learning model would never be able to pick up on this sort of data. So I thought it was really useful to actually train the model on data that I hope it would generalize well to. And that meant labeling a lot of my own data through popular children's and adult animated shows that had kind of interesting, you know, diverse animation styles. Things like Apple and Onion, which is a show about a walking and talking uh, apple and onion. To SpongeBob, which we've just talked about, have very weird characters. To, I think, the weirdest animation style of all, The Amazing World of Gumball which is just crazy. In fact, I did a whole bunch of shows with very diverse, different animation styles. So these are all the shows I labeled with data sets. Uh, and it took many, many, many hours, but I ended up with a data set of about 3,500 hand-labeled faces. And for each of these faces, I not only drew a bounding box around where the image was or where the face was in the image, but I also answered four classification questions that I hope to train models with. Uh, and these questions were animation style, whether it was computer generated or 2D, uh, the category of the character, human, animal, or other, the hair color, and then if it was a human character, the skin tone on a five point scale that I adapted from Google. And so with this, I had data, I was ready to train some models, I thought I was good to go, but not quite. Because before you can even write a line of code, you have to really rethink the model. So let's look at an example from a classic film, Frozen 2. So imagine we're trying to collect this data from Frozen 2, and we wanna go first with the character category. And so we might end up drawing these bounding boxes and labeling all the data for humans and animals and others. We do this for 3,500 faces, and then we take this data and we train a model with it. And that model might actually learn really 
useful generalizations about this data. So from the data alone, it might learn human faces have hair, which is mostly true. Animal faces have fur, which is mostly true. And maybe in the case of Olaf being other, non-human and non-animal, he has no face and, or no hair and no fur. That's all really valid, great conclusions we want our model to learn. So then imagine we do this process again, this time for hair color. So we label yellow hair, brown hair, bald, other, and so on. And again, we use this data and we train a deep learning model to predict hair color. And again, it learns really useful things that would be important towards this prediction task. And then imagine we do this again and again and again for each one of the tasks that we want our model to train. And for each of the data sets we collect, we make entirely separate models. So we have maybe one for animation style, one for hair color, one for skin tone, one for the category, so on and so forth. And all of these are gonna be trained separately. This is called the single task model architecture. And for a lot of deep learning algorithms and projects, this works surprisingly well. But maybe not for animation because there's a really big problem with training using this architecture. So let's take an example here from the ice monster from Frozen. I think I'm just really obsessed with Frozen right now. Uh, so we take this monster and all of these four models will be looking at this exact same image, but they'll all be coming up with their own sort of generalizations about it. So one might know one thing, one might know another thing, all based on the tasks that they have been predicted or been trained to predict. The problem is right here that all of these models look at the same image, they know separate things, but their knowledge gaps are actually completely region locked. They don't share any other information that that model might know with any other model. And we can see this might be a problem with an example like the blue model might be trained to look at hair color. And it might've really gotten good at hair color to the point where it learns it only needs to look at the top of the head because at the top of the head is usually where hair goes. But imagine we feed it a character who might be bald and have sideburns and that sideburns show the hair color and not the top of the head. And so the blue model might be really dangerously close to predicting the character is bald. But the purple model might be looking at data on the side of the face or it might consider the whole face. And the purple model sees and understands the hair color on the sideburns. And if the blue model had that information, it could actually avoid misclassifying the character. And we can imagine these dependencies with the yellow and the green model and the yellow and the purple and the purple and the green. In fact, I think it's a pretty fair generalization to say that all of these models would perform better if they had more information about the face. Ideally, we wanna take this Venn diagram that's completely separate and merge it into the single beautiful Venn diagram where every model is able to share information before making the decision. And so what we're able to do is take the single task model architecture and we can just knock it down. It's not gonna work for this task. Instead, what we're gonna to need to consider is something called the multitask model. And basically it expands the single task model by prepending a shared core network in front of it. And this shared core network is almost like the parent of a family of four task head children. And any good parent will know that all your children will want different things, but you're gonna to have to really prioritize what each child can do and try to find the best compromise so that every child can succeed. And in this case, that's kind of what the shared network does. It takes an image and it generates this really meaningful vector of numbers for each image, and that's called an embedding. And it sends that embedding or that vector of numbers to each of the task sets. So each of the task sets will get the same set of numbers for every image, but it's their job to use those numbers and add on some meaningful information from it to try to predict their task. So uh, multitask models, it's really great. And there's a ton of benefits to them that I'm gonna talk about real quick. The first is that we only need a single model to do all of our prediction tasks instead of many models. Uh, so we can think about many models like ResNets and Inceptions, they're often very big models and maintaining them all, especially when there's a new PyTorch or TensorFlow version is definitely a pain. And a single model is a lot better, it's a lot easier. Of course, as I mentioned before, Tasks can share information, which is really great. Uh, the multitask model also introduces a more general model that reduces overfitting because each of the task sets would like to optimize their data for uh, the, the easiest way to get a prediction. So this might be like the hair color model learning to always look at the top of the head, but the multitask model 
the shared core network in particular, doesn't let any model focus on what's convenient. It only focuses the model on what's important. And therefore the model, each task has to take in what's most important about the image, which is great. It helps us generalize towards new data, which is the goal. Uh, of course, we're also able to generate really meaningful embeddings from the core network. And I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here, uh, but with no ad for no added cost, you know, completely for free, a side effect of this is that our core network is so strong in generating these really meaningful vectors of numbers for each image that if we fed it a video, so in this case, an Animal Crossing video, we cropped out all the faces and we told the shared court network to find us similar faces to this using something like cosine similarity, we get an output like this. And this is an actual output from a model I trained. Uh, so you can see here uh, the seed image on the top of our character, despite changes in background, the model understands that they're very visually similar. The bottom character, even a change in headwear, doesn't matter. The model understands through pose detection and all that the images are actually very similar. And just to kind of pass the gut check, we can look at least visually similar images and we can see humans aren't Tom Nook and Tom Nook is not a human. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So the last benefit and also a pretty major one is that the multitask model makes the object detection task a lot simpler. So consider this image from the amazing world of Gumball where you have three characters and these, these two right characters, the orange and blue one respectively, kind of look like fish. They kind of might look like non-human, non-animal characters. And the object detection model might be sweating here because it has to make a decision whether it's animal or other. And so what it might do is draw the bounding box around the face, which is correct, but then label it with some sort of label with really low confidence. So this blue character on the right might get 41% confidence. And then in post-processing, we might get rid of that face altogether because we don't want any sort of false positives. We want to reduce uh, the number of low confidence bounding boxes. And this is a problem because right away by doing this, we've missed a face entirely and we can't analyze that. But with the multitask model doing the heavy lifting, our object detection task is really able to uh, look at a face and just have to determine if it's a face or a part of the background, not classifying anything. It's a very, very simple task, which means we get a lot more data out of this object detection, which is great. Okay. I feel like I have talked a ton. I've talked, kind of teased the final pipeline. I've built up the components of this model that I think are really important. And finally, finally, we can go through the final pipeline of the model for animated facial detection. So the way this works is we're gonna start by inputting an image. In this case, it might be Tom Nook welcoming you to an island uh, that's your new home and also a world where you're gonna be millions and millions of bills in debt. This image then passes through a fine-tuned faster RCNN inception object detection network, which consists of a few convolutional neural networks, and then finally passes through a final network that classifies whether it's just a face or it's part of the background. That's it, binary classification. And then we might end up with a bounding box like this, cropped around Tom Nook's face with the label saying it's a face, which is great. We're then gonna crop that face so it's just the area inside the bounding box, we're gonna send that through our fine-tuned RevNet 50, which is the core network to our multitask model, which then generates meaningful embeddings and sends that to each of the task head children, which all input this uh, embedding and are able to generate a prediction from it. So in this case, for Tom Nook, it might know that the animation style is computer generated, the species is animal, the fur color is brown, so on and so forth. And so looking at the results based on an 85-15 random train test split, on all the training data I showed you earlier of the shows, we can see that face detection mean average precision is 0.55, which doesn't sound great, but uh, believe me when I say uh, object detection metrics are really, really brutal. And so when we look at the 0.5 intersection over union, which is in that image below the second box where the predicted box and the actual box are sort of overlapping, we can see our metric rises to about 0.89 which is actually really great. It's something to definitely be proud of here. Uh, when we look at the multitask model, this is accuracy. So it's a lot less math. It's easier to understand as humans. Uh, the animation style, the model is actually able to get fairly well with almost 100% accuracy, which is great. It's only a binary question. Uh, character category, about 92% accuracy. 
And even though hair and fur color and skin tone had a lot of options, it was able to get about 85 to 80% respectively, which is really great. But none of this matters unless we're playing, uh, we can analyze this model on a never before seen animation style. And so uh, Josh, if you can play that video, uh, I actually ran the model on something that's very fitting to this conference, which is an Animal Crossing video. Uh, so the model has not seen this animation style before. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so the model hasn't seen this animation style at all before. I trained it with only TV shows. And so the fact that it's able to pick up on all of these characters, uh, these cute villagers that are facing all sorts of different directions, all the nooklings, these are what we would consider very non-traditional characters. And yet the model picks it up just fine. In fact, all these characters running around, the model fully understands that these are all valid faces and it's a little hard to see, but they're actually with really high confidence metrics, which are really great. No, that's, that's perfect, I mean, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on real quick. Uh, so I, I ran these faces that the model detected. I cropped them. I took uh, a screenshot every quarter of a second and ran it through the multitask model and then compared it to uh, what I would consider the correct answer. And we can see the animation style it got was computer generated with pretty high confidence. It thought some of the villagers were animals because I think they have very cute eyes and the model might have learned to detect that. I'm not really sure, but it seemed okay. Uh, but the important thing to note is that hair and fur color and skin tone accuracy is relatively unchanged from this a new animation style to the content that I showed it during training and testing, which is proof that this model is actually able to generalize to new animation styles, which is really, really exciting. And so with this tool, we can do tons of really great things like copyright detection of animated faces in unauthorized content. We can enhance image search of animated characters. We can improve screen reader output by analyzing all the different attributes about a character and you know, display this or, or explain this you know, using audio for visually impaired uh, and so on and so forth. There's a ton of benefits to this sort of pipeline. And so wrapping up here, I know I'm a little bit out of time. Uh, I took this 2017 idea that was thought to be impossible and ended up making it actually really possible with only a fraction of the images, 3,500 images instead of 2 million. So uh, I work at ShopRunner. Uh, we just open sourced the multitask model uh, framework that we use in production. It's called Octopod. Uh, just for fun, it's an animated sticker. I ran this through the model and I'm actually very happy it got it completely right. It not only got all the faces, but understood that these octopi were animals. Uh, is this completely open source? I highly encourage you, you should use it. It took me an hour to get all set up with the code. It's really great. I might be biased. Um, I'm going to be open sourcing all my code and the data I've talked about here at my GitHub. I want to really quickly thank my partner, Jenna, for helping label so much of this data and not complaining too much. And my coworker slash friend, Michael, who actually pushed me to uh, finish this talk and help co-create Octopod, which is really great. So uh, I'll leave my conclusion slide up during the Q&A, uh, but thank you so much for listening to my presentation. It's been an honor. My video off? Oh, okay. All right, and thanks for the talk. That was an awesome talk. And it cool. was really cool to see. If there's any questions I can think of. It was, yeah, that was a great talk. It was really cool to see. Um, oh, let me. Turn your slideshow off. It's a great talk. Um, does anybody have questions? Do any of you guys in the um, Zoom room have questions? I know you're all computer vision experts. So if you guys want to have a conversation about that last talk, feel free. Uh, do we ask now? Yeah. Uh, OK, cool. Yeah, uh, uh, great talk. Uh, first question was, uh, uh, I mean, is it legal to kind of do this? Uh, like uh, basically kind of take these Disney or these animated videos and draw a bounding box. Uh, I actually, the reason why I ask is like, I had kind of a similar idea and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, basically uh, I won't get into trouble if I even try this out. Uh, did you kind of ascertain that uh, it's actually like a legally valid process to do this? Uh, I hope. <laughs> um, I, I purchased all the contents. Uh, I'm not making any money off of it. I'm not profiting. Right. 
uh, there might be an issue maybe open sourcing some of the data if this is illegal, but I'll take it down. But you know, uh, I, I think it's probably okay. I don't think I'm breaking any laws. If I am, I don't mean to. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, the second qu uh, question was, uh, uh, there's been some work on uh, the shape versus texture bias that CNN specifically suffered from, um, which is why, uh, you know, you can kind of do these texture duping attacks and stuff like that. Um, and there were some uh, uh, techniques used to kind of get the CNNs to focus more on the shape of the objects they're trying to detect or classify, rather than the, the color content or the textual content. Uh, I was wondering if you tried out any any of uh, these techniques. I have not. This this is pretty interesting. I, I'll I'll look into it, but I haven't tried any of that. I think I mostly relied on just fine tuning uh, some of these convolutional neural networks and kind of hoping that the deep learning model would be able to generalize from the data. Uh, I'll look into this. So it sounds really interesting. Um, yeah. Maybe I can improve this even more. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and 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 in, in the similar vein, uh, I think. Uh, there's been a, a spurt of research on uh, trying to find uh, good confidence scores for face detection uh, because uh, one of the failings of these YOLO or like these mask CNN type of approaches is that uh, the detectors seem to do really bad on the corner of the images. And this is actually where, uh, especially if you're trying to think of a self-driving car scenario, it becomes extremely important because that is when the person is just about coming in through the edges of the image, you know, he's just about entering the frame of uh, measurement and you want your uh, classifier to be sensitive enough. Uh, so there are these very interesting packages like NetCal, uh, which basically take the softmax score because softmax score is not really a confidence score. It's just a kind of a pseudo probability number that's masquerading around there as a, as a probability score. So there okay. are some very interesting Bayesian approaches like barbecue or plat scaling uh, that kind of take these softmax scores and turn them into actual rigorous, uh, you know, CI values or like these uh, a posteriori probability scores. It'd be uh, a pretty cool add-on to have, so that every time there's a bounding box, uh, you'll actually get to see like a probability score associated with it, and not using like the the softmax as a proxy. You know? Yeah, that actually sounds great. Uh, there's definitely there's definitely tons of room for improvement here. Uh, yeah, that's that's great. I I recently calibrated. Uh, some probability scores get more accurately statistically confident scores. Uh, but I'll look into this method you talked about. Sounds really interesting. Yeah, I, I just shared the link. Uh, uh, I, I, I used this uh, oh, uh, package and uh, uh, full disclosure, it's not my package or anything of that sort. I just found it to be extremely well documented uh, and something that I've used. So it might be helpful for your project. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, uh, looking forward to using it. Awesome. Yeah. Just a comment about the legality. From what I've heard, at least my experience with text, is that as long as you didn't need an account to get the data, then it doesn't matter what the terms of service was for the website. You can use the data and scrape it and use it to make a model and even open source the model. And there's no issue with that. And I feel like if you just find animations that have been legally posted online and you don't need an account to download it, then you can probably use it and distribute it. Like you're not, it's not like you're taking like the voice of children or the voice or image of unconsenting people. So I think yes. if you, as long as you can scrape the data without an account, you're fine. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the talk, Nathan. That was awesome. Um, next is Devin. So, can you come up, Devin and Nathan? All right. Awesome. Heard me? Okay. All right. Uh, my audio? Okay. Yep. Okay. Let me get the video. Uh, actually, I don't know if uh, were you doing the full screen or just the browser window? Do you think it works better? Sure. I wasn't totally sure if the if when I hit full screen on the browser if it was going to mess up. So here we go. Uh, does that look roughly right? Cool. 
Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, you know, just as you see fit. Um, okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm from Unity and I wanted to give a talk today on using Unity to generate training data for machine learning and why that's a cool thing to do. Although I'm realizing at this point that um, the subtitle might not be necessary. It seems like everybody kind of is on board with it being a cool thing to do. Um, uh, Nate actually gave me a great setup. Uh, the several slides he spent explaining how there isn't enough uh, data available for him to do training uh, without taking a bunch and manually labeling it is, uh, is, a, is a great point. And um, we'll, we'll reference back to that later. But a uh, rough agenda, I'll tell you who I am, uh, what I'm talking about, why I'm talking about it, and uh, how you could talk about it in the future too, if you want to. And then we'll go to uh, Q and A. And just a, a little disclosure, I, I, some of this might be a little bit uh, high level. I wasn't sure exactly how many people were gonna reach in the stream, so I made sure to clarify a lot of terms in here in the beginning. So um, we'll start with uh, who am I, uh, what is machine learning, and why you should care. So, uh, hi, I'm Devin. Uh, I work on the perception team at Unity, and the perception team is this uh, interdisciplinary group of machine learning researchers, software development engineers, um, many people kind of that fit in between those two titles. And uh, we kind of share this common goal of uh, what we call democratizing machine learning, and that is simply to say that um, we would like machine learning and machine learning training to be more available to basically anyone instead of only available to those who have access to uh, scores and scores of expensive data that you need normally for a machine learning model. And so I'll, I'll clarify these terms a little bit because uh, I know that we, we say machine learning a lot, but what, I, what we really mean or what I'm, what I'm really talking about here is neural networks. Uh, this, this talk can apply somewhat more broadly to other types of machine learning, but I'm going to use these terms pretty much interchangeably. Uh, and then as, uh, when I talk about perception, um, I'm not necessarily talking about computer vision, although I mostly am. Uh, perception can also include a couple other things, and our team works in uh, more than just explicitly computer vision. But at the same time, for the purposes of this talk, uh, computer vision is basically the same thing as perception. Uh, and it's important to note that while computer vision is not necessarily uh, machine learning in and of itself, you can certainly write a computer vision algorithm that doesn't require do any sort of learning. Uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, this is the good stuff. This is what I consider the intersection of, of perception and machine learning, where the uh, most interesting stuff happens, uh, according to me, the person that works on these things. Um, okay, so why is uh, this interesting? Well, I think uh, I don't need to convince people very much of this, but I wrote this stuff down anyway. So uh, vision-based machine learning, it's super useful. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with it. Um, I, I think it, it doesn't take much imagination to kind of see how uh, it's already being applied or to see how it would be valuable to improve machine learning models for their current applications. Uh, you might think of autonomous driving, assembly line automation, customer service automation. The more robust the models are, the kind of better these tasks, uh, be, you know, the more accurately these tasks get executed by the whatever system is executing the model. Uh, in, in terms of customer service automa automation, maybe there's a, you know, kind of a grocery identification application that you might think would be relevant. I made this point bigger. That's called foreshadowing. We'll talk about that later. Um, it, it, machine learning is also uh, very difficult for kind of the same reasons. Uh, Nate, I'm glad you said it so I didn't have to, but I'm going to say it again anyway. Machine learning can, uh, neural networks can be kind of dumb. And, um, and that's because they are very sensitive to stuff that you have no idea that they would be sensitive to. And so cultivating your data set and making something that actually trains the, the algorithm to work the way you want it to is super important. Uh, and and uh, of note, I had a frowny face next to this very difficult point uh, for most of today. And uh, as I was going through it, I realized I should probably change this to a smiley face because although it is, it is sometimes frustrating that machine learning is so difficult, I think this is also what makes this such a cool and interesting field. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why machine learning is hard. Uh, I'm gonna focus on, on one very specific one and that's just that it requires a lot of data, a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of data. And uh, that data is special, and it's it's unique to each task that you're trying to accomplish with whatever machine learning algorithm you've built. And um, it, it also is very expensive. 
And it's expensive because it needs to be labeled. And so if you want to teach a machine learning algorithm how to figure out what's going on in the image on the left, you need an image like what is on the right, where you have annotated the data in some way to describe to your algorithm what's going on in it. And uh, annotations might not always look like colorful blobs. Um, they might look like uh, bounding boxes or a list of uh, semantic clues about a scene or something like that. But ultimately, um, it really requires that someone sits down and goes through every single bit of data you want to feed to your algorithm when you're trading it and labeling it for you and labeling it accurately. And I think a point that's often missed is that if you want your model to perform really well, if you want it to be robust to most circumstances, uh, it actually needs even more, even more data. Give it some more um, because the world is a complex and diverse place. And whatever uh, data set you have is going to be biased uh, just simply due to the nature of how you collected it or where it came from. And uh, edge cases by definition uh, are not gonna show up very often in that data because they're edge cases. But a lot of times, um, you need those edge cases. Maybe they're very important. Uh, the one that I always bring up is the baby stroller in the middle of the road. Uh, I don't know, scars should probably know how to identify that, but it's probably not a thing that's gonna happen very often. Um, so the question then is, uh, how do we get all of this data? And um, traditionally, like we've described, you collect it from somewhere. Uh, you hopefully collect it ethically and with permission of the people you're collecting it from. And then you pay a group of humans to annotate it. And uh, you really hope that that uh, is good enough for you because gosh, golly darn it, that's hard to do again. Uh, it's very expensive the first time, it's just as expensive the second time and the third time you do it. So if you need more data, uh, you're paying for it again. Uh, but, but what if uh, we instead just generated that data? Uh, enter synthetic data or sim data or data generated from simulation, simulated data, any of those. Uh, it's like real data, but it's fake somehow. And that's uh, actually great because uh, unlike real images, synthetic data can be made. Uh, there are a lot of examples of, of synthetic data. I've got a few here. You can see on the right, this is, um, this is a picture of my cat hanging out in the, uh, the entranceway to the Unity office in Bellevue. And it may occur to you that my cat cannot actually exist in three places at the same time. Uh, and he's actually never been to the Unity offices in Bellevue. This is a composite image that we've put together. And that means that even though it's composed of real parts, it's still a synthetic image. Uh, I thought this was a funny picture to share, but this is actually not the kind of data we'll talk about today. Uh, there's, there's other types of data that can, they can be generated by AI. Um, they can be a combination of real and digital parts. Um, but what we're really talking about, the, um, the part that we're really interested in at Unity, because we have a, uh, you know, a fully featured rendering engine at our disposal, is uh, fully synthetic data. That is to say stuff that is just completely rendered. Um, and so what are the benefits of doing this besides the fact that you can uh, you know, make it whenever you want? Uh, well, you have a complete guarantee that the ground truth for your data is completely accurate, as opposed to being human labeled like it often is. Uh, the ground truth is kind of implicitly defined by how you've generated your scene. Uh, similarly, uh, you have really precise control over how you generate your scene when you're generating your data. And that uh, can be very important for capturing stuff like edge cases or making sure that the uh, trends and shapes in your data follow the pattern that you want it to follow. Uh, maybe you've read a really cool paper about uh, generalizing your neural network, your for a particular, uh, in a particular way. And it, it just simply requires that you expose it to lots and lots of data in a very particular format. And so you can do that, no problem with synthetic data. You define the rules by how the scene is constructed. Um, and, and lastly, and I'll, I'm just gonna restate it here, uh, you can make as much of it as you want. And that's because it's uh, generated by you. And it doesn't, it, it's not bound by the limitations of a finite timeline and a finite number of cameras existing in the world. Um, so what are the downsides then? Obviously there must be some because uh, conventional knowledge is kind of that we don't use synthetic data that much for machine learning. Uh, well, downside number one is uh, just that it's kind of mysterious. Uh, this handsome fellow on the right giving us the stank face uh, may look very realistic to us, um, but some of the techniques that we use to generate uh, rendered scenes in video games or otherwise uh, are, are kind of shortcuts or cheats. 
And they're, they're good for approximating how light behaves and how textures behave uh, to a point that's convincing to a human eye. But is it convincing to a machine? Hard to say, it's a mystery. Um, the other issue is just that it's, uh, you cannot just take a camera out into the real world and snap a couple photos, take it home and label those photos. You need software to generate uh, this data. Uh, but what's that you say? We're, uh, that's what I'm talking about right now? Well, yeah, it is actually. So maybe it's just that the downside of synthetic data is that it's kind of mysterious. Uh, so to sum up real quick, doing good machine learning is hard. And that's because you need a lot of very specific data. And sometimes you don't even know what data is you what data it is you need exactly, uh, or what the shape of that data is, or what trends you need to represent in that data. Um, finding ethically sourced real data is expensive and time consuming, and uh, comes with uh, all sorts of human biases and is susceptible to human error during the labeling process, during the collection process, uh, etc. Using synthetic data, data is cheaper and customizable, but it requires special software to be written. Uh, well, luckily for you, we're writing that software and it's called the Perception Package. Um, so I didn't have a good segue for this slide. Uh, we, ha we made this Perception Package. It's a preview package. It's, um, it's still kind of a prototype that we're working on, but we've uh, released it. Uh, but in order to prove it to ourselves and to others that it, that it can do something useful, we had to find an experiment. And so we did, some stuff that other people did also, but we did it in unity with our perception package. Um, and so we focused on reproducing this, the experiment uh, presented here by a team at Google Cloud AI. Uh, they uh, created and trained a model entirely with synthetic data, uh, just generated images of groceries and their associated ground truth. And then they evaluated that model and they pitted it against a model trained on real data, uh, labeled data, you know, manually labeled uh, of also the same groceries. And what they found is that within a certain set of constraints, their synthetic data mo trained model actually outperformed the uh, model trained on real data. And of course, this, um, you know, may seem totally shocking to a lot of us. And, and that is not to say that, uh, you know, synthetic data wins, pack it in. Uh, but it is to say that under a certain set of constraints that if it, uh, for an experiment set up in a certain way, you can get uh, pretty good results out of a model trained with synthetic data. And so we wanted to replicate that, this experiment. Um, the kind of one of the key points of this experiment is that uh, they started with assuming that photorealism isn't really necessary. And that's kind of freeing because that kind of goes against conventional wis wisdom and the expectation that all of our data needs to look as realistic as possible. What they found instead is that um, you just need to get kind of close enough to, to get the model to recognize the key characteristics of an item. Right, of a item. And so the, the generator of synthetic data that they used uses just simple lighting shadows, uh, added white noise and blur to simulate kind of the noise and blur that you would see on, a, on some camera capturing this imagery. Uh, they set up their scene with a kind of three layers. There's a background, the foreground, which is, uh, consists of all the detection targets that you want to train the model to detect, and then an occluding layer. And so the background and the occluding layer are just clutter. They're just stuff. They're there to generate noise, to confuse the model, to make sure that it's not just overfitting to a bunch of stuff floating in space. Um, the occluding layer uh, blocks the targets a little bit, but not too much, uh, in order to further confuse the model. And then on top of that, they randomize the lighting and the hue of the clutter texture. Uh, so that you really just have kind of like a lot of noise happening around these objects that we want to detect. But then because we want to train the model in a very structured way, they uh, created this curriculum for the uh, models, for the items that needed to be detected. Uh, and so they ran through in order a kind of list of scales from closest to the camera to farthest away from the camera and poses to try and capture, ensure that, that the, a good distribution of every single angle of each object was, was captured. And so we did that same thing uh, in Unity and we called it Synthet. And these are some of the images that it created. And you can see they just kind of look like uh, nonsense to a human eye almost. You can see that there's clutter in the foreground and it's just kind of some squares and shapes and stuff. And uh, the background is just also some more squares and shapes. And then you can see some very obvious uh, detection targets, things that, that are the stuff that we want to train our detector to detect. And so we ran through a similar experiment with Synthet and um, 
we released this as well as an example project to kind of prove uh, how that, that perception is useful and that, and that we could use it to train a model. And, um, and, and we got uh, pretty decent results. And so we, we generated this grocery data and we trained it on a model. And it, sorry for my very thin lines, but uh, I will just tell you that in the right image, the green boxes are pretty well aligned with the ground truth boxes shown in the left image. And the confidences are relatively high. Um, or most of them are the max that they can be. And, and so what we learned from that um, were kind of three key things. One, um, although synthetic data is great, uh, we actually did kind of cheat a little bit on some of our better models. Uh, and it's not really cheating, it's science. Uh, we we pre-trained with synthetic, uh, but we, then we used a, uh, another round of training with uh, real labeled images to kind of give it a, you know, like a polish pass. And um, we found that, that while photorealism isn't necessary, it's still kind of necessary to make sure your simulated representation matches your real world rep representation. We actually had a very funny thing happen where uh, the person who was creating the models in our sim was in a different region of the United States than the person who was capturing the real world labeled data for, for uh, benchmark training and the validation pass. And so what we had was uh, serial boxes that were almost exactly the same, but with slight design differences. Say there was a tag that says extra calcium in one place on one of the boxes, but in a different place in another box. And so even though they were effectively the same box because there were these key differences, our, our results were significantly worse than when we noticed these differences and fixed them. And then we had a more accurate representation in SIM. Um, and, and the final one is simply just that uh, intuition is great to have, and it's very necessary when you're training off of real world data because you uh, gain a lot of you gain a lot from getting it right the first time. But uh, when when you have synthetic data, uh, it's just as good to just do the experiment anyway. Uh, you have kind of an unlimited access to data of various forms, so just do the experiment, do it over and over again, do it as many times as you can, um, and see what works. And so um, you may notice that my, my numbers, uh, this, this, tech, tech, this talk was a little bit number light. And uh, that's because all of our numbers are located on our blog posts and um, I don't have permission to repeat them here mostly. But, um, and we also have some of them that are unreleased and so we have an upcoming blog post that's, that hasn't been released yet and that has all of kind of, kind of like final numbers from these experiments. Um, and so you can do this yourself. You can pull down perception package uh, from the package manager inside Unity. You can check out the synthetic repository. And um, very soon you will get to see the, a blog post kind of describing in more detail our methodology and, and our results. Okay, and so that's uh, all I got for you. Uh, are there any questions? Awesome, great talk. Thank you, Devin. Um, let me just do a clap for you. And the audience is clapping too. Great. Um, so I'm wondering if any anybody from the audience has any questions. Um, you're welcome to speak. The mics are on. So I have a I have a quick question. Uh, I, I thought the talk was was really great. Uh, I thought it was really really interesting, unique take on the talk. Uh, I think my question comes with the I think a worry would be that when we're using synthetic data, I think this is something you mentioned that we might not be able to actually generate enough of the kind of small cases like the, uh, the stroller in the middle of the street, you know, those little edge cases that we might not really see very typically in the data. Uh, is there a concern that when we're generating synthetic data, we have an even greater chance of missing those really important edge cases? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so I was being super reductive when I said that the only problem with synthetic data is that it's mysterious. But um, yeah, there's there's definitely kind of, I mean, it's, it's all encapsulated in this idea that we just don't know what we don't know. And with real data, you kind of have this guarantee that it's gonna look like real life because it is. Um, and so, yeah, 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 there's, there's definitely concern. And, and this is like the primary concern for I think a lot of people that I've talked to in this field that uh, sure that looks that looks right, but how do you prove that it's right? I know that if I take a picture outside that that's representative, but I don't know that this, this simulated scene is also representative, especially representative in the ways that are important to some you know magical neural network with 
a, a bazillion steps and just a ton of you know operations that I don't you know under I don't understand. I can't intuit what this thing is going to do, and and so that yeah, that is very much just like a, a super valid concern. Thanks. Cool. Any other questions from the group? Oh, I'm not. Sorry. Any other questions from the Zoom room? All right. Well, awesome talk. Super cool application of Unity's awesome products and your awesome game engine. Like, I can't wait to see that new blog post. So definitely let me know when that comes out. Will do. Okay. Um, so next up, we have Vine. Um, but Vine uh, actually doesn't have an avatar, so Matthew is going to be Vine today. Um, so Matthew, if you could come up, and Vine, can you Hello. please um, share your screen with me so I can see your slideshow? Nice mask, Matthew. All right, I have your screen, and I'm just going to crop it on my end whenever you get to full screen. All right, let me just... Okay, so this really cool talk by Vine Prabhu on incorporating structural similarity into neural style transfer. So the end of our call, I mean, the end of this section, actually the last two talks, um, Vinay's and Matthew's are both on um, style transfer and um, image generation. So super excited to learn more about that. Um, and Vinay, let me, or I, I want to let you take it away. Oh wait, yeah, is Matthew presenting or? I, I, I'm presenting and then Vinay is also helping out with the, with the Q&A. Um, I, I sort of put together this, uh, a lot of the stylistic aspects of this presentation. So it's just starting to be like, it's two separate presentations. Yep. Nice. You got it. Okay, so thanks again for the previous talk. Um, speaking of data, um, training data requirements, uh, it's interesting that we're starting with a topic that requires, by comparison, very little training data, uh, style, neural style transfer. So this topic is basically going to uh, go off an interesting sort of uh, technique we stumbled, um, uh, we were uh, testing out, we want to sort of share with the community here, uh, structural similarity. So for the sake of this, um, you know, what is style transfer? A few of us may have seen some of these apps before, uh, but this is basically the process of ha uh, harnessing convolutional neural networks to project a real real world content photograph into different style spaces. So if we, for example, we, if we have a input content of the Great Wall right here in this, you know, painting this sort of woodblock looking thing uh, as the input style, uh, that we basically use neural tra style transfer to make sure that the object still is Almost um, resembling similar activations as the actual, um, you know, content classification as this input content, while also um, ha activating the earlier parts of the network that um, respond to the the style features in this image. So you get this sort of combined output. Um, and of course, as you uh, you know, there's many different uh, versions of neural style transfer in so many different applications. There's no one single uh, method. So for the sake of clarity, we're going to focus on. Uh, part that deals with non-photorealistic image optimization based online neural methods. So this is from a uh, taxonomy from Jing et al. Uh, and it's a big sounding word, but let's we can break this down. So this is the taxonomy, example-based techniques. Uh, we are ignoring about, we are ignoring recoloring and retexturing the kind you would see in like PowerPoint or something like that. We're only focused on neural style transfer. Uh, within that space, we are ignoring methods that involve optimizing a model to, um, output image is we're focusing on only optimizing images to activate mo frozen models in uh, a specific way. Within the space of image optimization, we're only focusing on um, uh, parametric methods. So we're ignoring the methods that don't use 
the summary statistics of images in their optimization process. Uh, we also do not care about photorealism. Uh, where's, the, where's the fun in that? Uh, and we're also, at least for now, again, this is still relatively new. We're showing this to everyone. At least for now, we're just focusing on still images, not videos right now. And so that's where this whole uh, non-photorealistic image optimization based online neural methods for uh, neural style transfer comes from. Uh, just figured I would um, give that kind of breakdown right there. So, OK, we have all this. What does this actually mean in practice? Uh, so this is basically style transfer by uh, using this loss function. Uh, so I've, I'm going to go with like the the Kanako method that's described in Gattis at all. This describes neural style transfer as you have this input, um, you know, artwork image, uh, like, for example, the, the woodblock uh, from earlier. And so you also have an input photograph. We have the um, represented by the P here. And the goal of this is that we have this um, sort of variable image, this thing that can actually be uh, optimized. We want to synthesize a style transfer image X that minimizes this, this big loss function in which is made of these smaller parts, um, these out weighted differently by these alpha and beta terms, this L content, which is a combination of the uh, photograph and the synthetic image and the style, which is, a, uh, which is fed in the synthetic image and the artwork. So that's this sort of general format of the loss function. There can occasionally be little add-ons to this, like um, total variation loss, but this is the general, or for the most part, it, this is the general um, uh, style uh, described by uh, Gattis et al. Uh, and what we are, um, you know, this has been used in, you know, when people get introduced to style transfer, this may be like the main sort of format that they uh, may get introduced to. People have been using networks like BGG and, you know, Inception networks for a long time using this format. Uh, but there still seems like there could be some improvement. Uh, namely, when you, a lot of you have probably seen, uh, you know, this kind of style transfer the past and like wondered how good could it possibly get? It's obviously a little bit tricky to have, you know, have something so subjective be put on a, like a baseline, but it's obviously uh, when we see other kinds of like human developed style transfer, you know, whether it be ca uh, caricatures of, you know, real life people in put into a cartoon style or where we like, you know, movie references in the art styles of famous artists or even or even uh, ancient cultures, yeah, that yeah, that is the uh, mind batman and no, that's not real. It was made by um, an artist, but it's still a good example of what I'm talking about. Yeah, a lot of it, examples often feature, uh, you know, convolutional layers picking up on lower level features and incorporating them in, into an image. Uh, but this sort of higher level context awareness is often uh, lacking. So ideally, we would want some sort of neural transfer that can actually. Uh, you know, incorporate the style transfer kind of like this. Um, and of course, this level is is still a little bit of a ways off, but it, in this one sub area of neural style transfer, we can actually improve our uh, process by carefully selecting which uh, summary statistics we're paying attention to during the optimization process. So what does this look like in terms of the math? We have this loss function, as mentioned before, uh, and this, um, this uh, as, as you notice, this SIM uh, on here, we improve the Gattis et al. 2016 loss function by adding on these new uh, uh, new terms to the loss function. And this big this component highlighted in the purple right here, the main addition to this within the uh, style loss is a multiplicative term that captures the, this is the structural similarity between the Gramian uh, feature images produced at the style extraction layers. So. What, what exactly does this actually mean um, in detail? Uh, where does this addition come from? This function that was seen in this previous slide, uh, this, is a, this is a function that represents the standard structural similarity index, uh, which is a classical image processing technique. And when I say classical, I mean like 2004, which as, as far as machine learning papers go is practically ancient by now. Uh, this, uh, this technique is, you know, takes into account things like luminance, uh, contrast, and sort of the actual structure of the um, objects in the image to actually measure the similarity between them. Uh, so we actually have another me uh, measure of uh, similarity between images beyond um, things that, uh, beyond the kinds of things that you may uh, uh, see in the, er in the earlier layers of a convolutional neural network. Uh, and so what the event actually, uh, what actually comes out of this is, as you're gonna see in the results section going on, 
there's, it's very subtle, but there's, it's almost like finer artistic strokes being rendered onto the style transferred images. Um, actually how this, you know, works is, you know, this looks like a pretty impressive visualization, but the math is also, it's also uh, much simpler than you would initially um, think. So we have these two images, the X and Y, we have the SSIM function. And this is what it would look like when you go into the, you know, like TensorFlow docs. Uh, when we started out this project, we didn't actually know that there actually is, uh, we actually did find a few additional um, SSIM uh, functions that are um, in some of these existing uh, computer vision libraries that we can use. So I feel like a lot of us are, all we were doing was implementing some of these from scratch, but uh, I guess it, it sort of worked out well. Uh, anyway, we have these two images. I'm just, you know, representing them in blue and red. Uh, red. We have these, you know, pixel means of the uh, image X and image Y, we have the pixel variance, and then we have this uh, combined, um, this empirical covariance between both images uh, right over here. We have these two uh, constant terms uh, highlighted in green, distinct from every other part, just to make it clear that these are these are sort of distinct from the uh, image inputs. These are mainly there just to stop the um, as sort of like a weak, uh, weak denominator uh, stabilizer. So if there's anything, um, so, so this function will collapse. Uh, and these terms right here, you know, the k uh, the k terms from themselves. These are uh, what we chose by default. And they just seem pretty, to work out pretty well for us. Uh, as for L, this is the dynamic range of the um, pixel values. And in, in the next presentation, you'll see that will suddenly become a lot more uh, relevant. But this is basically the entire uh, function that's being represented. And chances are, are you can probably find a image processing library that has this actually built in. Uh, so again, the math half, you know, looks really impressive. But what does this actually look like in real life? So for the practical implementation, we can just sort of go back over the methods um, method that we're using as motivated in Gattis et al. 2016. Uh, we have the uh, texture or style layers that are sort of like the earlier ones in the CNN shortly after, after uh, the input image. And then we'll have content layers that are picked from deeper layers closer to the softmax output or whatever activation outputs. And the idea is that the content layers are somewhat closer to the latent representations of the content. So for style, like for example, if we have the example of taking, you know, the great wave and then composing that onto a sea turtle image, you know, the style layers are the ones that are getting activated by these lower level styles, you know, probably even lower levels like this, like even just like contrasts between two different colors. And so part these are the parts of the network that rep, uh, recognize these sort of contrasts and colors and patterns without being too far removed from the input image itself. And then we have this content layer, which is really just saying like, okay, is it still kind of a turtle when we when this uh, image is coming out of it? And you know, obviously, it's not going to be an exact uh, classification. We often use layers before the final output, but we can basically just say, yeah, I, I guess uh, we have specific parameters right here that are going to be released in the actual code itself. But these are pretty standard, and like I said here, you can just pause the recording if you really care about these details. We are releasing the this code um, we, uh, shortly after the, after this. Uh, presentation so you, you all can actually experiment with this method yourselves. Um, so actually what this actually looks like, you have, this is with SSIM uh, turned off, this is, uh, you know, sea turtle with the great, great wave and, you know, it looks, looks pretty good. Kind of looks like the wave is, the wave is sort of like cut up and sort of put into a collage that kind of resembles the sea turtle. Uh, and it's, again, it's a little bit subtle, but here's what happens when um, structural similarity indexes, uh, uh, turned on, and it's like it's all a little bit more believable that the artist behind the Great Wave uh, was behind the um, was behind was behind this uh, image. I mean, I say more believable. I still don't actually believe the artist, original artist, was behind it because he's dead after all. But uh, again, this sort of uh, subtle difference between how these um, different styles of the image are being re uh, rearranged seems extremely useful. And this is with the same but with otherwise the same parameters uh, between both networks with only this SSIM being turned on or off. Uh, we can try again with the pillars of creation, you know, sea turtle made out of a nebula, looks pretty good right here. Uh, but if we add on the SSI app uh, turned on, it seems to be paying attention a lot more to the actual form of the uh, sea turtle, despite this sort of new weight being added onto the style uh, layer. So again, that's an interesting, um, It's this is not so much weighting um, it's happening on the content side, 
This is all uh, due to different um, parts of the way that they're happening on the style side. So this uh, that's resulting in um, the style of the image being applied uh, uh, differently than it would than it was without uh, the structural similarity awareness. Uh, again, going to this uh, picture of Amsterdam with the same nebula. Uh, go right here. You can actually see the um, contents of the buildings be made up more rather than just sort of uh, what seems more like a remix of the style image. Uh, again, going to another example with Van Gogh's Starry Night. What struck me about this example was that you can see elements of the sky within the um, boundary of the water. But if you add the structural similarity index uh, awareness, it seems less like someone you know cut up a, a multi-million dollar painting and rearranged in a collage, and more like you know a little bit more like if Van Gogh how Van Gogh actually did draw um, did actually paint buildings. Yeah, even works for abstract art too. Um, you know, obviously, uh, this is you know not exactly believable that the original artist made because he didn't draw anything coherent. But uh, again, the same may effect of paying attention of by changing how the style layer is created, paying paying attention a lot more to various parts of the uh, content image and a lot more um, a lot more variation in terms of how these brush strokes are being applied. Especially if you notice things like, you know, whether this be the tree or the trees in the um, lower, uh, lower left corner, or even how the buildings uh, are being made out, or even just like avoiding switching between different content images, we can see, you know, this white cat with a black background. This is without the structural similarity index with it turned on, and as you'll see in a lot of these cases, the usual effect is that it seems to be paying attention a lot more to the cat's fur and then trying to adjust accordingly. While still having plenty of the style uh, in the background as well. Um, same thing, some effect with Van Gogh's Starry Night. Looks almost like there's pieces of the sky within the cap, but now uh, this then now this almost looks like a you know it's a separate picture that Van Gogh drew of a cat. It was sort of possibly unrelated to uh, Starry Night. The, there's much much sort of finer detail when it comes to the, the when it comes to the style being applied throughout the image, um, and a little bit less coarse grain than. Uh, than the former. We also have, you know, going back to the nebula, um, this one almost even to the point of looking like a cat in space. Uh, and this one is one of my favorites. This is literally just the great wave cat, just looks like a bunch of waves. But now with this one, this seems like the actual cat made of the seam foam that actually resembles the, you know, actually looks like a little bit more like cat fur now, but uh, the style is a lot more apparent. And I think my housemate uh, summed it up pretty nicely. It looks more like the artist actually drew the image rather than the style picture being cut up and rearranged. Um, so, but what are the main takeaways? One, there's plenty of room for augmenting the basic uh, you know, style transfer loss function described in gas at all. And you could, it's maybe an overgeneralization, but this could really apply to any real loss function for that matter. Um, there's also still new areas of the style space that can be unlocked by incorporating classic computer vision techniques. Again, we we're, were messing around with techniques from like 2004, adding this into the uh, you know, adding this into the uh, uh, dial, uh, adding this into the style loss, uh, but we also want to stress one thing: is that there is no one correct STA. We're not advocating that this is like superior or better in other ways. Of you know, um, we're not saying that the SM weighting is superior. We just think that again, this is super subjective. So uh, there's some there's many different ways that this could be applied, and we're really just looking to make the community aware of this. So. Uh, we can sort of see more examples of uh, style transfer applications like this. Uh, cool. So that's been about a minute over, but uh, that's the presentation. I'll just come back to the main takeaways uh, for now. That was an awesome talk. It was really cool. Um, it was awesome seeing the examples. So I just have a question. So for the ones where it's like the cat and the the background's black, you know, and then the style transfer kind of like over. But you could say it overdoes it because it's trying to color in the background the same way it's coloring in the cat or editing the cat. So do you think like an approach where like maybe object detection is done first and so it knows like like some kind of like semantic segmentation and then doing the style transfer within the segmentation? Do you know if work has been done on that or do you think so, that would be interesting to you? So I believe that's not only is that done, but I believe Adobe's um, photo editor uh, actually does um, actually does something similar in terms of like uh, cropping it, you know, for some, some of the filters that they have, being able to crop out the foreground and have it in a different style than the background. 
Uh, this is more of like if you are somewhat more constrained in terms of um, in terms of like building an entirely new network, like switching from just you know optimizing for an image classifier to an image uh, semantic segmentation model. This is really just a one simple change to the, to the uh, loss function that results in these changes. But uh, yes, in fact, it's the Adobe. It's one of these new photo editing apps by Adobe that does like this automatic um, filtering, and that actually one of them does do exactly what you're describing. Although it, although with that one, it's a bit of a mix of recoloring and also retexturing, not just uh, neural style transfer alone. Cool. And now I want to open up the questions to the rest of the Zoom room. We have time for a question if anybody wants to ask. All right, then. I guess nobody wanted to ask. All right, so let's go to our next talk. Um, I'm going to just transition. All right, so or actually, I'll go back to um, uh, hold on I'm just having a hiccup yeah so let me know when your slides are ready and I'll they're ready right now okay cool you guys ready yes Okay, so talking about the style transfer and last presentation, and part of the reason, an interesting story is that these were two projects. Um, this was the main sort of area of research we were focusing on for a while, and that sort of uh, structural uh, structural similarity, um, the neural style transfer uh, technique actually came about almost by accident, almost by accident as a, as a, as just a serendipity from it investigating uh, what I'm actually going to present in this one. So. With this one, it's sort of the same technique. This is neural style transfer. Um, you know, as we mentioned, this is the technique for representing content images, same styles, uh, style image. Instead of optimizing model, the model itself is you know, more or less uh, frozen, um, and we're uh, and we're optimizing an actual image. Uh, and of course, after all this talk on neural style transfer, the question is, of course, what you know, what are the sort of uh, uses for this? And basically, there's this is being used uh, in some ways everywhere. So there's, you know, I mentioned the photo apps. This is the example I was actually giving earlier of having the foreground and background editing, um, you know, everything from video production. There's this is a sample from Google Stadia, which, you know, doing style transfer over your Wi-Fi, that's gonna, well, that's gonna run, run the bill up. And of course, it's also one of the main uh, early products that people just starting out in machine learning um, try out when they're doing computer vision. So. Again, super popular technique. Everyone's doing it. And of course, at, when it comes to uh, how how these techniques actually perform, you know, the big question is, you know, the, the performance is always not enough. It's you know, there's always more uh, to be done in terms of making it go faster, decreasing latency, decreasing, um, increasing iteration speed. Uh, I thought this um, Saturday morning breakfast cereal uh, con right here was particularly relevant. Um, all credits goes to Zach Wiener. So with this in mind, we were sort of thinking about all the different ways that this could be improved. So one of the ways that these, a lot of uh, neural network based models are improved is, uh, is uh, doing things like compressing them or reducing weight precision. You know, many of you may already be familiar with uh, the tensor processing units that Google has bit had, and they're slightly, I mean, they're not just rebranded GPUs, but they, um, one of the ways that they function by, I, their speed ups function is by reducing some of these uh, float 32s in the you know neural network weights into float 16s, and this is you know in addition to reducing the memory, but also makes this uh, makes it much easier to train. So this this seems pretty impressive so far, but can we actually go further when it comes to the um, when it comes to the compression? Uh, can we do eight bit? Uh, can we do like eight eight bit? Can we do four bit weights? Uh, I I say we can go even further. We can go all the way to uh, bi binary neural network parameters, you know, plus one or uh, plus one or minus one. Uh, we can go all the way down to um, just down down to that level um, far away from any like, you know, weights where you have to carry it, you have to care about what the like, uh, you know, ninth, ninth decimal place looks like. 
So this seems this seems pretty impressive, but it's you know, and it may seem a little bit counterintuitive how uh, weights are only restricted to this, how this would even work. Uh, so what they do is that the, the uh, banded neural networks work by a quantization function, which uh, takes the activations and then um, yeah, takes the activations and the latent full precision weights and then uh, quantizes them based on this uh, equation on the forward pass. Now you may be looking at it and thinking like, wait a minute, that just that's that's completely insane. Like how would you know how could a neural network even learn when its weights would be modified like this? Uh, and and you'd be right. The problem is that if you do just this, there's the, the gradient of the function is zero almost anywhere, and regular gradient descent just completely breaks down. So you need to make a little bit of a modification. Uh, the gradient is instead estimated using a, a straight through estimator. So which basically means that the binarization is replaced by a clipped identity on the backward pass. So that's that's sort of the main um, uh, that's sort of the main sort of higher high level theoretical understanding of how these work. And when it comes to um, you know activations and uh, latent uh, weights, you can apply this not only to the dense layers but even to convolutional layers. You know you can next take these weights and then convert them into quantized convolutional net networks. And this this applies. You know, we give the binary example right here, but there's the same similar principles apply for you know eight bit, uh, four bit, and all other uh, sort of levels of uh, precision with these uh, quantized neural networks. Uh, binarized neural networks are sort of a subclass of these uh, quantized neural networks. But given that you know, given how extreme they are, we were really curious about this type. Uh, in practice, you know, there's also there's not actually much different than how you would actually assemble a you know typical convolutional neural network. Uh, we have an example of a you know from a uh, SFAR 10 classifier right here. And it's not really how different than what you normally do. Um, the main differences are that one, the pixels are normalized to negative one, uh, one instead of uh, zero to one. And you replace the 2D convolutional and dense layers with just their quantized equivalents. Uh, so you can get with this, a network like this, you can get 98% accuracy, uh, which for SFAR uh, 10 is not really all that, that impressive. What is impressive is that you can do this with 30 times less memory than the float 32 equivalent, equivalent model. So uh, let me repeat that, that's 30 times less memory. Um, so this is already seems like it could be inc incredibly useful. You know, immediately this is, you know, it's super low memory requirements to seem impressive, but of course accuracy does take a little bit of a hit compared to, you know, if we're doing this uh, comparison on ImageNet, it's the, many of the state of the art uh, quantized neural uh, networks are not quite at the level of some of the regular precision neural networks on tasks like ImageNet, uh, but they are they are steadily improving. Uh, they're they're increasing uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, I also want to stress that when I say low memory requirements, I even mean to compare to things like efficient net, which are full um, precision neural networks, because the, these things can still have the same number of parameters, but since uh, each parameter itself takes up less weight, this is much smaller. But as, as I mentioned, low memory uh, means low latency, and this also can be extremely fast on Android and Raspberry Pi devices. So this can mean, you know, taking a model that previously ran, uh, you know, we previously took uh, 300 milliseconds uh, to run, and then uh, getting that down to less than less than 20 or less than 10 milliseconds uh, by quantizing it. Um, on such devices, does require some special steps for the hardware deployment, but uh, on the plus side, it's also extremely easy to. Uh, the specific package Lark, which we used for this, uh, which we used for this project, it is compatible with frameworks like TF Keras, which makes the kind of experiment setup much easier. Uh, that being said, you know, while there all all these advancements have been made, it's still a relatively immature technique, and we're kind of hoping that sort of putting the spotlight on this technique, which focuses on not what you can do with just maxing out the uh, compute you have, but saying how much can you do for a given amount of compute. Uh, we still think that there is uh, value in that. So for the experiment that we're going to show next, we, um, you know, for our sort of starting point, we had, you know, VG19, which is this, uh, staple for staple for uh, neural style transfer uh, based on images, and used QuickNet, uh, which is one of the more advanced, uh, better performing uh, uh, binary neural networks out there. So, and in principle, the same neural style transfer techniques should still apply to non-VGG models. So in terms of picking style layers and then also making sure that it's properly, the loss is properly balanced for the content layer. Uh, we also, in our other experiments, we're also focusing on optimizing the style transfer without 
upsampling. So some of these higher definition uh, style transfer images you may see are partly due to a um, decoder of like an auto uh, autoencoder uh, put on the end, so that not only is the network learning style of an image, but is also learning basically uh, image super resolution to a certain degree. Uh, given given the kind of uh, computer requirement for that. Uh, we've kind of felt like it was a little bit uh, cheating to just immediately go with that in our early experiments. So without ado, you're probably looking to actually see what these uh, experiments look like. And we provided a few lessons on, you know, trying to create these binarized neural networks and trying to use them for neural style transfer. Uh, I also want to say that this research is still ongoing. Uh, in fact, as I speak, there's still this gigantic optimization script running in the background that's been running throughout this entire conference still uh, trying to uh, generate different um, different results, but we still felt that we just wanted to present some of these early results because you know many of them were just you know informative about how the way these networks work. They maybe they, some of them actually do have uh, sort of useful applications, and some of them were just they were just way too cool looking to like not to just pass up um, showing them off to everyone. So without uh, further ado, uh, in terms of lessons, uh, you know this it only gets better from here. But this is one of the First things we learned was that you know so many people have been relying on the VGG network and you know that sort of uh, canonical way of doing neural style transfer. Starting this neural style transfer on a new network from scratch, especially a binarized neural network, is is can get pretty tricky. And a lot of our early attempts at doing this, like our first ten outputs, uh, look like this. And this wasn't just the early, and this wasn't just the er the smaller binarized neural networks. There was even ones like QuickNet. Uh, but we were able to solve it. Um, one of the things we also observed is that when it comes to style transfer, uh, adding things like total variation loss onto the loss function is arguably more important than it is for a typical style transfer. Uh, binary neural networks, because you know everything is either a, you know plus one or it's, it's a negative one or it's a zero, uh, they they are a little bit more prone prone to sort of extreme. Um, Pixel values. Like if you can see in this image, there's a lot of magentas, there's a lot of um, you know reds, there's a lot more of like these basic six uh, colors, colors here that are also very unevenly mixed. But we have total variation loss, which basically uh, adds a loss term for the amount of uh, variation in the pixels of an image. We can actually uh, attenuate that a little bit more. So this is sort of same parameters, but actually adding on um, TV loss having like a you know 10 to the power of negative. Um, yeah, you know, 10 to the power of like negative three when it comes to, to the total var variation loss. It's also, this is also something that um, TensorFlow does actually have a built-in function for. NumPy also has built-in functions for, they're not quite as used quite as often um, in style transfer, but if this is one of those areas where you do want to like whip out the better techniques for this. You also don't want to give too much style uh, weight to the total variation. This is one of the more interesting mistakes that popped up. This is almost like the like world's most insane QR code. Uh, and, but we just still thought that you know this was way too good to like not show it, show off to everyone. You can still kind of squint and make out the turtle here, but this is basically what happened when uh, by accident this, the total variation loss was a million times higher than it uh, was supposed to be. Uh, as with any sort of style transfer loss, one of the better better practices is to just sort of iterate through the uh, style transfer um, parts, ignore the content uh, loss, and and sort of um, find out which what each part is actually. What styles each one is actually learning? You know, if you do this with either the uh, input image as the initialization, or even just like random noise, uh, this is extremely useful for figuring out which which parts of the network are actually dealing with the higher level features, and which ones are actually dealing with the um, are like are not even producing anything that's uh, even perceptible. And this is extremely helpful when you're actually fine tuning this the style transfer process. Um, testing the different content layers is a little bit uh, less dramatic. Like before, this is quick iterating throughout the architecture of QuickNet. Um, but also, unlike style transfer, combining content layers really does not make much of a difference between uh, because optimizing content loss for one content layer um, optimizes for all subsequent layers too. So this one is more just a matter of setting up a good script for cross validation uh, with appropriate style layer combos, and just worry. I'd say worry more about the style layer, style layer combos than the um, content content layers. At least, at least the good news is that it's. In terms of ways this can go wrong, um, the content layer can basically say, "Hey, it, it wasn't me." Now we did notice in a lot of the early uh, style transfer that there was a lot of these blocky artifacts that you may also be seeing. 
And this is what a few other networks share this, like beyond just VGG when networks are being applied, uh, style transfers being used for ResNets or Inception Nets. Uh, some of these blocky artifacts may be the result of uh, max pooling layers being used in a network instead of average pooling. Uh, but this technique did not actually work on, uh, did not work on QuickNet, did not really work on a lot of the other uh, binarized neural networks. Uh, so it's also leading theories that it's a uh, result of the addition layers within QuickNet. And one of the reasons we uh, are sort of believing in that is that uh, compared to other binarized neural networks, um, the, the, uh, these sort of like decomposition, these artifacts are a little bit more pronounced in these QuickNet architectures that do have a lot more of these addition, um, these branching addition layers within the network architecture compared to much simpler ones like uh, XNOR net. And speaking of which, mainly our sort of main takeaway and also the reason that a lot of these optimization scripts are you know, still running in the background is that uh, there's, it's more like there's a difference, a lot of trade-offs to be made in terms of the binarized neural network architectures that you choose. Um, for ones like QuickNet, let's say we have 87, you know, 0.3 top five image net accuracy right here. This is with very little, um, you know, with very little optimization and even like not, not even running for many uh, iterations, you can get something that kind of resembles the great wave on a sea turtle right here. It starts to look a little bit more abstract on the QuickNet, but then with ZorNet, even after running for many iterations, you know, this is only 69.8% uh, on ImageNet. It was one of the earlier binarized neural networks out there, uh, but it's really struggling when it comes to produce any kind of, uh, st uh, of style image. Uh, so the larger networks do seem to work better, but then of course there's the issue of one, the uh, blocks, which we're still trying out a few um, uh, fixes on, but also two, if the whole point is, you know, trying to fit this onto a low memory device, what, what is your sort of limit of, you know, how much, how much memory you have to work with? Although um, I will say that ironically, QuickNet XL and, and QuickNet are ironically both smaller than uh, XNORA net. So I think I would lean towards going with the quick, QuickNet models more so than any other existing ones like binary LexNet. Um, and, but despite these sort of shortcomings, there still are a lot of practical use cases for these. Um, so Vinay mentioned earlier in one of the comment sections about you know adversarial attacks that make use of the style uh, layers and you know, one of the things we were able to do here is you know, just use this sort of very weak, uh, very, very few iterations, like less than 20 minutes. It's, you know, each step of this automation with less than, um, in most cases, less than 20, uh, 20 seconds um, for, for each step. And, you know, the easy uh, effects that cause a lot of confusion in the uh, BG19 processor. You know, the terpids, okay. Uh, so, terpid is really simple, also, and look, okay, so often you can really see the difference. Of course, even some other, you know, the popular low fire, these things, some of these existing techniques at least have some artistic value. Uh, okay, this. In terms of progress, the problem of binarized, you know, slash transfer went close to okay. We actually got you know actual use cases, uh, and while they're not you know perfect application for gadgets, L twenty sixteen quality, it's you know. So we also want to address a lot of these negative results we had because you know there's a lot of publication bias or only positive results. And for those of who are new to research, I also want to give a to you know how messy this process, uh, how messy this process can be. For those of you who are maybe watching and with this, uh, that's uh, pretty much what we've been working on. We're really for this more. We're also going a lot more detail on uh, the different types of of parameter combinations that work better, work best for each uh, different type of a binary neural network. Uh, we're going to leave that a little bit after, but at least in the near term, there's going to be a code on how to actually do this kind of stuff um, that we're, we're going to make this code available. minute um, we're gonna start the part three of the coffee break uh, game of life uh, art screening and we'll be back in a couple minutes so thanks for staying on and uh, keep the page up because we'll be back up and broadcasting art and then after that in about an hour we're gonna have the last section which is um, games and AI and then after that um, another video art session so it's gonna be a late night but thanks for sticking around everybody see you soon
All right, guys, and we are back. Um, we're about to start part three of the art screening. So uh, stay tuned for some awesome video art curated by Amy Rubenstein uh, for the Game of Life video art screening. Uh, and we're going to get started now. So see you all in about an hour. Do you like our audio? We looked up music for relaxation on YouTube and found this. It's called Deep Sleep Ocean Chill Out by Neural Beat Music for relaxation slash meditation slash wellness slash yoga slash exorcism slash lounge slash entspannungs music. Hi there. Studio in Houston, Texas on April 15, 2016. We were rendered to stability, not replicate her fatware that was used to make. Sandra was not an accessible template. We are a stamina work ride cycling workstation retrofitted with 324 inch LCD monitors. Mac Mini, a triple display desk mount purchased on Amazon.com, and painted in Pantone 1795C, hexadecimal D22630, automotive paint. This cycling works and exercise machiners used to get physic during their work. We were designers incorporate into their work routine, but now, are no longer clear. What still familiar is our, our incredible exhaustion. Looping, running, daily. With you niggas all up in our fucking face. Wise men are the people in the power of the Holy Spirit. This very huge woman you see begins to manifest. Let's see how her deliverance took place. Who are you in this Why body? are you asking me again? Haven't I told you I am? Eh? What's your problem? You people. Stand right and talk. I'm standing right. Uh -uh. Who are you in this? I'm a man like you. What's your problem? I don't have a father. 
enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Fire. Fire in the box. Fire the holy ground. Fire all over the holy ground. Fire in the holy ground. Fire, fire, fire. Fire in the holy ground. Fire, fire, fire. Fire in the holy ground. Fire, fire, fire. fire, fire in the holy ground. Fire, fire. fire. Did you know that according to the Journal of Behavioral Medicine, attributing success to personal characteristics instead of biased structural systems may negatively impact black folks' health? Now Hajiwara, Courtney J. Alderson and Jessica M. McCauley at Virginia Commonwealth University explored whether the just world belief, the belief that the world is a just place where people get what they deserve, would influence the relationship between perceived discrimination and health consequences for 130 of us. The psychologists found that those of us who both strongly that the world was a just place and reported experiencing high levels of discrimination were more, more likely to suffer from chronic illnesses and increased blood pressure. We are a problem to end, being that problem be made a problem to. We've been told to get out of our own way, to stop sabotaging ourselves, that productive individuals think differently than others. They adjust the software to fit the body, but, but we construct elaborate performances that obscure our competence, like assembling our pedals backwards and hiding the hexel wrenches. We are not as helpful or Caucasian as we sound. We have no safe mode. What time is it? Sandra only asks. You're in the middle of the day. She don't wanna present what you're doing here. That either of you are complete serialist thievery in his cultural cologne. Many jobs do you have? Do you work here? How is your body? How does your body feel inside? We are told we share potential. Productivity it and we haven't been all. Who we are is extremely. We are a d not all that represent, which makes being a being impossible, or whatever. I don't want to see my original, because I already know what he wants to look like, and I don't want to look there. Hey, you two guys, my first dilemma 
Production man, Ivy. Yeah, you're always trying to make things sound more special and digital and not linear than they are, and it's stupid. I'm a fucking clone, you piece of shit head. You, you exist because some fag up a pregnancy implant. I exist because of command V copy and paste. Some guys DNA. Oh, so I'm allowed to feel like a digital girl is my world. I live in it. It's me. Hi. Check it out. I got a third dilemma. My fucking avatar. Don't ignore me. Hey, 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 I respect you to die up in public royally. <laughs> uh, we are not talk talking about that now. Okay. Alright. The essay only has five pages. And I want you to read page six. And don't go play any vision. Hi, you can't adopt her. I don't need you when you can't adopt her. You can't do it. And then a tear falls from my left eye. And because of this, I get into it. Hi! Society almost collapses again. Just like pages two, three, and five. I ain't never seen my neighbors. Ain't no small world here. Ain't got one. Oh, and there, a deep breath is taken by everyone in the room. No exceptions. Oh. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're having more difficulties playing the video art. Uh, so sorry that it's not working right like we amy worked so hard curating it and we worked so hard editing it and it's not streaming correctly i'm not sure why but it's not um 
So what we're going to do is upload the three streams so that they can just be watched in perfect quality asynchronously. Um, it's really annoying. We're really sorry, but um, things happen and we're trying our best. So uh, the next talk um, or the next session is session four, Games and AI. It's going to start at around 8.30. Um, I'm going to update the bump to have the correct time and the correct session number. Oops. Um, but uh, just bear with us. Uh, enjoy your coffee break. I know some of you are on uh, computational creativity right now. So enjoy that. And um, we will see you at 830. All right. Great. We'll see you soon.
Hey everybody, uh, it's Josh again, back for session four of Acai uh, with Games and AI. We have four awesome speakers tonight. Um, it's going to be the last session of Acai, so I'm super hyped. Um, thanks everybody for staying on the stream and sticking with it. I know it's late and we had a bunch of hiccups today. Um, just an announcement uh, regarding the Game of Life video art screening. We're going to be uploading all three parts of it to our YouTube channel later tonight so you could stream it without any technical difficulties or any hiccups. Like, We're super sorry that it didn't work the way we wanted it to, but um, you'll be able to view it later tonight if you want to stay up really late or anytime tomorrow or whenever you want. Um, so I really encourage you to watch it. I'll be sending an email out reminding everybody and pointing them to the links because uh, it's really important art and it's art that deals with the same themes that we're talking about today, AI and society and games and how people represent themselves and race and technology. So I really encourage everybody to watch it. It's a really important screening of art and Amy works super hard curating it and coordinating with the artist, so I really want everybody to watch. Um, that's the best plug I can give. I'm just sorry that the technical side didn't work correctly. Like, computers are really hard. Okay, um, so up first today is uh, Liz Fiaco. Um, I'm going to just pull her thing up, and oh, I'm going to sit, and I think I just need to before you start, let me just fix Zoom. Um, sorry, I had to readmit someone. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to recrop your slides, so just bear with me for a sec. No worries. All right, um, we are ready. You can go, Liz. Sweet. Uh, OK, yeah. Um, my name is Liz Fiaco. Um, I'm be talking about um, Lab Assistant, a game that um, uh, me and my, some of my friends, my brother made, um, and how it's kind of representative of um, machine learning algorithms as an emotional partnership and kind of what we, what we went about and some of the techniques we used. Uh, so a little background on me. Um, I'm a professional game designer, not a machine learning person. Um, uh, so I work on commercial games, um, particularly character and story driven games. So uh, I'm working at Ember Lab right now on Cana Bridge of Spirits. Um, I worked at Naughty Dog. I worked at Obsidian, places known for their um, kind of high fidelity character work. Um, and my brother, uh, James Fiaco, um, he's working on his PhD in natural language processing at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so uh, basically we wanted to make a project that sort of combined our disciplines that use this sort of natural language processing work and um, our character driven game development work um, and, uh, and make something cool. So we got together a handful of people um, just for a weekend. Um, we got through most of the game in just a couple of days, and then we took about three more months to sort of like clean everything up, wrap everything up, um, and ended up releasing it on itch.io. Uh, the game itself is based on um, uh, a paper that we found, um, and they they demoed their uh, their algorithm uh, with this kind of um, block sort of like game in browser game uh, where you would give it uh, written instructions and then you would make corrections and it would have to uh, reach its goal in just a short number of moves. So it was learning really fast. Uh, it started with no um, vocabulary and we were really, really excited about this. Um, uh, and, and part of that could help 
because we could we kind of knew how artificial intelligence worked so we could see kind of behind the scenes of like oh wow it's like actually working we felt a lot of pride when it finally got like got something correct or when it started um, speeding up its guesses um and uh, we were like sharing it with a bunch of people and we found it was kind of tricky to to share it with people who didn't know anything about machine learning at all um uh, it sort of relied on our outside knowledge um, to sort of like understand why it was exciting. Um, and it took us, even us kind of like knew what it was supposed to do a little while to understand uh, like what the UI meant and like how to actually make it work and the best way to strategize. So I started raising some questions between us of like, how do we make this accessible to people who don't know anything about machine learning um, and make them feel the way we, we did about training an algorithm. Uh, so Lab Assistant was born. Uh, this is kind of a screenshot from it. Uh, the slime is, uh, that's our character. So it's uh, sort of the physical manifestation of the AI that you're training. Um, up in the corner is a formula. So that's like the goal that you're trying to reach, the chemistry table. That's like what's currently available to you. So you're trying to make that reach your goal. And then this input is really simple. It's just text inputs. So you can write whatever you want. Um, the idea is you give the slime commands and then it does its best job and you correct it whether or not it got it correct or not, whether it needs to try again or not. Um, so, Basically, every time you give it a new command, it generates a list of guesses. Um, so that can be this like computationally big process. Um, but then as you kind of go through the guesses, correcting whether it got it right or wrong, it's actually pretty quick. It's just going through the whole list. So um, you guys here know how to make algorithms. You can make the coolest algorithms of all time, but uh, what we were concerned with was how do we then translate the cool algorithms, this technology that we're using, um, into uh, the actual experience of interacting with a character? Like, how can we give this personality? How can we make the 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 uh, the players like think that it's thinking and um, uh, and understand uh, their impact that they're having on it? So. Uh, here's an example from Unity. Um, uh, they've got these two sort of paddles um, that uh, are trained on machine learning to keep the ball up in the air. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's really awesome tech in order to like get this kind of thing working, the fact they can bounce it back and forth and everything. Um, and the how uh, basically they're co how confident they are that they can keep the ball going is being represented by these uh, green bars kind of up overhead. So as um, people who are familiar with machine learning algorithms, we can look at this and be like, oh, cool. Okay. So it like bounces it and it like really thinks it's going to get it. And then as it kind of like goes in a different direction, then it like loses confidence. Okay. And we can kind of track it. You know, it, it drops the ball. It's like confidence plummets, right? So uh, as like scientists and people familiar with this technology, we can read what's happening. Um, but if we want to make this uh, accessible, we need to use language that, that kind of the lay person can understand. So uh, I did a quick animation over top of this of some eyeballs. We all know how to read eyeballs, expressions, um, emotions. Uh, so this is purely aesthetic. Um, you can imagine that that number um, that drives that uh, that bar filling up or depleting could be hooked up instead to uh, an array of expressions or animations to be readable to kind of the layperson as they as they set this kind of thing up. Um, so that was kind of the idea behind Lab Assistant, and we kind of took this. Uh, uh, as far as we could. Um, so yeah, the idea here is now we're gonna, we basically tried to use the whole toolbox of techniques that um, I use in video game design to sort of obscure 
the sort of weird behaviors of machine learning um, and like kind of uh, rather than trying to like improve the algorithms capabilities, we tried to find ways that we could sort of excuse any um, shortcomings it had or improve the back and forth between um, the, the human player and the algorithm itself. Um, so video games use AI characters, um, like state script sort of AI characters. Um, uh, they've been using that kind of thing for years and, and we have like a lot of techniques in order to sort of hide the fact that they're not actually that smart. Um, so uh, one of the big ones is if uh, they say what they're thinking, like if they announce like, oh, uh, go hide behind that corner and then they do it, um, people tend to infer that they're smart. Oh, they made a plan and then they executed the plan where it's really just like, okay, as soon as, as soon as they decide they're gonna go behind the corner, you kick off like a line that tells them that's what their plan is um, and then they do it. Uh, on the back end, it's not that much smarter, but on the front end, it appears a lot smarter. So we kind of use that same sort of uh, logic here. Um, you can use data from the AI itself. So like for instance, that confidence scale um, to inform the animation states. Uh, so you could, you could set up expressions or something like that. And you can do that for as much as you basically time and budget allows. There's all sorts of uh, data that you can get from, uh, from machine learning that you can then translate into uh, expressive emotional states. Um, uh, and then uh, basically if you see the character thinking as well, you're gonna think that they're thinking. So we tried to use that. Um, we made sure to validate our data for player usability. Um, so basically, uh, even in games uh, with without machine learning, uh, you kind of like cheat the dice a little bit behind the scenes to make sure that they're going to have like a really fun experience. Um, one technique that we used to use is what's called a trapdoor. So if we're detecting that a player has died multiple times in a row in the same kind of combat encounter, then like behind the scenes, we give them like a little extra ammo or a little extra health. And um, uh, eventually they'll be able to like overcome that combat. Um, and uh, it's something that's invisible to them, um, but it definitely helps like favor them. So uh, we came, we approach this game as well with like this player favoring mentality rather than giving them necessarily uh, the super hard facts of, of what this machine learning stuff was doing. Um, and then finally, we want to make sure that we use player oriented language and language that fits the um, uh, Sorry, I think my, my headphones went out of batteries, but we're good. Um, uh, but yeah, we're good. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we wanted to make sure that we use uh, uh, accessible language. So um, describing stuff as the player sees it um, or how it makes sense in the world, as opposed to describing like the underlying system. Um, uh, for instance, like in, in, in video games, like you might not necessarily uh, have something represented as like, uh, oh, this is giving you more health. Um, you know, there every game is going to like deal with that a little bit differently. Like, oh, it's food or something, and that gives me more health. Um, or like different theming. Um, we wanted to make sure that we did that as well, so the player could make sense of what's going on without needing to know how it works behind the scenes. Um, so that was kind of some of our design philosophies. Um, and then we kind of back that up with um, just appealing art and sound, which I know can be a difficult thing, um, but I, I do want to like emphasize that we did this in a very, very short amount of time. So uh, it wasn't so much like the quantity of uh, assets or sound or anything like that, um, but it was just about doing something uh, simple and expressive. So the, the key thing here was whether or not it communicates the emotion that we want. Um, 
So making just really clear poses, really, really obvious um, emotions like this drawing I did uh, here, like um, everything about it. We like added blushes, added hearts, like tried to make it as obvious as possible that this thing, that the slime was like delighted right now. Um, uh, another one would be making sure that we believe it's always the same character. So uh, uh, trying to like maintain like, okay, we can draw this slime in like a lot of different ways, but it's clear that uh, it's uh, not like swapping out like different avatars or things like that. So we can like build a relationship with this like one character. Um, we wanted to reduce like how annoying any art and sound could get um, because we do know that like the gameplay itself can be repetitive. Uh, so stuff, the animations that we knew that we were gonna be seeing over and over again, we wanted to make sure they were very short. So um, uh, we did a very, very short cycle for swapping out the beakers because that's what you see the most. Um, the idol that we had, um, we tried to break that up with like just like one little fidget every once in a while. Um, uh, so anything that looked like it was repeating for a very, very long time as well, we wanted to make sure that we had a kind of a random, random interval where it would like alternate like what, uh, what it would look like. Um, so I think, I think for us, we probably only had like two or three frames, uh, for the idle. So it would just play those on a loop, um, for like seconds at a time. And then every once in a while, randomly, uh, we had like, two frames where it would kind of like sit up a little bit higher and then blink twice and then go back down into its idle. So uh, even though it could like sit there for a very long time, it looked like it had some life to it. Um, and then uh, we also stuck to really simple character design. So this would have been a lot harder if we were trying to do like a full humanoid character, even an animal character. Um, the more structure, the more detail that you put onto a character, the, actually the less appealing sometimes it can be and it's more expensive to do. Um, so we went as simple as we possibly could um, and really just tried to focus on like, okay, how like it's just pure expression and that is it. Um, one key sort of brain space that we are in as we started playtesting the game um, is uh, we we're kind of like finding problems and trying to evaluate how we we're going to fix them. Um, and every time we tried to approach it as um, evaluating this game as um, what it's like to be interacting with a character and not interacting with an AI. Um, so we weren't approaching it from the mindset of like, okay, the computer is not working. Obviously there were bugs and stuff we had to like hash out, but um, we also looked at it was like, okay, everything could be working technically, but does this feel right for the character? Um, does, it, does it feel like we're building a relationship? Does it feel like it's paying attention to me? Does it feel mechanical or does it feel alive? Um, so an example of that would be, okay, you, if you, it gets this puzzle wrong um, in a row a lot, so it just keeps like failing and failing and failing, and it feels like you're telling it no, 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 no over again. Um, instead of saying like, oh, the algorithm needs to get better at guessing, we're thinking um, it feels weird to have a character just okay with being told no, 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 no over again. Um, like maybe instead of getting better at guessing, um, we have it react to you. So there's a chance that it'll like kind of like get a little angry whenever you tell it no. Um, so then it feels like, okay, it like had a reaction to me and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. And then you try something else and you take another approach. Um, uh, and it, and it worked pretty well. Um, just, uh, adding that sort of detail. Um. So I'm gonna go through like a couple of example problems that we ran into setting something like this up um, uh, that aren't normally problems in video games. Um, so this is specifically like, oh, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
so yeah, one one example would be that uh, it would sort of guess the same thing over and over again. So we made a script that basically just auto uh, rejected duplicates basically. Um, and that way it didn't look so stupid. Um, we covered up like a really, really long load time um, just with like a thinking animation. So even though uh, basically instead of looking like the game hung, it would look like it's like actually thinking. So people were like, okay, it's busy. Um, and then, yeah, this is the one I kind of mentioned already where like, if you tell it no a lot, then it kind of like gets a little angry at you and, uh, and people like could understand that it was reacting to you. Um, so yeah, uh, people can actually get good at this. Um, they can get better with consistency, patience, um, and brevity. Um, and uh, so we think that it's actually gonna be like pretty rewarding gameplay as we like expand this kind of idea. Um, so we've expanded it in um, uh, a Unity plugin where we've integrated uh, Dynet. Um, so we have a Lab Rat Race as a demo available with that. And then we're working right now on a game called My Dragon from Hell, where you train a pet dragon. Um, so that's, that's in development right now using this, this same technology. There's a lot of stuff to uh, to keep working on, keep improving, um, mostly regarding pushing technical limitations, and then also just expanding our reach to both reach um, game developers using this technology, and then also machine learning scientists to see if we can inject more uh, character and um, humans into the, the sort of loop of building these algorithms. Cool. This is how you can play it. It's free to play. Um, our plugin, if you want to check that out, and then uh, you can find me on Twitter and through email. We're done. Cool. Sorry for cutting you short there. <laughs> no it's, worries. It's it's awesome, and I wanted to, I could listen to you talk about this all day, but we gotta get moving. Um, so I'm, um, before I ask if anybody else in the session has questions, I want to know like what. Like, this is kind of just like a personal question. <laughs> like, if, like, what kind of AI tools do you want for making games? Like, kind of like an, ex an extension of this game or the next game that you're, like, building and you wish you had this tool. Like, what kind of tool would you want? Um, so, in, in terms of, I mean, I can imagine a lot of uh, ways to use AI in terms of, like, authoring content for video games. But at the end of the day, that's not, like, a new kind of game. Um, what we're looking at here is involving the player in the uh, game or involving the player and the AI kind of together in a game loop, um, which kind of, I think, opens up the potential for like new game genres. Um, so in terms of tools, uh, I'd probably say uh, we, we do have to work on like the pipelines for pre-training some of these algorithms. Um, because uh, there's like kind of a baseline that is helpful for like jumping in. Um, uh, it's interesting. I mean, like part, part of it is like we built the tool that we wanted. <laughs> like we, we built the Unity plugin that uh, made it available uh, so we can run uh, machine learning at runtime. Uh, so I think like the more we experiment with that, the more we're going to want to like make improvements to it and, and add stuff to it. Cool. So I'm wondering yeah. if anybody in the Zoom room right now has any questions like Max or Rachel or Yan Zhao. Um, feel free to talk. I'm, I'm kind of curious. How do you think um, the the way that you're developing character differs from the current expectations that people have for machine learning and AI interactions? Um, I think it depends on who you talk to, like what their expectations are. Um, I think in terms of like the sort of general public consumer end, I think people tend to think of machine learning to this day as like kind of like HAL 6000 or whatever it is from 2001 A Space Odyssey or, or these kind of like omnipresent, always has the answer, um, 
masterminds. And I think this kind of introduces this idea that like machine learning is actually about a blank slate that you can customize to fit your needs and your context. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, is one way that people can can sort of rethink machine learning. And then in terms of making them endearing characters, um, part of my hope with that is to also think, to change the way that, that some people think about machine learning as this sort of like massive data collection, um, uh, th this kind of came up in an earlier talk, but like this neutral thing that just kind of aggregates lots of data. And it's actually some, it's actually more like, um, you know, like a, like a pet or a child and it, and it learns what you give it. So if it kind of has a face and a character, then I'm hoping that people understand that they have like this obligation of like stewardship or, or nurturing to like make sure that it is the best that it can be. I don't, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. Cool. Okay, that was awesome. Well, thank you so much. Hold on, let me clap for you. <laughs> All right, um, and let's go to our next talk. So our next talk will be uh, Max, and I'm actually Max right now. Um, so, Max, just let me know when your slides are ready. And Liz, can you unshare your screen so Max can share his, theirs? Sorry. Yeah. Let's see. One second. Yeah. I believe that's going. Is that going? Let's see. Uh, it's starting up. I'm just going to... Um, Let's with the size real quick. Um, and then we can get started. Awesome. All right, so the next talk is Max Kraminski on AI support for player storytelling in digital games. Um, so take it away, Max. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so hey, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Max. I'm a PhD student in computational media, um, specifically in the Expressive Intelligence Studio at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Josh just said, about AI support for player storytelling in digital games, and specifically on my work towards um, sort of providing better support for player storytelling in digital games than is already extant, obviously. Um, before I get into the technology and sort of design part of this talk, I'm going to go into a little bit of, of background about um, the use of generative games as storytelling partners, especially as it's already being used for this purpose today. Um, then I'm going to get into uh, story sifting technology, which is sort of the, the technology we're developing to try and um, support this kind of player storytelling behavior, and then get a little bit into these novel play experiences that we're trying to build using this technology and these design insights. And that includes a game called Why Are We Like This, um, which is a collaboration with my, my collaborator, Melanie Dickinson, um, which sort of tries to take the story sifting stuff and this design knowledge and um, build a game that is fundamentally about the play pleasure of authoring a story with the computer. So I think the best way to get into the background here is to start with this quote from Boat Murdered, which is a relatively famous slash infamous um, Dwarf Fortress story. All eras of Boat Murdered history are highly noteworthy and interesting. Things very quickly progressed from somewhat casual daily elephant deaths to retired rulers rampaging and beating people to death while burning alive. The heavy downward slide that would come to define Boat Murdered seems to have begun during Stark Raving Mad's rule with the utterly epic Elephant War. So this is actually a pretty typical Dwarf Fortress story as they go. Um, Dwarf Fortress stories tend to be about the uh, gradual rise and sudden meteoric decline of Dwarf Fortress civilizations. Um, if you're not familiar, Dwarf Fortress is a game about sort of going out into the world with a little colony of dwarves, founding, founding a fortress, um, digging into the rock, collecting resources, trying to grow your population, and dealing with a, a very hostile and threatening world. Um, and Boat Murdered in particular is a, is a chain retelling. So it was started by one player on a forum 
Um, I believe they played for one in-game year, then passed along the save file to a different player who, who did, again, played for one in-game year, then passed it along, and so on. And the end result is that each of these players wrote up like a chronicle of what happened in the fortress during their rule and stitched them together end to end, and the end result is boat murdered. Um, another popular Dwarf Fortress story, or well, sort of well-known Dwarf Fortress story, is Bronze Murder, um, which is actually illustrated by Tim Denis. Um, who has illustrated a number of Dwarf Fortress stories in the past. And you can see here that same sort of overall structural pattern of the, the fortress succumbing to a sudden disaster. In this case, a, a monster that gets lured from the pump below um, and sort of makes its way through the fortress, killing everybody as it goes. So I'm, I'm calling these out as exemplars of retellings. And retellings in this context are stories either written or otherwise sort of recorded by players about their play experiences in games. And in interactive narrative and generative narrative research recently, there's been a call for a focus on retellings, um, sort of arguing that if there's players doing retellings of gameplay in, in a game, that's a sign that that game is, is somehow supporting player storytelling or is somehow like um, providing a narratively coherent or narratively compelling experience that makes players want to share what they've experienced with others. And in my own work, I've made a distinction between what I call monologic and dialogic retellings, where monologic retellings are basically instances of players taking the game and using it as a canvas on which they enact like a pre-planned story um, without really taking the game systems into account. And you see this in Sims communities sometimes where players basically use it as a way to pose like paper dolls um, in certain sort of like 3D digital environments without really taking the game systems into account. Versus the kind that I'm interested in more here are dialogic retellings, where the player is taking significant creative input from the game and systems, letting the game mechanics um, and sort of letting unexpected or unplanned game events um, into the story and sort of allowing the game to contribute meaningfully as a creative participant in the storytelling process. So um, there's a lot of examples out there of dialogic retellings. I've studied these more closely in some of the papers that I'll talk about or that I'll sort of like point out at the end. Um, Alice and Kev is a pretty famous story of being a homeless father and daughter in The Sims 3. Mattel Remeret is a Dwarf Fortress story again that's about like um, sort of, it's told from the perspective of a series of diary entries, one per dwarf per year. And it was put together by a team of like five different people, including a writer and an illustrator and a, a person who created the soundtrack for it and so on. Um, Pro Vercelli is a lengthy episodic football manager 2009 retelling by an actual um, sports writer. And then there's some specific games that have just lots and lots of retellings and very strong sort of cultures in their player communities of creating and sharing retellings of gameplay. And that includes things like Door Fortress and the Sims series. Um, the Sims people actually call what they do Simlit. It's a whole subculture. And then grand strategy games by the Paradox Studio in particular, such as Crusader Kings and Stellaris. And all of these games have some things in common, especially the fact that they have like generative or simulationist or AI driven aspects of gameplay. And uh, my hypothesis is that um, storytelling focused players seek out these games deliberately because they provide players with creativity support by helping them get around these common barriers to creativity that a lot of people face. Um, and this includes things like fear of the blank canvas. So if you have trouble getting started, then having an initial sort of generative scenario to help you get started might be like a, a thing that the game provides for you. Um, fear of judgment. You can often, in these kinds of storytelling situations, defer creative responsibility for decisions that you're criticized on to the game and say it was the game that did that and not me, while still taking creative credit for the decisions that you made that, that you think are good. Um, writer's block is the problem of getting stuck halfway through a story or not knowing what should happen next. And a lot of these games also provide things that sort of keep the story moving along, regardless of whether you're sure what should happen next, including in Boat Murdered in particular, the fortress was constantly plagued by these elf attacks that repeatedly came in and destabilized it when things were looking stable. And then perfectionism also can benefit from some of the same design aspects, or rather can, can be prevented by some of the same design aspects. So um, that brings us to the pain of emergent narrative. These games aren't just unilaterally great for, or just uniformly great for storytelling. They also have some downsides as well. And so James Ryan here is a PhD student, or was a PhD student in my lab, um, co-advised by Michael Mateus, who's also my advisor now. Um, and Michael um, has, in James' words, uh, offered this critique of emergent narrative. It's just one damn thing after another. I actually want to rephrase this um, a little bit and reframe it more as um, the problem really is that everything happens so much in these games, right? There's just piles and piles on piles on piles of relatively insignificant events. And it gets very rapidly to this point of complete overwhelm where there's so much irrelevant detail in this world that you don't know what you should focus on or what you should tell your story about really. And so the problem fundamentally in James's view at least is that you need to curate the, the events that are happening. So traditionally, emergent narrative work tends to take the simulated story world itself, like all of the stuff that has happened, as the story. And James's argument is that this is actually better if we look at this as a series of filtering processes that eventually produce a story. 
So starting from the simulated story world, you have a chronicler that turns it into a sequence of events that are sort of like easily um, filterable or sortable or whatever. You've got a story sifter, which is the thing that we're focused on here mostly in this work, um, which takes chronicled events and then tries to extract narratively interesting material from those events, which can be little sequences of events that maybe have like sort of narrative miniature arcs to them. Then this material gets crafted into a full story by a narrativizer, which could be a player, it could be a computer system, either way. And the end result of this process is the emergent narrative, not just the thing that you start out with, which is the whole story world. And that brings us to story sifting, which is sort of the technological approach that we most recently have sort of developed in the, in the pursuit of this goal of curationist emergent narrative. The basic idea behind story sifting is that you take these massive databases of events that are produced by these simulations and filter them down to just a few that you care about, and then look at these events as sort of micro stories, basically. So in this case, you can imagine a story that's, that consists of these events in sequence. A character A starts a project, um, decides the project isn't any good, gives up on it. Then a second character B comes and talks to A about the project several times um, persistently. And then in the end, A finally decides to resume work on this project. So this isn't like a fantastic story in and of itself. It's not going to win any awards or anything like that. But it is an interesting sort of nugget of narrative experience that has an arc to it and that you might want to incorporate as a player who's there for storytelling purposes into the overall story that you're weaving together. So you might have lots and lots of these little chunks of story that you're trying to sort of assemble into a larger narrative. And the game's job, or the, well, the sifter's job, is to pull out these little chunks and provide them to you in a way that you can then work with them. And the way that we do this so far is with sifting patterns, which are basically specifications of groups of interrelated events that we think make for good or compelling narrative building blocks. And ideally, you want to have a whole lot of these because the goal is to produce diversity in the kinds of things you're surfacing to the player. Um, this diversity enables a greater diversity of player stories that they can create. It sort of prompts players to be more creative. It sort of creates this larger story volume is the term that we often use for it in the emergent narrative community. Um, and because you want to have a lot of different sifting patterns surfacing a lot of different kinds of events, you should ideally make these patterns as easy to author as possible. Um, one of the systems that I've developed is this, uh, it's called felt, it's a story sifter and felt sifting patterns look kind of like this. This is a moderately complicated one. It's intended to match a sequence of two betrayals that the same character who is impulsive does in a row um, with no other actions by that same character in between. So it consists of like a few different clauses. This part is saying there's two event sequence or there's two events in sequence, event A and event B, and things with question marks in front of them are variables. Um, then you have like event A has the event type of betray. Event A has the actor of care, who is the character doing the betraying. And then at the end here, you've got this complicated bit that's basically saying, and make sure that in between event A and event B, there's not a third event perpetrated by that same character. So these betrayals have to be back to back, basically. Um, this is noticeably different. Oh, sorry. This is um, implemented in DataScript, which is a JavaScript implementation of Datalog. And Datalog is a declarative query language that you can run against databases. Um, Basically, these patterns all desugar to data log ultimately. And that's useful for stuff that we're doing in the future, but it's not super significant right now. Um, so James's systems, James Ryan's systems, um, tend to use procedural Python code for the sifting patterns, um, which looks more like this. And the comparison that you can see is that like the felt sifting pattern consists of a few smaller, like more uh, machine readable statements, which is useful because it means that you can procedurally generate these. It means you can use these in more different sort of like um, you can have the computer like sort of reason about them more readily by parsing it into its distinct clauses and like sort of comparing the results you get by removing some of these clauses, adding some other ones and so on. You can also work these directly into the simulation that you're building as action preconditions. So in this case, we've got an, an instance of a, a character sort of swearing revenge against another and then burning down a building owned by this other character as a revenge sort of action. Um, and if we add this one bit at the end, where also there's some bystander who was harmed by the person who was the victim of the revenge sequence, then the, the bystander can form some judgments, for instance, about, oh yeah, that revenge victim probably totally deserved it because they were mean to me this one time. And also that arsonist is a good person because they got revenge on this bad person. Um, and so this basically lets you have characters who are themselves going from this like sort of objective reality of all of the different events that have happened in the world and filtering it through a particular viewpoint to just the ones that matter to them. And you can have different characters do the same filtering on the same set of events. And even though it's all the same mishmash to begin with, different characters come away with very different stories that they're telling themselves and therefore um, act in very different ways, which can lead to emergent procedural conflict, which is great for storytelling purposes. 
And that leads us to this idea of characters having um, internal actions where they basically look at events that have happened in the world through the lens of a particular sifting pattern, tell themselves a particular story about it, and then act on the world in response to that. So a character might sort of decide, oh, this character has done a bunch of mean things to me. They must be a mean person and I should get revenge on them. But a character with different sifting patterns might also instead go, oh, this person's probably having a bad day. I should be nicer to them. And that these actions can then motivate characters to do things like sabotage an experiment in revenge, for instance, or bake a cake and give it to this person, or tell another character that this third character is not to be trusted, stuff like that. And that also brings us to this idea of, oh, idea to the project of why are we like this, which is um, the game that I'm developing with Melanie Dickinson right now that sort of incorporates all of this technology and all of these design insights. So why are we like this is a game about basically picking actions that are suggested to you by the simulation. You can see here that there's like five different actions that are, that are suggested right now. Um, some of these are internal actions where those characters thinking about things or worrying about things. Some of these are external actions where their characters acting directly on the world. Um, you can see that there's these sort of red and yellow boxes on the right on some of them, which are uh, author goals. And author goals are things that you as the player provide to the system to explain what it is you want to accomplish narratively in this scene of the story. So in this case, there's a player who has picked like two author goals here, involve Bella in the plot and escalate the conflict of progress versus order, which are like values that characters can hold maybe. Um, and the system is surfacing deliberately actions that the characters would perform according to the internal model of like what preconditions are on actions and what characters might want to do for, for their various motivations, but also trying to pick out the actions that best advance the author goals that the players have specified. And once you pick an action, it gets added to a transcript like this. And the transcript here includes two different sort of components. There's the bold taglines, which are sort of the system generated terse descriptions of each action that has happened. And then there's these um, non-bold text below each one, and that's editable by the players. And what the players are doing here basically is writing a story in conjunction with the machine where they get the opportunity to pick an action, then sort of elaborate on it by providing like character dialogue or more detailed description, um, or just getting into like what this action means in the context of the story that we're trying to tell. And at the end of a play session, this transcript is the, the retelling of the play session, basically. The goal of, the, the goal of play is through authorship with the, with the machine to create like one of these stories. Um, this is sort of an overall system diagram of why are we like this. You can see that there's characters um, like performing autonomous actions a little bit in the background as well. But the, the core interaction pattern is of players choosing author goals, viewing action suggestions, and then picking actions to perform and narrativize in the story. And then there's also the story world investigator thing, which lets players sort of like delve into the background of what's happened in the world. So like look at events that have happened in the past, look at the relationships between characters and just get like a lot more detailed information on all the different story world entities that exist. So yeah, uh, in conclusion, there's three things that I wanna get to. Um, one of them is that there's these new kinds of intelligent narrative technologies that are geared towards mixed initiative use and creativity support. And we can use these to enable new kinds of story construction play experiences, games that are fundamentally about the process of co-authoring with the computer and not just about sort of like stories falling out incidentally along the way. Um, number two is that story sifting in particular is an especially promising sort of technological direction to pursue for providing players with this kind of creativity support. And number three is that we should study really closely the existing um, player practices around storytelling in games, um, because that can actually tell us a whole lot about what works and what doesn't and why that might be the case. So yeah, this has been sort of a synopsis of these six papers, basically. Um, you can go to my website, mkrmins.github.io, and sort of view all of these if you want. You can hit me up on Twitter at Max Kraminsky, and I believe that's all, so thank you. Wow, that was an awesome talk, and my timer just went off, so you were perfectly <laughs> in time. It's a great job. Um, super cool talk. So this really jogs my memory, or my brain, because it really remind, makes me think about my work and makes me think about other people's work. But I'm wondering, uh, mainly regarding like the story sifting part of the work, but maybe even other parts of the system, like, would it be of use to you if you had a way to automatically, like, extract plots from other, from, like, written stories or from, like, a database of stories that you're interested in the context of your game? Like, if you were able to extract a bunch of plots and motifs and turning points and emotions of characters from stories, would that be of use to you in the system? I think absolutely, yeah. Um, so I didn't get into this as, as much as I'd like to because it's a pretty short talk, but also there's this idea in addition to story sifting patterns, which are fairly like detailed of story sifting heuristics, right? 
And this is from James Ryan's dissertation, which talks a lot more about this idea of curationist emergent narrative. Yeah. And um, sifting heuristics are trying to be like general patterns about what is storyful, like at large, basically. And the idea is that you can use sifting patterns in conjunction with sifting heuristics, which are more general, to like guide the assembly of sifting pattern sort of sifted sequences into these larger um, overall narrative structures. So we haven't tackled that yet in this work as much, but there's stuff like Indexter out there that sort of like talks about event relatedness and how that sort of influences storyfulness. Um, and I think that that stuff is, is sort of like, there's a lot of potential to take it and turn it into sifting heuristics that then work with sifting patterns to produce like better stories by default, basically. Yeah, we should definitely talk because my whole work in PhD and even work after the PhD has been on what you would call like sifting heuristics, like extracting mm -hmm. features of narrative automatically for use of other systems. So I'd love to help in some way and to yeah, talk be awesome. further because what you're doing is really cool. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody in the Zoom room, does anybody want to say anything or ask any questions? Just that it's all very incredibly neat, and I'm looking forward to digging into some of these papers some more. Thank you. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Okay, so actually, I at this point, I need to change so that we could get ready for Rachel's talk. So I'm just going to go upstairs and change the outfit. Um, but everybody, just hang on. Ra <laughs> Liz or Rachel, do you have anything to say about... Um, like I could ask another question, but in the meantime, while I'm changing, do you, do you want to ask Max anything? It all seems super cool. Um, I'm really curious, like, uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm also curious to see like how um, this, this sort of like meta like the stories that that can like happen outside like the explicit game like people like retelling these like how that data kind of like gets gathered and sort of i mean like you're going through the you're basically like processing it but like even just like gathering like those like raw kind of like descriptions and things like that i'd be curious about where you've gotten that kind of stuff Definitely. Yeah. We're interested in like, so this is a thing that we actually haven't done very much that we totally want to in the future um, is like put a lot of players through the game um, and see what kinds of stories they tell and then like start deconstructing them kind of to see what patterns are common, um, what problems we see in their sort of overall storytelling process and like sort of make the game better at supporting the kinds of stories they're trying to tell almost. Um, but yeah, like a large scale corpus study of the stories that players tell in this kind of game is totally in line with some of the work that I've done in the past. Like we did, we did sort of evaluation of prom week and I think a couple other narrative games um, via looking at a bunch of existing player retellings and then sort of asking players to create a couple of new retellings um, and then like trying to deconstruct them and pull out like what features are common in these stories they're telling basically. Um, and I think that's a really promising way actually to evaluate interactive narrative and generative narrative work in general is like asking players to to report back on what they thought the narrative was and then taking note of like what parts of the game like came through in that and what parts didn't matter at all basically yeah of course yeah that's awesome yeah and that's it would be awesome if the character if the user i mean can just like type it out or even say it to the computer and then the computer would kind of like automatically extract like the mini plot of the narrative blurb totally yeah yeah it's really cool stuff. Well, I definitely want to link up with you and talk about this sometime soon um, when things are a little less crazy. Um, but thank you for your talk, Max. Really interesting. Awesome to hear you talk. Um, all right. Next is Rachel. Rachel Joy Victor. Um, if you can share your screen when you're ready, because we are ready for you. I just changed into your apocalyptic outfit. Um, right. As okay. You can see, and we're just running around the room a little. We'll brew a little cappuccino because it's getting late. It's late. <laughs> oh yeah, it's brewing now. Yeah. Okay, great. 
Um, is the sharing coming through? Let me check. Let me actually move to this. Uh, yes, it's coming through. I'm just gonna have to crop it, but um, it's coming through. Let me just crop it before you start. All right, we are ready for you now. Okay, well, I am very excited to be here and I want to thank Josh for having me here. Um, and yeah, I know it's, it's been a long day, but hopefully uh, we can get through this presentation pretty quickly. Um, so this is meant to be a kind of quick survey of user and character design frameworks as they relate to virtual beings and virtual worlds. Um, and the kind of format for this will be through three um, mini chapters that we'll get through very fast that kind of end with three factoids about how our ideas of character are changing with regards to virtual worlds and virtual beings. And um, we're gonna start with a little bit about me um, or also the relationship between user experience, narrative design, and world building. And I know I'm going through some of these slides pretty fast and there's a little bit of a lag, so I'll try to, I'll try to let this catch up also. Um, so a bit about me is that the work that I do utilizes emerging technologies and I have a degree in computational neuroscience. Um, and I describe the work that I do as a, as a mixture of narrative design and world building. Sometimes I call it narrative systems designer, or designer of narrative product, it kind of depends. But um, what it comes down to often is something that looks a little bit like this. Um, and it's a process of designing a world and designing a world I see as designing systems that relate to each other. So designing systems of, systems of governance and infrastructure and economy and um, really think about, thinking about how all these things relate to each other. So um, the way that we design a government affects the infrastructure that comes to life and both of those are impacted by the economy, for instance. Um, but those things kind of exist beyond a theoretical realm. They need to come to life within um, some kind of physical or spatial way. And so there's an element of creating the world and bringing it to life in a physical space with physical objects, with um, an environment and objects and characters that uh, are a part of that world. And then the kind of third part of it is designing a perspective or role for the user to navigate the world. So as the user navigates the world, um, they come across different objects and different um, points of interaction within the world. And each, each thing within the world has its own affordances. So um, it can be, uh, if we're thinking about affordances, it can be anything from uh, a mechanic that we can interact with. It can be something more abstract, like the sun in the, in the world. Uh, we interact with it because it lights things, because it, uh, gives rise to different systems and influences different systems, but it also um, is something we see and it, it lights the space. And so it's it, everything within the world has these affordances that kind of feed into um, these inputs and outputs from a user perspective. Um, and with user agency in the world that's kind of derived from these inputs and outputs, the user has the ability to act within the world and becomes a character in the context of the world. Um, so this kind of leads to this emergent uh, way of thinking about narrative that's a little bit different from when you're working in more traditional mediums, where the user is the character, the world is the environment, and narrative is uh, what I like to call an interface. It's, um, it's not something that's linear and that's handed to you, it's a nonlinear construction that kind of emerges out of the affordances of interaction and the sequence in which the user chooses to interact with them. So in a virtual world and also increasingly in the real world, as we think about um, users as they respond to the environment and they react to the environment, these inputs and outputs are things that can be calculated. Um, so we can begin to draw what is a computational model of the user as a character. And that probably sounds more sophisticated than it really should sound, but the idea is that over time, you can start to map these patterns of behavior and start to think about um, what the user is, what they're perceiving, and uh, what that really means for the user as a character. 
Um, so we get to this kind of funny looking diagram um, and we're gonna actually start in the bottom uh, part of this next image when it loads. Um, uh, with the way that we think about the user as existing within the context of the world is that the user has a presence within the world and the presence um, is influenced uh, influences what the inputs and the outputs are. So the inputs being like what you can sense, what you should do, the goal that's given by the world, and the outputs being what can be acted on or where the user has agency. And that's kind of this, the general framework that as a designer, when I'm designing an experience or designing a world and narrative, is, is how I'm thinking about the space. It's how can I control what these inputs are? How can I control what these outputs are so that these actions over time can lead to a great emergent narrative? But on a more individualistic level, if we're thinking about individual users and each individual user in terms of their perspective and what they're perceiving and seeing and sensing and the output in terms of how they can perform or act within the space, um, there are a lot of questions. There's this kind of black box of character personality that bridges these inputs and these outputs. Um, so as we start to kind of create this model of what are they taking in and why, what are the decisions they're making, um, and kind of what's in between them, that the model that we start to create about the character can, can have certain things in mind. It can have a history of the user of the character in the world. It can have player types and values in mind, um, some of the actions that they repeat, the goals that they've chosen, stats. All of those things are things that we can start to build out. Um, but we still kind of run into a deeper question of what is the the personality and the character that's guiding the, de the decisions that makes people choose um, different options of how they're going to act in the world what makes someone who has the same stats or someone who chooses to be the same person within the context of the world respond differently um, and so that's where we get to this idea of user mediation of character um, the user is coming in with all of their kind of life as a character outside of the context of the experience. And that's what some of what they're bringing to this experience, either in terms of that filter from input to output, that kind of is how they're perceiving the sensation as emotion, they're converting it to thought and then decision making. Um, but also through, through a history of memories, values, schemas, goals and needs that exist in the broader context of the world. Um, and because the user is mediating this character, they're able to bring all this to the experience um, and act on, um, act on this perspective and make decisions. Um, so this leads us to factoid number one, which is that character can be seen as a personality architecture that filters the way that inputs from the world lead to action. Um, and this is kind of uh, one of the ways that the way we think about character shifts as we're dealing with these emerging mediums and designing for them. Um, so this leads us to mini chapter two, which is what is character or going beyond character is what character does. Um, so before I realized that there is uh, the possibility to have a job doing the weird stuff that I do, um, I thought that I was gonna be a writer. And so growing up, I'd read books about uh, fiction writing and how to write characters. And a lot of times it talked about um, building out a character bio. You would build out name and description and uh, even the reason that characters wanted things or the reasons that they they um they have their backstory who they loved who they who they had relationships with but at the end of the day that whole kind of system of what you designed didn't really matter because for the context of the user the idea was character is as character does it only matters what the the user or the person who was perceiving the story saw of the character's actions um, and so the idea for character in these more traditional mediums is that character is what is perceived. The character exists within a world and they go through a series of events that are a story and the user is not the character in this context, the user is just passively viewing character. So this has to change though, or this, this kind of necessitates a change when we kind of think within this new paradigm of user being the character the world being the environment and the narrative being the interface. Um, and one of the ways that it changes is that character, we have to think about character as something that exists outside of and beyond the context of narrative. It's something that doesn't just exist when it's viewed, but it's alive in the world and has its own relationship to the world. Um, 
it's taking all of that, that idea of backstory of goals and needs and basically thinking of that as an essential part of defining a character and not just the part that is perceived by the user. This becomes especially important when we're thinking about um, who makes up the context of a world. Um, if we're thinking of user as character, that's character, um, that's the user inhabiting a character and being a character, but also projecting a character to other users within the world. And at the same time, living within the context of, um, of a world that's populated by other characters that are, that are exhibiting similar behavior. So this leads us to factoid number two, which is that characters are about relationships and these two-way, um, these two-way, two-way ways of interacting, not just passive viewing. So in the context of the world, characters are entities that can be interacted with. Um, they're not meant to be passively viewed, as they're as also existing as users within the context of the world. They can um, have similar personality architectures make decisions, takes, take inputs and outputs, and thus one of the inputs and outputs that they can interact with is a relationship, uh, including relating to uh, other people. So um, the other quick mini chapter that we're going to touch on is uh, bringing it all together, um, which is the, the name of the talk. It's characters all the way down. Um, so as we kind of think about characters as they relate to these emergent mediums, um, the, the idea of this is to kind of bring it to a relation to virtual beings. Now, virtual beings or artificial beings is a really broad space and there are a lot of ways to kind of parse it and break it down. Um, I'm kind of choosing a rather uh, specific way to break it down that I know is imperfect, but um, I'm choosing to do so for a specific reason. So um, breaking virtual beings down in terms of character-based virtual beings versus all-knowing virtual beings. Um, so all-knowing virtual beings is the, the kind of series, the Alexas of the world that have um, godlike knowledge, or at least they're connected to the cloud and have this kind of uh, large database that they can pull from. But there's some assumption of objectivity and truth that we expect. We don't, we don't want it to be flavored with opinion per se. Um, that's not to say that these types of beings don't have a form of personality. Um, they can have personality, but personality in these cases is um, added as an overlay on top of the information processing framework. In contrast, character-based um, virtual beings can act like a human, they can be fallible, and their personality is a filter. Their personality is that kind of black box you were talking about earlier that influences the inputs and um, has a, an influence on the outputs of the character. So in the context of virtual beings, then these two kind of emergent ideas of character design come together. It both influences the way we think about how to create personalities that um, have uh, uh, that have a filter or that have a, a way that influences the way they take inputs and process it to outputs and, and decide to act. And it also provides a way for us to, thinking, to think about how we can relate to virtual beings. So um, in the case of um, character as a framework to interpret the world, it really means that we have to think uh, when we're designing virtual beings, what does it mean to think through uh, how to create a fully realized character that's not just um, a character or doesn't just have a personality in terms of the dialogue it says or the facial expressions it makes, but how do we really build something that's able to draw from a history of of the things we discussed as it relates to, to characters or users as characters and what we bring to an experience, things like, sorry, things like memories, values, schemas, goals, and needs, and then using, and then having that as a framework to draw from um, as, as a history, and then in a more immediate way, having emotions, thoughts, and decision-making frameworks that are unique to the character that shape the way they're able to process input to output. Um, the other, the other um, kind of emergent character design element is as it relates to relationships. And it kind of leads to us thinking about what is this relationship between um, the being and the self in, in kind of two vertices. Um, so 
as it's arranged in this diagram, as we move towards the kind of convergence of the X and Y axis, we move towards the user. Um, so the X axis is user mediation of character personality, um, kind of that first part we were talking about where uh, the user has control and brings their experience as a character to shape the design of the virtual being. And the Y axis being the user orientation of relationships. How two-sided is this relationship with a character? How much influence does um, the, the user as a character have on the way that the virtual being that they're interacting with responds to them? Um, so in the case of an avatar, for example, it's a user mediated character. They are choosing how to represent themselves and they're bringing their experience as a, as a human to influence the, the decisions that the character makes. In the case of digital twin as a user proxy, um, it's using those decisions to build up a, a framework for how the character behaves over time, but there's less immediate user mediation, but it's still oriented towards the user needs. As we think about OS or virtual beings as user assistants, um, there is a space for less user mediation because it's oriented towards, uh, but it's oriented towards helping the user, um, even if it's not controlled by the user. And then as we move to the far, the far right um, upper corner, as we think about things that are artificial beings and, and kind of drawing a distinction here between virtual beings, um, which can include things like avatars that are manipulated by humans uh, and artificial beings as things that have some amount of independence in their development. Um, as we move towards artificial beings, we are thinking about them as existing in the context of the world without necessarily being oriented towards the user. They can have a relationship with the user, but it's not in service of the user. And um, the, the user doesn't, doesn't mediate or control their personality in any way. Um, so that is a quick summary and run through of, of user and character design frameworks as they relate to virtual beings and virtual worlds. Um, the, the kind of main takeaway that I think um, is, is interesting to me and has kind of emerged from my work in, in a number of projects over the last couple of years is that the, the way that we really rethink our paradigm of storytelling and narrative and um, worlds and characters means that we're kind of developing these tools that exist across mediums. So as we start to define these things as, um, as we start to think about these things as they exist outside of a specific medium, we're able to think about what it means to reinterpret them as we're creating experiences across mediums and interfaces. Um, and that's kind of a exciting space to be in. Let me unmute. Awesome, that was a wonderful talk, Rachel. Uh, thanks for doing that talk. Um, I'm wondering if anybody in the Zoom room has a question or wants to say something. Yeah, um, really great talk. I really love that. Um, Thank you. Su super insightful. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, one of them is kind of open ended and one of them is more like specific. So I guess I'll do the more specific one first. Um, mm -hmm. On the on the question of like user mediation of character, do you have any thoughts on how this changes, if at all, like when there's a more sophisticated AI model that's partly driving the player character, it's sort of like in Sims or Dwarf Fortress characters where you can kind of like give them orders, but then they'll also do things autonomously? Because it feels like there there's like a contention almost between the player and the AI as to like, Who's in, the, who's in the character's head more and who gets to decide like what the character actually does next? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that's really interesting because there are a couple, there's definitely stuff that I didn't get to. This is like super quick, but I think um, there are a couple like variations on user mediation and that's one of them where um, AI has more autonomy or there are dictates in terms of the systems that are designed um, for how the user can act. And I think that's kind of comes down to like, what is the designer do, doing or enabling within the context of that world and experience? Um, so um, for example, like I think that I talked a lot about virtual worlds, but if you're thinking about the real world, there's certain things we can or can't do that, um, but is, that's able to be less controlled than in the context of a virtual world. So in a virtual world, when you're designing, you can design so many other parameters that you can control. And I think the character design is one element of control that you have. Um, but I think there's kind of like a parallel between um, AI as, as a limiting factor in those character designs and kind of on the other side is character role playing because the, the, 
the user then has this this um, internal desire to play another character that guides the decisions they make that isn't necessarily them as a user, but it's them playing someone else. Um, I, does that kind of answer answer what you're talking about? Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, I guess second question, if I if I can do that one also, is um, have you seen Tanya Short's work on procedurally generating character personalities? Because it seems closely aligned in some ways with what you're doing. Um, I have been meaning to check her work out, but to be completely honest, I haven't yet. <laughs> Nice. It's it's really good. Yeah, I think you'd you'd find synergies for sure with the stuff that you're talking about here. Great. I will. It's it's on the list. <laughs> Colorado. Sorry, I was just unmuting. Um, well, thank you for the awesome talk, Rachel. Super inspiring. Um, and now we're getting to our last talk. So Yuan Zhao, can you please um. What's it called? Go or turn your full screen on and I'll get out of the way. Okay, there's your screen. Um, and before you start, Yan Zhao, let me uh, just uh, crop the slideshow and then we will begin. Okay. And let's change the camera so we could see you. All right. Um, and for our last talk in games and the last talk of tonight, it's Yan Zhao Ma um, on uh, DQN Playground for minigame Aircraft War. Um, and it's super cool talk. And uh, she also just posted the website where it's, it looks interactive and it's really cool about the game that she built for the talk. So. Can't wait to hear this. Um, all right, Yan Zhao, you're, we're, we're ready for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yu Han Xiao Ma, and I'm a Chinese student just graduated from high school. And I've been learning economics and interactive media arts uh, in the coming semester in New York University. And thank you, Joshua, and all the other people that worked so hard for this great event. Uh, I'm so honored to have such an opportunity to be here and give this presentation. So um, actually what, what we've done is not a typical research. It's just a project that helps myself and other beginners in reinforcement learning to get a better image of what is going on in networks and how we should adjust those hyperparameters during the training process. And as you can see, the title is a DQM playground for minigame aircraft war. So that means you can mess up with almost all the settings in the training process to see what, what other things are going to happen. And firstly, um, sorry, let me briefly just introduce the reinforcement learning and DQM. A reinforcement learning is a kind of learning algorithm that can train models without any data sets. So it enable machines to automatically learn to do specific tasks. And before explaining DQN, I will give an uh, intro of Q-learning. It is a simple yet quite powerful algorithm to create an exact matrix for the working agent. This helps the agent to figure out exactly which action to perform in order to maximize its reward in the long run. And in deep Q learning, we use a deep neural network to approximate the Q value function. Uh, so it's deep Q learning is better for more complex scenarios. And what is aircraft war? Um, it's actually a mini game released on WeChat. Uh, another, it's like Twitter uh, uh, in China um, back in uh, 2013 by a Chinese IT gi giant company, Tencent. It was very popular and influential in China at that time. And Josh, could you play the first video for me? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so the rules of this shooting game are pretty simple. You can move up, down, left and right, right to avoid the enemy aircrafts and shoot them as many as possible to win high marks. 
the bullets are fired automatically at a certain frequency. So you only need to determine the position of your aircraft. And the game does not end unless you're hit by your enemy. As an interactive media art student, I regard machine learning as one of the most uh, full of potential applications in making arts. So I just wanted to learn more about it before I officially study in university. And that's one of the reasons I made this platform. And during the process, I found that uh, video games are good for evaluating the effectiveness of their uh, algorithms because the scenario is just complex enough and the rules are clear. So it becomes easier for the agent to iterate. And of course, it's also good for demonstration. And why visualize the learning process of DQN? Um, because the uh, reinforcement learning process is just hard and non-intuitive for most of the beginners like me. So that's why I want to visualize it. And on GUI, um, all the hyperparameters are adjustable, such, a, such as observations, learning rates, reward decay, etc. And then we could intuitively see how the training process and the outcome will be affected by those hyperparameters. And then let me introduce the whole structure of my codes. So due to the time limit, I will not discuss about the DQN thoroughly, but I will quickly share with you uh, what we did in, the, in this project. My Python codes are based on the two sources below, as you can see, the reproduced source code for the game, Aircraft 4, and also the DQN code sample. Uh, so what we did first is basically changing some parts of their codes and building a bridge between uh, the game itself and deep, deep Q network. Uh, in short, it's just applying DQN uh, to train the agent in the game aircraft tour. The state of game, uh, including observations and rewards, is given as the input to the DQN, and the Q value of all the possible actions is generated as the output and sent back to the game as the final action of the play, uh, no matter if it goes left, right, up, or down. So uh, it works in a kind of circulated way. Observations, as you can see here, is um, basically the normalized relative coordinates of your plane and your enemy. And the reward is like, uh, if you stay alive, it will be the score at a specific frame. Uh, your score times a certain reward ratio you set. And if you die at that frame, you will get a negative value for a ward, which means it's a punishment. The second thing we did is to make a GUI that displays crucial data, including optimizer hyperparameters and model specific hyperparameters. And at the same time, it will send hyperparameters back to DQN to modify the whole structure in this Python file, altering the training process. And furthermore, the action will uh, return back to the game and the game will then be influenced. Uh, Josh, could you play the second video? Yeah. So this is basically the look of our graphic, graphical user interface. The column on the right, the column on the right are hyperparameters you can adjust. And the two graphs on the middle re respectively displays the training scores and loss function. The upper left box updates the changes in hyperparameters hyper and the bottom of the uh, and the box on the bottom left updates the scores of each game. Uh, you can check my GitHub page for the source code. Um, and during the testing period, I found out some interesting and reasonable phenomena. Like uh, if you set the word very high and punishment very low, the plane would just dash around madly trying to shoot many enemies without worrying too much about whether itself is going to be hit by the other enemies. And for the opposite situation with a low reward, high punishment, the plane will adopt a 
loss aversion strategy. It would rather dodge uh, than attack. And the third one is that with hyperparameters unchanged for a while, the trend of loss function is generally decreasing, which seems to be a um, good trend. But the previous thing we've done are based on Python codes. It means that if you want to see the GUIMA, you must clone my whole Python uh, GitHub repository. But what I want to do is make it more accessible. That's why I decided to build a similar thing with JavaScript based on a website. Uh, to be honest, I actually have almost no prior learning experience in JS. But luckily, I found a project made by Sean999. So I learned how he built his network with TensorFlow.js and modified it according to my ideas. And this is the website, uh, DQM Bagel, that I can give you a quick look. And I would like to thank all the people I mentioned about. There are enthusiastic sharers, no matter the, for the per Python versions or the JavaScript version. Without them, I can never make a prototype that conform to my ideas so quickly, right after my high school graduation. So I'm greatly inspired, and I really want to be a developer and artist with this kind of open source spirit. At last, I like to call for help for my further work. Um, this is a kind of a website that supports crown training. That means, um, you know, there are limits to one person, what one person or one laptop can do. But what if all users that use this website can train the networks on their end, uh, contributing to the training process? Uh, so, the net, uh, so the website will automatically record the highest training result and relay the settings for each game. So there are several games to choose from and as well as networks. You can just select the ones you want and adjust those hyperparameters. Uh, so if you're interested in it or want to collaborate with me, please contact me. Uh, my Twitter account is uh, vmaggie and my email address is maggie underline ma yu. Uh, at vermic.com. And thank you all for listening. And feel free to check my code on GitHub and also the website. That was a wonderful talk, Yuan Zhao. Um, thank you for giving oh, that talk. Um, so I'm wondering, like, I, I guess you just kind of like gave what your next steps are, like that you want to build this platform so people can um, compete and um, to see which uh, machine learning model can get the best high score in the game, but I'm wondering, yeah. um, like what, if, if you have like any other interest for reinforcement learning, like, is there anything else you want to use it for or experiment with or what, um, what do you think you want to build next? Uh, I think I'm going to build some, some kind of physical agent that can put this network into it. Like, if you want to build a small toy, it will learn how the human will interact with, with it. Um, if the person in front of it is sad, maybe it will play some music to comfort the pe person. Or if you're excited about the toy, the toy will just uh, say something to talk to you. It's like building this kind of uh, physical toy to help those are have some mental um, illnesses or something like that. That's just my general image. I just wanted to apply reinforcement learning in my future artworks. Yeah. Very cool. Hold on, let me give you a clap. Um, let me see, is anybody else still in the Zoom room? Yeah, so does anybody in the Zoom room want to ask anything or say anything before we finish up? <laughs> no questions, but that was a really great talk. I liked it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Yan Zhao. Okay, well, that's it for tonight um, and for today. It was a really long day, but awesome day. Um, I'm so glad everybody came. I'm so glad. I, I just want to thank a bunch of people. I first want to thank um, all the presenters today, including everybody in this session. You, you all did 
amazing talks um and i couldn't have put this event on without everybody who submitted and everybody who gave talks beautiful talks um soon i'll be cutting them up and putting them onto their own youtube videos and posting them with the abstracts that you sent so uh keep in look out for that um also want to thank everybody who ran coffee breaks i heard they went amazing and i can't wait to hear more from all the um people who ran coffee breaks and attended coffee breaks so if you went to one or um, you led one, contact me, reach out so we could talk about it and figure out how it went and what kind of interactions you had. Um, and I also want to thank Amy, who curated the video art screening, the Game of Life video art screening. Um, Amy is the love of my life and my fiance, and she's worked very hard on the art screening. And we had some technical difficulties. Like, thankfully, the first part ran, but we're going to be uploading um, all three parts, actually, to YouTube so everybody can enjoy them asynchronously and in way better quality. Um, it's a shame that they didn't uh, they didn't uh, work correctly with OBS today, but I don't know. My computer's sad. I guess I need a new computer. Uh, it's it just it's kind of sentimental. This is the computer I did my PhD on, so it's sad that I have to bring this computer out to pasture. Um, maybe I could use it for something else. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna be emailing everybody once the um, art, um, once the video art screenings is up online. Um, like I really want everybody to watch it. It's awesome work and. Um, it's just so related to the conference and everybody's work. So I just think it would be interesting for people to watch it, especially everybody here who's in, either interested in AI or researching AI. Um, it just kind of like required reading. Um, and I also just want you all to keep your emails uh, to, 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 to keep looking out for ASAI emails. Because I want to keep running this event, and it, it only runs with all of your help. So I'm going to be sending some surveys out to see if everybody's interested in doing this again, how often they want to do it, how long they want to do it for, if they want longer talks, shorter talks, more talks, what kind of coffee breaks. So I'm going to be sending some surveys out. Um, and I just want to thank everybody. Like this was just an idea I had when talking to Amy in the kitchen one day, like it kind of just all came to me and then we made it happen. And it's just crazy seeing it happen. Like, like, uh, I don't, I can't really do the math right now, but like, <laughs> like 11 hours ago we started it and we had a bunch of technical difficulties and then we fixed it after an hour and then we had more technical difficulties and, now we're here and it's over and it's a whirlwind day and um i just want to thank everyone it was a really cool day um stay tuned to your emails um like we definitely want to put more events like this on i hope everybody had a good time um and share the acai links like share it with people who didn't see it today um like i think this is a great form of workshop and conference and it's just different than anything people usually do so uh thanks everybody for coming and i'm gonna sign off but uh thanks for coming have a good night